consider some of the leading practices emerging in and around this building material um, and, to, and to explore the, the present and future of, um, of concrete through the lens of multidisciplinary collaboration and uh, competition, I suppose. So uh, a couple years ago at a symposium on embodied energy and design at, at Columbia University, one of this morning's speakers, Forrest Meggers, posed the question, for how much longer will we be using concrete at all? He said, in an age of carbon accounting and of growing awareness of the negative impacts of the carbon cycle on uh, climate, he said this, this preeminent building material of modern architecture might be fundamentally unsustainable. That was a great provocation that stayed with me and, and resonated, and I think you'll hear a much more nuanced and guarded version of it later today from Forrest himself, I suspect. But that really got me thinking in a new way about concrete. Uh, any, anyone who is passionate about modern architecture and contemporary architecture recognizes that concrete is the preeminent building material in the world. It is, it is um, an ancient material and also a continually transforming and evolving, uh, like, thing without which you can't even imagine modern architecture. So, um, so we care a lot about concrete. But we also know that concrete is resource intensive. It is consuming sand at such a rate that people talk about a global, like running out of sand <laughs> if we continue making concrete the way we have been. Um, and people are very concerned also, of course, about the greenhouse gas emissions. It's a very energy intensive and a very greenhouse gas intensive material. Um, so it's really a great place to dig in and see what, what, do, what do we know and what can we imagine? Because what all of that means is that even the tiniest innovation in the materials we make concrete out of, the processes we use, um, the, the, the techniques for molding and assembling it, every, even the smallest increment in research and in industry practice ripples through the system and has very big impacts. And so um, innovation in concrete is one of the most valuable places to be working in the building sector, in materials research, and in engineering. That's, um, that's what, you know, the first thing that makes this symposium so exciting to me. The second is that for, for those of us in Taubman College, it is a, it is a chance to, um, to deepen and uh, extend some profound multidisciplinary collaborations that have, that characterize research, teaching, and practice here at University of Michigan. So um, this symposium, we, we developed it in partnership with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering across the street. Um, and the lead organizers, Tian Eng, Wes McGee, and Jerry Lynch, come both from Taubman Architecture and from uh, the College of Engineering. Uh, the research relationships between our two departments are robust and, and intensifying, um, and they center on a common attention both to materials science and materials research and to digital design and fabrication. And so uh, it's one of my great points of pride that this is a, a college that leverages the incredible capacities of our uh, preeminent public research university to do work that many of our colleagues aren't able to take on, and, and this is an example of that. It also reflects our partnership with, with research alliances and groups um, around the campus. So we, uh, in addition to the partnership with Civil and Environmental Engineering, this symposium benefits from support from the University of Michigan CO2 initiative, led by Volker Sick, from whom you'll hear uh, as well today. And it reflects our strong connections to partners in the architecture and construction industries. So you will, you will hear from speakers from a number of companies that produce concrete, that work with it in various ways. Um, and our main sponsor is Wallbridge, a full service construction company headquartered in Detroit with experience for 100 years now managing complex construction projects including uh, much of the University of Michigan campus and this very building that we stand in today. Um, so uh, 
with that, those um, introductory remarks, I look forward to a great day of conversations, and I'll hand off the podium to John Jurevich, the Director of Innovation Technology at Wallbridge. Um, he was, uh, has an illustrious CV. That most recently, he was featured at Oracle Open World, the only construction industry member to participate in that conversation. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going to try something for the first time, which is just totally presenting live research on 3D printing technology with regards to cement printing. And many of you have an online access, so if you want to follow along, let me just show you how you could. Um, and I forwarded this to Wes McGee. This is a live link, and after this presentation, if any of you want to participate, um, you can continue to add notes to my presentation, or even while I'm presenting, you could write down corrections that I might have made a mistake in my presentation. So the way to get there would be to go to sketch, S-K-E-T-C-H, dot hoilu, H-O-Y-L-U, dot com. And then there's a slash, and then there's nine numbers, which is, if you're ready, 848-483-222. If you didn't get that and you want this link, just ask Wes and he'll forward it to you. So I'm used to working in large formats and on our own wind lab back in Detroit, we have a 22 foot interactive wall where you can kind of draw on it. And it's using scalable technology as well as uh, collaborative stuff. And it's similar to if you've heard of Bluescape, but this is the next generation of that. And in this case, what I'm looking at is some live research that we did this morning and last night. And uh, we, when we were asked by our clients to start looking at 3D printing technology, looked at the radial kind of concepts. And we realized that as the boom extends, you get deflection and a lot of movement. And you're also limited in footprint, as you can see here. And we studied some of the leading vendors of that. APIS Core is one. And they were working with some people in Texas, building some small printed houses. Limitations here, this is kind of the now approach. I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you what's next and where we see this headed. But the limitations, of course, is you can't really do foundations. You can do walls, and roofs are difficult. Kind of fast forward into some of the work that I've seen recently. My friends in Minnesota designed a, um, a, a 3D printer called a Stroybot. And this sells for about $400,000 if you care to buy one. I know that later today you'll see some uh, presentations on plasticizers. And if you've ever worked in a concrete pump or early in my career when I worked for McHugh Construction in Chicago, I was one of the first to get the concrete stuck in the pump and realize what the impact of that was to the job site. So uh, plasticizers and mixed design and all that, I'm, I'm sure you're going to have some real interesting presentations today. But that's the same thing when you're 3D printing, how you mix it and push it through a pump, or how you're going to elevate it and get it up through a high rise in a slick line. Um, is, is really you got to think through that. And that's what we do here at Wallbridge because we're always about uh, think, demand, deliver safety and make sure we can achieve these results. What we've learned in looking at all the 3D printers is that the gantry mechanism is a little bit more controllable, less deflection in that arm. And so uh, the University of Southern Cal had done some contour crafting and they did some research that we thought was more useful. And it, you can see these gantry um, links here. And I, I know that we've got uh, ability to go to the web. But if you look at my research, because I'm only going to go this through this really fast, but each one of these little icons takes you to a link that takes you to the website where I found the research. I also studied some of the things that were happening in the Netherlands. <clears throat> now there, of course, when it's cold, you've got to build enclosures. And in the past, people pretty much printed in an XY format, like you see MakerBots at the library. And the new tech that we've seen that's kind of interesting are these Delta printers. And I was talking to Wes that there's people in Italy as well as in uh, Barcelona building large delta printers that are going uh, as much as six or seven meters high. And that's where uh, it starts to get kind of interesting when you start building taller structures. And then the difficulty we see is, of course, doing anything horizontal. Now, you could build prints on the floor and tilt them up which we've seen bus stops done in China. But probably the most um, interesting thing we've seen is what's being done in Arizona with what we'll call an igloo concept. 
and in the igloo concept, um, they're actually able to build things that are more uh, structured like a dome. The brick box, box beams, structural beams. Now that's interesting for a number of reasons. You're not limited to just a small igloo. You can stack them. Um, and as you build bond beams, you could prefab and start to set wafers of roofing on there. And that makes it much more interesting to us. But where do we see this headed? So in addition to the printing of concrete, we think that in the future, it's really going to lend itself to mixed media. Not just rebar, but maybe electrical systems, or you talk about the smart building concept where you're pre-wiring things, so you're saving all that labor. But that means as architects, we really have to think things through, even as a fabricator or a mass producer would, well in advance. So you're not just doing a digital model that has systems in it, but you're thinking, how am I going to print these systems all as one thing? And uh, that gets extremely interesting when you talk about economies of scale and being an automotive builder like we are at Walbridge, we're very interested in this idea of mass producing things or making you know, this economy of scale or efficiency or learning from our past. And so that is the uh, kind of the broad brush of the view of the research that we've done, um, kind of showing you what is now, what is near, and what is next. And then if you care to, you can look at the comparisons that we have done on all the variations of different suppliers that we've looked at and how we go about actually deploying this on site. So feel free to grab any of this through that link I shared with you. And um, should you want to add comments, I welcome it, because uh, none of us is as smart as all of us. Thank you. Morning. Um, my name is Tian Eng, uh, assistant, assistant professor in architecture at Taman College of Architecture and Urban Planning. Um, and this is Wes McGee, associate professor and director of the Fab Lab at Taman College. Um, we want to welcome you today um, to today's uh, symposium from Lab to Site, Innovation in Concrete. Um, in the last few years, in practically every conference presentation and talk about concrete are prefaced by a few um, shocking facts. Um, concrete is the second most consumed material in the world next to water. Um, it accounts for 8% of the world's CO2 emissions, such that if it were a country, the cement industry would be the third largest in the world, behind China and the U.S. Concrete uses roughly 10% of the global supply of fresh water. Every talk begins in, with these scary numbers. Um, but don't worry, we're also guilty of using those numbers to present our talks. But um, so if your talk have, if the presenters have, um, your beginning of your presentation have this, yeah, um, you're in great company. Um, but it, it makes us wonder why that is. Um, why is that concrete is so much in our consciousness? Um, not just for designers and architects, but a lot of people not related to the in building industry. So much so that Guardian newspaper earlier in the year devoted an entire week on a series of articles about everything concrete, its history, histor its historical uses, environmental impact, even in relation to health. So why all this attention? Is it because we're confronting dire and irreversible climate change effects? Is it because natural resources are depleting to the point that even sand, a critical component of concrete, might be a commodity soon? Is it also because exemplary architect concrete structures from the modern period that we cherish are now slated for demolition, contending with not only um, const as construction um, waste for landfills, but an inevitable sense of loss as these buildings with so many embedded cultural and social legacies are now a chapter in our history books? Is it also because the building industry in desperate need to catch up to other manufacturing industries in integrating advanced technologies situates concrete building processes as a key area to reduce material use, 
labor cost, and body carbon footprint, all the while raising manufacturing efficiencies for the construction industry to meet demands and speed by which cities are being built around the world. Um, I'm going to refrain from quoting McKinsey reports here. So as um, you all well know, these answer, the answers to all these questions are yes. So the initial idea for this symposium came out of a simple question. <clears throat> How do we effectively transfer research that happens in the university lab to the broader AEC industry and ultimately to the building construction site? As we all know, over the last several decades, architecture and construction have steadily adopted digital design and manufacturing workflows that were historically the domain of the manufacturing industry. Research labs around the globe focused on the development of novel material technologies with the goal of transforming the way we design and construct the built environment. But despite the opportunities presented by these technologies, the building construction process remains highly resource intensive with considerable room for improving efficiency. Particularly in the case of concrete construction, digital technologies can have a massive impact, but only if we can fully integrate the entire process chain from design to production. Additive manufacturing clearly holds potential for these material optimizations, but specifically when coupled with computational design techniques and not simply as a replacement for traditional methods. So one of our key goals has been to include a wide range of viewpoints, ranging from history and theory to material science, construction, and robotics. It's not only for the purpose of exchanging new ideas, but also with the goal of understanding the contingencies that drive various domains of research. We want to discover what are the shared questions that can motivate transdisciplinary teams. We also want to understand from industry leaders what questions have immediate relevance to real world challenges. And lastly, we want to understand the shifting contours of practice for architects, engineers, designers, and historians. What new roles do they play individually and collectively? Um, so before we begin the morning session, um, just logistically, um, I'd like to mention a few things. We have a morning session um, <clears throat> followed by a noon keynote with um, Sarah Billington. Um, we then have two afternoon sessions followed by a final panel discussion uh, moderated by Wander Lau, the technology and practice editor of Architect Magazine. Um, and that panel will chart trajectories for research um, and perhaps discuss different models and methodologies for collaboration. Um, we will have to keep time pretty tightly because um, all the sessions today, um, you can <clears throat> receive AIA um, continued edu education credits. So um, the timing has to be pretty precise before for people to log in. Um, and after the presentation um, at the Commons here, we will head down to Liberty Research Annex for the reception and exhibition opening where we will have a special performance by Brandon Clifford and CMEX. Um, <clears throat> finally, there are a, a few thank yous in order. Of course, a symposium um, th this big requires a lot of help and assistance. Um, but first and foremost, we want to thank our Dean, Jonathan Massey, and not only for his support of this event and his vision and charge to address building sector innovation, um, but also his nudging uh, to propose a symposium that is different than typical conferences or symposia. What emerged in the shaping of the symposium is the unique format for which I will have to thank all the speakers, um, not just for coming from different parts of the U.S. and around the world today, but we appreciate you going out on a limb with us to engage in conversations prior to today's event. Each of the presentations are paired discussions on different topics related to, con related to concrete. Some of the speakers have collaborated before and some have not, so a lot of the material are literally new, so we're very excited. Um, this is definitely a bit more work, but we hope that the intersection will spark new conversations. We also want to thank Katie Cole, um, our conference and events coordinator. As you know, architects um, in general are pretty high functioning, but um, she puts us to shame. So we would not have organized such a tight series of events today without Katie, so thank you. We're very grateful. We also want to thank Jerry Lynch, SCEE, working with us on this event, not just as co-sponsor, but asking targeted questions early on in framing the symposium. We're very excited for this joint event and hope to have more in the future. 
We also want to thank Brandon Clifford and Davide uh, Zimpini at CMEX Global R&D for st staging the debut performance of Patty and Jan um, this evening during the exhibition opening. And the performance um, presents an opportunity for us to engage concrete in a completely different manner that we might typically, that we typically don't um, associate with as designers and as architects. So we're really looking forward to performance. Again, thank you to Walbridge um, as our industry sponsor for the event as well as UM um, Global CO2 Initiative. Lastly, I would like to thank the exhibition team for their tireless help in setting up the exhibition um, you'll see later tonight. Um, and for the designers and in the symposium that have submitted their work for the exhibition. Um, we have both digital work as well as physical um, heavy artifacts that you will see tonight. Um, the exhibition is made possible through generous support from the Greedo A Binder Exhibition Funds. Special thanks goes to Carlos Mapeo, um, Rachel Henry, Mackenzie Bruce, Jeffrey Richmond, and Kelly Moore's crew for their assistance in setting up the exhibition. So um, I'd like to launch the morning panel, which I will be moderating. And so I would like to invite the first speaker. Let me grab my computer. I just want to do a short um, introduction. Um, Lucia L.A. and uh, Forrest Munger, who will be presenting the first, presenta uh, the first talk. Um, Lucia L.A. is an architectural historian and design critic who works on the intersection of culture, politics, and technology in the modern period, with a special focus on international institutions and global practices in the 20th century. L.A. taught at Princeton for 10 years, first as assistant, as assistant and then as associate professor in um, history and theory of architecture. As of September 2019, L.A. is associate professor of architecture at Columbia University's Graduate School of Design, Graduate School of Architecture, um, Planning and Preservation. She is widely published, including her recent book, Design of Destruction, The Making of International Monuments in the 20th Century from the University of Chicago Press. Dr. Forrest Munger came to Princeton jointly appointed in the School of Architecture and the new Adeline Center for Energy and Environment. He was previously in Singapore as assistant professor in the Department of Architecture at the National University of Singapore, where he had traveled initially as a senior researcher and research module coordinator in the Singapore ETH Center's Future Cities Laboratory. He has degrees from mechanical engineering, environmental engineering, and architecture. His fields of knowledge include building systems design and integration, sustainable systems, renewable energy, optimization of energy systems, existential analysis, geothermals, several energy storage, low temperature hybrid solar, building material, thermodynamics, and heat transfer and heat pumps. That was a mouthful. So, yeah. Yeah. please. Okay. And concrete. And concrete. <laughs> we don't, uh, do we need this? No. <laughs> All right. Um, Okay. Um, concrete, good morning. I'm Lucia. This is Forrest. Concrete today, as we know it today, is 100 years old. And before you protest that concrete has existed since Roman times, what we need is that the most recent innovation, uh, which is to have systematically inserted reinforcement into concrete, is 100 years old. And before you protest that it can't possibly exactly be 100, uh, because uh, reinforcing concrete was not uh, invented by one person in one place at one time. Uh, we've constructed this interpretation by working together as a historian and an engineer in recognition of the fact that the most significant innovation, to speak the language of this conference, the most significant innovation in the history of concrete, the one that dramatically redefined it, expanding its influence, making concrete the second most abundantly used material in the world, only second to water, this innovation also completely redefined how old concrete could be. Over the last century, while engineers were experimenting with use and applicability, and while scholars were documenting its impact on architecture, on materials and labor, 
The addition of steel reinforcement also secretly transformed the very nature of concrete as a historical actor and as a historical factor. The secret only trickled into the largely empirical understanding of concrete that had been built up around 50 years after it became widespread use. So our first piece of evidence is an equation that was published to Little Fanfare in 1968, which established that uh, concrete has a finite limited life. So this equation predicts the number of years, t, that any re reinforced concrete structure under conditions of natural exposure will take to fail through what's called carbonation. Now what the equation says, right, is that all reinforced structures that are reinforced with steel have a finite life in, in, implicitly because they are in contact with the atmosphere and the atmosphere has, do we have a pointer? The atmosphere has CO2 in it. And so there's a driving force of CO2 causing this process called carbonation. This process causes the failure of concrete, which is what we'll be talking about today. Now the variables in the equation are, um, the key ones that define the rate are the X, which is the depth of concrete above the rebar, the steel, and the porosity, which is D, which is a variable describing the torturous pathway that the CO2 must take through the concrete, so how big the pores are in it. And these two properties of the concrete uh, define, in the end, that, that amount of time until this rebar will, will, fa will fail. So this equation describes this phenomenon, um, how this concrete structure slowly, what's called passivates, um, and comes to ke chemical equilibrium with the atmosphere. But it also describes inevitable failure of an architectural kind, right? Carbonation transforms the chemical balance of the concrete that surrounds the steel reinforcement. And then this causes then the actual failure of oxidation causing rust, which expands the concrete, cracks and delaminates the rebar from the surrounding cement and concrete. And it can then no longer perform together as this single innovative material. Um, okay. so. Traditionally, historians and engineers have different attitudes to equations. Traditionally, historians relativize the truth claims of equations. And for engineers, equations serve as a kind of glue for research communities. They're kind of b carriers of the principles of basic science. But climate change, so here's your uh, hockey stick moment, is palpably affecting how historians and engineers talk and write. And we were just walking in the hall and we caught a lecture in progress with no, no less than three hockey stick curves being projected. Um, historians cool. are increasingly feeling an urge to quantify historical time in order to make legible what they call the Anthropocene, a new era in Earth history where natural phenomena are not just backdrops for human action, but rather where human and non-human events are profoundly affecting one another. And in the face of this new dynamic, historians are increasingly interrupting their stories to resort to science sometimes delivering fairly cogent explanations of scientific phenomena in order to write a new kind of history. Um, researchers in science and technology are also increasingly using history to describe their motivations. It's not unusual for new research in concrete and in other fields to begin by saying that my research fits into the fact that concrete began millennia ago or that uh, concrete is the most abundant anthropogenic sedimentary rock on the planet, so that every detailed incremental result is factored into this global and millennial picture of energy. So in this context, what does our equation tell us about reinforced concrete? First of all, by telling us that reinforced concrete is mortal, the equation challenges a century's worth of architectural myth-making about concrete. Uh, about concrete as permanent as stone, an emblem of modern scientific rationality dominating the features of uh, the, the forces of nature. And furthermore, by plugging into this equation the standard specification for concrete construction today, we can estimate that it will take about 100 years for most reinforced concrete structures around the world to fail through carbonation. It's not an exact number, as you'll hear, but it's a surprisingly reliable and determinant outcome. So putting these two findings together, we have a remarkable coincidence that reinforced concrete is 100 years old, and it takes about 100 years for reinforced concrete to die. So picture this. A moving wall of physical um, failure is raking through the built environment, ensuring that much of what is built today, uh, buildings, roads, infrastructure, uh, is certain to fail in no more than a century. But this fundamental problem with the finite material life of reinforced concrete 
barely appears in conversations about future concrete research. It is not because the science hasn't, hasn't been known. The carbonation equation was first proposed all the way back in 1928, albeit only in Japanese, by a team from the University of Tokyo based on experiments that began in 1907. This formula was refined and verified over many decades and then eventually published in English by Minoru Hamada in 1968, leading to the seminal review subsequently of the formula's literature and impacts by a Swedish researcher, Kiosti Tutti, in 1982. But the subsequent rethinking of concrete's lifespan never followed. So in our research, we use the carbonation of concrete to help rethink technical causality in the Anthropocene more broadly, and the way we consider time scales across different fields of research more contextually. All right, so let's just begin with the fact that neither figure that I mentioned is exactly 100. Um, architectural historians all agree that one of the most important factors to the triumph of concrete was that it requires little exactitude. The early history of reinforced concrete is filled with approximation, trial and error, and theories that trail behind empirical findings. The new material emerged simultaneously from a widespread network of actors, amateurs, and engineers. Gradually, standards emerged, and by 1910, an industry was born. And more than any other material, concrete was a veritable kind of liquid stone that competed with nature itself. So just to remind us, here is one of the great champions of concrete. From slender iron rods, cement, sand, and gravel, from an aggregate body, vast buildings, complexes can suddenly crystallize into single stone monoliths. Like previously, like no other previously known material. And concrete's novelty was announced with incredible amounts of historical hubris, as you've heard, and it turns out that this hubris was measured in centuries. Indeed, the birth of concrete was completely bound up in the centennial fever that uh, motivated international events like the World's Fair, or like the International Expo in 1900, where the Ennebeek system got the top prize for the best innovation. The obsession with the century as a historical unit had started a century before that, the idea that history progresses in arbitrarily numbered multiples of 100, that's something that was invented after the French Revolution when to kind of clean up history writing from more messy periodization like kings and generations. So in order to be secular, um, you could quantify time by centuries. Um, and the round figure of 100 was especially useful because it seemed metrical. And yet paradoxically, precisely because concrete was this kind of authorless secular material, Concrete engineers operated in a kind of perpetual now. So early advances in concrete technologies were measured in extremely short increments. This first patent for the Ennebeek system, which won the Innovation Prize in 1900 at the Centennial Exhibition, expired in seven years. Auguste Perret, who built this building, one of the sort of canonical slender uh, buildings, was refused a mortgage of 40 years because the bankers took the visual ap appearance as enough evidence that it would surely collapse before 40 years. Um, a 1911 source put the lifespan of concrete at 70 to 90 years. In Italy, a lifespan of 70 years was used as early as 1935. And once reinforced concrete became uh, more used for infrastructure, the number 100 was more commonly used, not because it, was, it would be acceptable for a uh, structure to collapse after 100 years, but because it was assumed that within 100 years you would be able to do maintenance and replacement of any parts. Okay. Now, what they didn't realize about that maintenance was that all structures, including ones that have undergone maintenance, continue and were before continuously subjected to carbonation. So how does this carbonation equation then fit into all of this history? So systematic failure of reinforcement was noticed already in the teens. Concrete cracked and failed faster where steel rebar was placed closer to the surface of concrete. So we knew already the depth mattered. In 1917, Italian researchers correctly described this process and the relationship to depth. It was also noted that the proximity to seawater would increase the rate of failure due to the chlorides from salt. So we already knew it had to do with oxidation. And this evidence was quickly translated to imply how those relationships related to these chemicals in the environment. And chemists also had a very good sense of the relationship in the equation where T equals um, uh, K to X squared, right? This X squared component is related to the basic law of Fick's law, which was defined in 1895, according to which any medium say air, which has a high concentration of a substance, wants to come to equilibrium by diffusion through adjoining media. And so this rate was understood to be driving this process. So we understood a lot about what was going on. Now, what Humada and Uchida in Tokyo finally described in 1928, but only in Japanese, 
was the missing piece to all of this evidence and science, which was what is the thing that's actually diffusing? And what does that, how does that relate to our environment? So since the problem of oxidation uh, of the reinforcement um, was logically thought initially to be oxygen being transported from the outside air via rainwater or some other mechanism or just diffusion, um, in fact, it was not the oxygen diffusing. The oxygen was already sitting inside in the water. Um, it turns out that the cement binder in concrete, that magical little component that turns from liquid to solid forms, right, um, had been given this new task inside the, the concrete. So when you have this cement binder, it is initially at a very high pH. And this is the key component to this whole process, right? The cement adjacent to the rebar is at such a high pH that this passivation, the passivation passivates the oxidation of the rebar, it prevents rust from happening, right? And so what carbonation does, and what Hamada realized in Japan, was that uh, Hamada understood before anybody else that it was this other reaction, the secondary reaction of carbonation within the concrete that eventually lowers the pH and cancels out the passivation and then allows the oxidation to occur. So correlating his observations with the depth of carbonation during different time periods, uh, Hamana produced this equation that demonstrated a universal finite life of reinforced concrete. And by 1968, he recognized that while the original form of his equation was correct, um, K, this factor, varied highly depending on the different types of concrete um, as porosities and depths vary through different uh, deployments. Can we talk about the, um, the purple and, color? Yes. And so... In one thing that has carried on throughout history, these are samples from today, and even back when Hamada was doing this, carbonation and can be observed just by doing simple pH measurements. So the pink measurement is a standard mechanism of measuring the pH in the concrete. Um, and if you look at animations, like we commonly do in, in, in concrete analysis, you will see how um, and why the observed uh, carbonation lifespans end up ranging so widely, actually, on either side of our predicted 100 years. Because the speed of the reinforcement, of the reinforced concrete's decay is not directly linearly proportional to time, right? It, it takes longer and longer to get deeper and deeper into the concrete. So it, it's easy for it to take anywhere. Uh, it could take from 80 years for a carbonation to get almost all the way to the rebar, or it could take 100 years to get the same depth with a very little variation in the concrete's uh, properties. Should I play it again? So this wide range, right? Yeah, so the beginning it goes very fast, and then this, these last sections, because of Fick's law, makes the diffusion take place uh, slower, and it creates a wider variation. So uh, this just confirms that, indeed, the equation is deterministic in its setting a fate for concrete, but 100 years just tends to be the number that is the most indicative of its lifespan. <laughs> um, all right, so why did carbonation, this binding, uh, remain so marginal after it was discovered? And it's especially surprising that no big revelation followed the publication of the carbonation equation because it came at a moment of rising environmental awareness, 1969, 1982. Um, here's the other hockey stick curve. Oh, this is, sorry, that's the hockey stick curve. That's the phases of carbonation. And this is the other hockey stick curve that are deeply uh, concerned with. These two phenomena, these two curves are related. So just as a reminder, the CO2 in the atmosphere that is diffusing into concrete's pores is the same CO2 whose concentration is in the atmosphere has risen to just above 400 parts per million to 300 parts per million that it was a century ago. So the concrete construction industry, this is for you, contributes approximately 5 to 8% of the anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And the anthropogenic nature of concrete's formation, which is causing its failure, also is being changed by the concentration of CO2 in the air. So in this sense, what we're saying is that concrete propagates its own failure. And yet correlating these two hockey sticks historically is very difficult. Uh, our 100 years don't fit very well within the three phases that are supposed to divide this hockey stick. It's supposed to be that there was a beginning of the Anthropocene in the Industrial Revolution, 1800, and then there was a great acceleration around 1945, and then a kind of point of no return around 2000. Um, so carbonation research, as you've just heard, was an integral component of concrete research in the 20th century, 
uh, with the period from 1907 to 1902, actually seeing gradual incremental research findings. Um, but the story is slightly different, and there are also three phases. So I know we have almost out of time, but I'll go quickly. Um, the first phase, in the first phase, the research dynamics went exclusively from site to lab. Hamada's work began as a research assistant to Toshika Tasano, who, like many other architect engineers, traveled to San Francisco in 1906 to witness the effects of the earthquake on reinforced concrete. He returned to Tokyo, produced a whole set of material samples, and it was those samples that Hamada used in his 1928 paper. In fact, Hamada was undeniably one of the most versatile, internationally connected, and accomplished concrete researchers. He would be at this conference today. He would be like an A-lister. But he was also involved in many other kinds of testing, not just carbonation. His goals were to include safety in earthquake, fire, war, against salinity for use in national building standards, and to encourage trade and commercial export. So he was involved in architectural education. He built a chamber in his architecture school devoted entirely to pumping CO2 into concrete. And when he finally published his findings in English, he was at the end of this kind of uh, phase of industrializing and institutionalizing concrete research. The second phase begins when his findings are published in English and they're transported into Sweden. This time it's the whole territory that's conceived as a laboratory, a kind of full-scale mock-up. Tutti conducts no new experiments for his dissertation. He just feeds Hamada's equation with samples of buildings that had been built since the 1930s in Sweden as a kind of massive experiment in modernist building. Um, although his insights confirmed the fragility of concrete, the myth of concrete as a monolithic material suitable for an entire country survives, and not just in Sweden, but basically everywhere. The third phase begins when the carbonation research that has then been confirmed by Tutti is brought into the emerging discipline of material science. So material science engineering became an autonomous field growing out of metallurgy in the 60s and 70s. It was an innovation-driven discipline. It worked by transferring the properties of one material onto others. You could even say that material science was invented to, cre uh, to kind of host and, and probabilize equations like Hamada's. Um, to probabilize molecular behaviors and make new materials, not deal with existing materials like concrete. So as soon as the carbonation equation became widely accepted, it was taken out of the architectural, out of the experimental, the territorial, and into a science that segments innovation into highly specific domains, the chemistry part, the physics part, the computational part. Mm -hmm. But it is this detailed understanding of the internal workings of concrete and the related 100 years that are now situated in the Anthropocene that can motivate shifts in historical perspective and drive necessary innovation. In this third phase of ine inevitable no return, we have the detailed science that shows that CO2 is driving climate change and it is also driving an inevitable failure of concrete. Both these processes register across the time frame of 100 years, yet at that pace, we might think of the analogy of the frog slowly heated up in the pot of water that never jumps out and then is left to die boiling. Whereas we as humans, I would hope, are slightly smarter than frogs um, and have here in this room both historical and technical knowledge that should inform us to take action. So it's with this mentality as we close and begin the conference today um, that we suggest we all take this as a precedent and think about how the innovations presented can be better motivated by considering all of these temporal dynamics that surround concrete. As we discuss labor and industrialization, we have to recognize how concrete's use ubiquitously in housing may not necessarily matter for long lifespans, but certainly drives the huge use of concrete and the emissions. We must also con consider how innovation um, that, that changes the, the dynamics of how carbonation and the relationship between lifespan and resiliency, as we try and build resilient structures, we must recognize those time limits. And then finally, as we discover new ways to create better forms and minimize material use, we have to continually understand how material science of concrete can inform both these lifespans in terms of carbonation, but also whether alternative production pathways might lead to redu a reduction of the CO2 emissions that are driving that process. And so in, clo in closing, although we surely have not convinced you that concrete is 100 years old, we hope we have provided both the technical and historical material to inform our discussions on innovations in concrete today, and especially to rethink the role that research plays in an age where 100 years is not just any other number.
next pres our next presentation um, are by Maria Gonzalez Pendez and Natea Corquilla. Um, Maria Gonzalez Pendez is a postdoctoral fellow at the Society of Fellows and Heyman Center in the Humanities and a lecturer in the Art History Department of Columbia University, where she also leads a new interdisciplinary initiative on public humanities. Trained as an architect and a historian, her, her teaching and research explores the intersection of spatial and building practices with processes of technological, governmental, and religious modernizations across the Spanish post-colonial world. Atea is, um, is an architectural um, historian, is an assistant professor at Columbia University GSAP, researching the infrastructure environments and ecological landscapes of the developmental Indian state with an interest in the aesthetics of construction material as a, as, such as concrete, bamboo, and plastic. Her, her current book um, project investigates the plinth as an interface between infrastructure and architecture in developmental discourse in post-World War II India arguing for this architectural gesture as a point where the state, the market, and foreign interests converge to produce a global third world subjectivity during the Cold War. So please welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. So we're, we're having the slides there. How do we get to our slides? How, how do we get to Is it a different? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Have to wait 140 years. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much. We want to start by uh, thank you, Katie and Wes, and of course, TN, for inviting us to be part of this amazing con, uh, conference. And we want to start by sort of um, uh, telling you a little bit about how we're going to do this. We have taken your invitation to have a conversation very, very seriously. Uh, Atea and I are both architectural historians. We work mostly independently in our research, uh, both on mid 20th century politics of concrete. Atea in the Indian independence, I work in um, the Latin American world. Um, but again, we work independently, uh, but today we thought that the way to state this conversation is that we exchange our work, we read each other's work, and we're gonna be presenting each other's work. So I'm gonna be commenting and presenting Atea's work. She's gonna be presenting briefly on uh, my, my work, and then we're gonna finish by bouncing a few uh, um, questions off each other. So we appreciate the little signs with the two minutes because we'll just call it a day when the time, um, when the time is up. Um, so that's, and hopefully we can continue with the questions later in, in the Q&A, but just to say that this is a bit of an exploratory format for us uh, also, so thank you for that and we hope that it is a legible um, format. Ah, where? This one, the big one? No? I think I like the yeah. materiality. Okay. All right. So Maria Onatea's work. From dams to, warehouse, uh, to warehouses, Atea's research turns to engineering works to cast concrete as a mode of politics, a technology and a media system crucial to the production of architectural landscapes, yes, but also crucial to the production of socioeconomic relations and political regimes. Concrete builds economies and informs technologies, but it also builds societies and ideologies. In this case, the case of uh, independence India, ideologies of nationalism and economies of development. Atayas analysis goes well beyond contextual operations um, in the traditional mode of architectural history to argue that concrete works were uh, formally determined by social and political forces just as much as by structural limits or stylistic choices. Central to the polyvalent formation of a politics of concrete, of concrete was the production of new social relations, new social values called to govern life under modernity. In Atea's work, concrete is itself a site where expertise emerged as a social value and the expert, uh, the engineer in particular, emerged as its subject. In the process, the technological, um, so that's the expert, uh, in the process, believe it or not, in the process, the technological and social relations of construction shifted, and knowledge production began to translate from the domain of the contractor on site to the domain of the engineer away from it. In this dislocation of know-how from the contractor to the engineer, uh, the engineer was called to facilitate, above all else, efficiency. 
Efficiency has long enjoyed a level of mantra or belief under conditions of modernity, as historian of technology Jennifer Alexander has argued, as she traces how a concept and a value that emerged within technology efficiency transferred to become a social value of quasi-religious status in the US. So efficiency has this sort of level of myth um, that informs so many claims around concrete. In India and in Mexico, the context where I work, and elsewhere across the global south, the mantra of efficiency certainly took hold during mid-century development. This is the moment where your um, um, diagram before sort of started to spike up um, with efficiency at its value. And in the global south, this was often hinged on conditions of scarcity and the idea of scarcity, scarcity of food and of steel, for instance. So the demand was to tackle scarcity through efficient design with its unparalleled structural and material uh, characteristics, pro concrete proved fitting for the task. But as Ateya argues in her work, concrete and the engineer work not only at the level of India's material infrastructures, but also, and perhaps more powerfully, at the level of the imagination, at the level of consciousness you were talking about before. Uh, that is, concrete worked and the expert worked as figures that offered the emerging nation new ideas and ways of thinking of what was possible ideas uh, related, um, or ideas where efficiency and flexibility were seen to solve scarcity through what she calls, and I quote her, an ideology of multipurpose capacity. So I want to insist on, or ask Ateya more, about the ways in which efficiency was socially construed, however much as a universal value, as a truth. How engineers and architects in particular help invest efficiency with social and moral balance, and to what effects. For in India, as in Mexico, scarcity and efficiency pertain commodities, and some commodities like steel and sand and food, but crucially not bodies, or at least not the bodies on the site, the construction workers, the bodies who were excessive in number, whose movements were not necessarily efficient, and who I suppose were the source of hunger the hungry bodies of development, incommensurable and at its most extreme, disposable. So these are the bodies who died during the construction of the Bakra Dam, uh, which a story Ateya tells. In his speeches, Prime Minister Nehru elevated these dead bodies to heroic figures, and also briefly in a documentary that she uses in her work. So I get that my, my question um, as to the sort of celebration of the worker as a heroic figure of development, is to what extent this was a fetishization of labor in the Marxist sense, the use of the worker as a fetish, uh, a form of worshiping the worker that only hid the legal and economic conditions of production. So the subject that is not hidden uh, in, at the time uh, and in Ateya's work so this is the heroic representation of the worker. The figure that is not hidden and comes out in full modern form is the engineer, charged with computing concrete technology. So why did they not count workers, I ask um, her? Why did not count their movements and their excess? Why not count the social excess on which efficiency relied? I don't think this is an entirely unfair question to our engineers. I don't think, since they were squarely positioned within what Ateya calls the realm of social transformation. Concrete experts at the time, during mid-century, were relentlessly called on to fulfill, and I quote, a glorious task uh, of bringing plenty and contentment to an emerging nation and save it from famine. Claims of this kind echoed across the South where concrete and its experts were charged priest-like with bringing ecological, economic, and even spiritual redemption. So when it comes to concrete, the stakes, the stakes really seem to be very high. So why is concrete so very often called on to perform some form of salvation, some form of miracle? Concrete has long nurtured a magical allure a cool value anchored in its seemingly supernatural ability to turn dust into stone and into anyone's scale and desire as with the Bakra Dam in India. But the best of magic tricks, the best of magic requires the best of tricks, the best of crafts and uh, tools of deception. Which brings us back to the question anchoring Ateya's research and today's conversation, who produces the knowledge about the turning of dust into form 
and where is this knowledge produced, are questions to which uh, historians seem to uh, typically add uh, what is the cost, the social cost. One the steep cost at mid-century was the neglect towards workers. As Ataya writes, and I quote her, engineers obscure the fact that even machines needed people to operate them. In their journals, experts wrote as if the dam would be built without manual labor. So narratives around concrete at the time, um, okay, so this was the image that was meant since we were sort of crafting the images together, they're not perfectly aligned, to represent sort of the glorious task, uh, not of the concrete. Uh, images uh, or narratives around concrete at the time came in two forms. One was the technocratic language that represented concrete through numbers and drawings. Engineers both mastered and embodied the power of quantification. Uh, these numbers counted mostly things, but not bodies of, or movements, in a language that excised uh, labor and maintenance in lieu of expertise and innovation. The other were the propaganda representations, no? where the workers appear as heroically Yes, but also fleetingly, uh, a marker of social democracy in images that similarly glossed over the specifics of the workers. So both genres proved blind to the dynamics on site and to the social and racial relations that were at stake. The two are only seemingly paradoxical representations of labor, a dialectic uh, of the same project of nation building through ideals of efficiency and expertise. So where are these bodies? Uh, the body has long been excised from our understanding of concrete technologies to use a verb that Ateya mobilizes as she calls to render labor visible in our unpacking of a politics of concrete. This is indeed an urgent call for bodies like nature, I would add, are, by res are but resources whose extraction underscores the exploitative relations that continue to determine very real problems, that continue to determine colonization, development, and concrete technologies across the world today. The task is daring. Labor remains, um, oops, um, labor remains a glaring absence in historical and design narratives, the worker elusive in our research which is not mere oversight, as Ateya's work shows. For the categories and the archives with which we analyze and discuss concrete architecture, categories such as efficiency, objects such as drawings and structural diagrams were meant to obscure the bodies on site to begin with. They were designed to neglect the workers' due value. A labor archive is still there for us to aggregate, if I may. It's pieces somewhere in the numerical language of the expert, the heroic uh, images of propaganda, and perhaps most ghostly, and I'm turning now to um, uh, a structure in Mexico to continue the conversation, perhaps most ghostly, these bodies are mapped onto the materiality of concrete itself, the forms by which we might make visible the bodies who carried innovation quite literally on their shoulders. Um. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tien. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, Katie, for organizing this, just to echo Maria. Um, so I'm presenting a little piece of her work, and I will just begin. Why did one of Candela's many shells, the open Palmyra church in Cuernavaca, south of Mexico, collapse in 1952? This question can be answered in many ways, gravity, incompetence, cement shortages, design failures. The answer, in a sense, depends on the discipline to which we ask the question. Sociology, political science, structural engineering, architecture being just a few. Um, in Maria's research, she argues that we are asking the question from the wrong end. The question here is not one of thickness or concrete ratios or reinforcement diameters. Um, if we are to understand the failure of the structure, we need to understand the relationship between labor and design. The collapse of this shell is spectacular, but it conceals the many, many smaller collapses that occur on and in the bodies of workers. Um, to investigate the smaller collapses buried under this larger one, Maria turns to another set of collapses, the collapse of Cubiertas Ala, the Cadella's um, contracting firm the firm that made shells stand but failed to pay workers insurance and uh, led to the, that led to their foreclosure in the 1970s. 
What can we make of all of these collapses off and around shells that seem to promise to save architectural modernity? The promise of shells was that they substitute um, geometry for mass in their gambit for strength. So the shell is, in a sense, the opposite of the dam. Um, shells required architectural, structural, and mathematical expertise in a way that centered the architect. And here we have um, Candela, the contractor. Um, in a way that centered the architect as expert. And what is forgotten, of course, in this story is that the third world was really attempting to modernize in a condition of profound scarcity. Shells seem to promise heroic modernism, technological modernity, and material efficiency. And Maria notes that the workers for Cubiertas a la routinely mangled hands, lost toenails, dangled from staircases as they precariously transported um, revoltura, liquid cement, um, up uh, to pour into often handmade for formwork. Ironically, it is these bodily incapacitations that triggered insurance policies, thus marking the names of um, Jose Cardenas Contreras, Jose Bautisto Romera, Joaquin Adam Barales in official archives. And in recouping these names, Maria poses a question, how should we archive the laborers of our buildings? She frames this question in another way, which is how do we evaluate the bodies of workers? Is it only possible to catalog these bodies in terms of risk? The valuation of the body, the cost of labor, is central to decision making in how these shells were contracted and where their expertise was located. The archive of what happened to workers can only be told from the perspective of risk management. So there's this doubling of the body of the worker, necessary for making the structure, but also necessary as a guarantor of value, of the value of labor, which becomes a mechanism to account for quantified and com computed bodies in the concrete economy. So how then do we unwrap the cost of the shell? How do we evaluate the body and the, of the labor and the laborer outside of the metrics of risk and insurance? Um, Maria pose, Maria's work poses this tricky question, which is how do we extract these bodies outside of their valuation and financialization? How do we historicize them on different terms? And embedded in this historical question is a more political and urgent one, which is how do we now uh, craft an archive with a more critical and less colonial approach to the history uh, of some of, arch of architecture's most alluring materials and technologies? Can we bring labor into the history of design? In Candela's case, um, the labor involved in making detailed calculations for hypar shells, which often combined multiple geometric forms to achieve their final effect, were too tedious. Um, the, two of these. Bits. Yeah, we can keep yeah. that for a bit. Oh. Okay. Were too tedious. Um, involving calculation tables. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so these are these would be some of the tables that Candela would have probably looked at, but these are tables from shells in India. Uh, yeah, from the Bureau, Indian Bureau of Standards. Until uh, the firm purchased machines to do the math with punch cards. Often that's the machine up there. Often Candela only provided two elevations and a plan, an efficiency of drawing and time. Um, for, uh, indicating them as enough to construct the formwork for the shells on site. So shells were thus resolved and designed, we should prob properly argue, on site by unnamed laborers left out of archives whose knowledge of concrete made these shapes and forms possible at all. The resolution of the form and the formwork um, took place on site, a process that uh, Maria uses Pamela Smith's phrase, artisanal epistemology, to describe. And um, these concrete shells bear the marks of laborers, oh, we have, you can see the marks uh, of, in, in its plastic surface, stamps of wood, hooks for ladders, and traces of their making. The travesty of this industry is that it embodies risk, and it expects the worker to transact in that space of embodied risk. Shells are efficient because they outsource risk to the bodies of workers. So we see with the history of construction that there is a constant computation and extraction of value from the various, proce various processes around labor. The shells emerge out of a dialectical relationship uh, between two economic imaginaries, a performed efficiency and an embodied excess. Mm. 
the shell's efficiency is contingent on an excess embodied by labor. Maria makes the crucial point that the cheapness of shells, although sold as a frugality of material, was actually a, a product of the extraction of cheap labor. But there is a larger historical shift captured in this work, the history of the separation of lab and site, um, and the separation of the kinds of labor that take place in the laboratory and on site. And of course, laboratory is literally the place where we labor, um, from you know, the Latin word. The separation of lab and site is often told as a story of the technological division of labor, intellectual versus physical labor, the logical conclusion of, um, the, of a platonic mind-body dualism, perhaps, in, in which concrete requiring technical precision in design and also in mixing is shifted further and further away from the site. Um, but the history of concrete has a different story to tell, which is that risk, it is risk and not technology that has fueled this distancing, um, or rather risk in addition to technology that has fueled this distancing between lab and site. Um, and in that sense, my question to Maria really is a question of how do we understand where risk is located in the history of concrete and on the bodies of laborers? Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, I have the one minute, so these questions so, are going to yeah, be performative probably only. a good idea to um, um, elaborate on them later in our discussion. Right. Thank yeah, thank you. So actually, before we have the third presentation for the morning session, we're going to just have a short uh, coffee break in 15 minutes. So we'll come back in 15 minutes. Thanks.
Okay, so thank you for um, welcome back to, from the break. Um, I'm going to just introduce our next presenters um, before we have a discussion for this panel. Um, Ken Hover um, began work for Dougal and Myers Construction Company in Cincinnati as an estimator, then assistant superintendent, project engineer, and project manager. After serving as a captain in the U.S. Army Combat Engineers, um, Ken joined THP Lab um, Company, consulting engineers as a designer, spe specification writers, and eventually partner and manager. He has over 200 publications addressing various material states of concrete, and Ken is past president of ACI and member of the past chair of several ACI committees. Um, and I, I will keep the file short um, because they can be quite long of accolades. Um, Sasha Zegovic is an assistant professor at Cornell University, AAP, where he directs the Robotics Construction Laboratory, an interdisciplinary research group investigating robotic-based con construction technology. Um, Zegovic is a co-principal of HANA, an experimental architectural practice based in Ithaca, New York. HANA's research focuses on uh, advancing traditional building construction techniques by implementing new technologies and processes of making, addressing subjects of construction, rapid urbanization, and mass customization housing design. So join me to welcome Kent and Sasha. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Tian. Ken and I are very excited to be a part of this symposium, and we would like to thank Tian, Wes, and Jerry for the kind invitation. Our talk is titled, Protecting the Public, Safeguarding the End Users of Our Art and Technology. So we'll also start at the beginning. For everyone who's been to a construction site, this image might present a familiar scenario. Shovels, buckets, construction workers, and the pouring of concrete into wooden formwork. Pictured here is the roughly 150-year-old or 100-year-old proven and largely unchanged state of the art of common concrete construction. In many respects, buildings are built the same way that they were built 100 years ago. And in many respects, perhaps until recently, building codes or standards were reflective of that condition. For everyone who's been to a lot of architecture conferences, this chart is also very familiar. The global construction industry has an efficiency and productivity problem. While other industries have adopted automation, robotics, and data processing to increase productivity, the productivity in construction has remained stagnant since 1945, and many of us predict this to change. At a fundamental level, new concrete technologies challenge the way buildings are designed and constructed. Robotics, digital fabrication, and computation enable the seemingly effortless mass customization of structures and building components. This constitutes a fundamental paradigm shift for the construction industry, architecture, and engineering. This also means that future buildings might become one-offs systems and are less likely to follow a conventional recipe of technical ingredients, material mixtures, and con construction techniques. So closing the gap between the research lab and the construction site presents a tremendous challenge due to the absence of codes and standards applicable to new building techniques. The following four case studies each address the issue of emerging standards in different ways. The first and second project I show today are deceiving. They look like 3D printed buildings, but they are in fact hybrid constructions. Corbel Cabin uses 3D printed concrete components as sacrificial formwork for conventional concrete construction. We 3D print complex geometries, or not so complex geometries, which become the containers for rebar and concrete. The rebar is custom fabricated to adjust to the interior of the 3D printed geometry, and then you pour the concrete into that. We construct the cabin this way predominantly due to safety reasons. While it's not obvious from this image that we are safety freaks, um, we did not trust our 3D printed concrete to be structural. Our current process has too many variables leading to big cracks in hairline fractures, misalignments, or layer delaminations, etc. Luckily, in this structure, none of this matters. We could chisel away the 3D printed skin, and the structure would still stand and hold up. 
In a way, you could argue we cheated. We made what seems to be a 3D printed building, which in fact relies upon conventional concrete construction, reinforced concrete, to hold itself up. Now to us, this still makes sense because we save all the wooden formwork it would take to build such a structure. So there is innovation, there is advancement, albeit incremental in nature. I think it's important uh, to keep in mind that the code discussion applies to many other material systems uh, and construction techniques as well. This is a, a robotically fabricated timber skin uh, which completes the cabin which we finished uh, this summer. And we will only really be able to successfully transition from lab to site if we broadly address code and its legal or safety ramifications. The second project, before we built our own 3D printer at Cornell and worked on the cabin, my partner Leslie and I briefly worked with a Chinese company called Winsun who are commercially 3D printing buildings in China. So conceptually, this is a very similar system utilizing 3D printed formwork and conventional concrete construction, uh, largely for code reasons. We developed a small structure, a factory guardhouse. The design is a play on edge conditions between right angle and fillet, because Winsun can only print straight extrusions uh, for now or maybe forever. What's interesting about this building to us is also that it's fully permitted and it suggests strategies to implement building systems during construction. In its very early stages, building industry adapts new hybrid technologies such as concrete 3D printing and reinforced concrete construction. And most importantly, it helps to establish a legal framework to deploy such projects in the real world. And that to me is a big achievement of, of Winsun. But what do we do when cheating or hybrid construction is not an option? The third case study is in fact a 3D printed and self-supporting structure uh, a small one. In 2018, HANA won the Folly Function Competition organized by the Architecture League of New York and Socrates Sculpture Park. We designed 3D printed chairs that, when rolled, enable different seating configurations for the user. We developed full scale prototypes for the competition. This is an image of the competition stage. Knowing that they will need heavy modification because the concrete that we use here for printing is largely unreinforced. It's no surprise that the unreinforced concrete can hold a lot of weight. Careful with it. But on impact, this happens. A catastrophic structural failure. Um, and that's an issue, obviously. So <laughs> our team did a series of tests to determine a suitable reinforcement method. And mind you, that's, this is within the short time span of a project like this. It's mostly educated guessing because there are so many variables in 3D printing in the process itself. Layer height, material mixture, curing time, the type of fiber reinforcement, the experience of the person operating the printer. These variables all impact structural behavior, are challenging to control, can lead to structural failure, and have an impact on reinforcement strategies. In the end, we settled on another semi-hybrid construction, adding three pieces of number four custom bent steel rebar for each chair. The rebar is then embedded during the printing process, which means that some of the layers are double width, which significantly increases the weight of each chair, which makes them less user friendly. And it's a kind of semi-satisfactory result but within the short time frame of the project, it was the best possible outcome. So out of the 20 chairs deployed to the park, 13 survived one year in, in New, York, New York City with park visitor exposure and are now at display at Art Omai Sculpture Park in Ghent. So in order to implement such an experimental project, one needs a client willing to take the risk, knowing that the project is not up to any code being aware that there might be durability issues, realizing that with the right determination, um, concrete furniture can break. Uh, we did not experience catastrophic failure in the park, but um, we might have. For the fourth project, a work in progress, there are no shortcuts. Everything has to be invented, tested, and standardized from scratch. At RCL, we developed a method of spatial concrete printing on a substrate. 
And this method enables the creation of complex and structurally optimized shell geometries with uh, intricate tool paths. So with a team of colleagues from Cornell, Ken and I are currently working on the advancement of this sub-adaptive printing method. And in order to implement the method, we will have to consider and develop standard procedures for a wide range of factors. Layer behavior, material mixtures, fabrication process, protocols, viscosity control, freeze-thaw durability, wet-dry behavior, flexure testing for different reinforcement methods, fire safety, earthquake behavior, environmental per, uh, performance, the list is almost endless. And so a project like this one um, really raises a couple questions for me. Can building codes adapt to the ever accelerating innovation in the construction industry without compromising safety? In the future, will each new innovative building or structure require its own possibly expensive set of standards? Can the implementation of new building standards be accelerated? And how might architects and engineers collaborate on the development of new standards and procedures which address the emerging context of mass customization in architecture and engineering? And with these overwhelming questions, I hand this presentation over to my esteemed <laughs> colleague. Thank you very much. Uh, when you go back home and your colleagues uh, say to you, well, so what's the big deal about concrete? They're probably going to say, what's the big deal about cement anyway? You can, uh, you can tell them that uh, total global production and consumption of concrete is 12 kilograms per person per day for every single person on this planet. That translates to five and one half liters per day for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Now, my fundamental question for you right now is have you had your concrete today? Building codes protect the public. That is their purpose. They are not bureaucratic sets of complicated rules for no reason. They are bureaucratic sets of complicated rules for the purpose of protecting the public and the, and the public that we are protecting are people who do not know what we know. They do not care what we know. They just trust us that we are putting facilities that will safeguard them into the infrastructure. And building codes, whether we like them or not, are the law. All 50 states have had their legislatures vote on adoption of building codes. All 50 states in the United States have chosen to adopt what's known as the International Building Code as their primary model code to which they add uh, uh, particular exceptions that are unique to their, uh, their region. Uh, though, as I mentioned, those, uh, all 50 states and all U.S. territories have adopted the, uh, the IBC. The IBC, in turn, has adopted the American Concrete Institute Building Code for Structural Concrete produced by ACI Committee 318 of which I have been a member since 1996. So a lot of the references here today will be to some new things which I think give us hope within the ACI uh, a building code. Now what kind of stuff will you find in a, uh, in a building code? You'll find responsibilities of the, uh, the various parties, design methodology and fundamental behavior. You will find flat out some structural mechanics inside a, uh, a building code. Mechanisms and modes of failure, mechanical property requirements and standards, durability-related uh, properties, requirements and standards. What about serviceability, shrinkage, creep, deflection, and cracking? Fire resistance, that, uh, that actually is an entirely separate uh, edition of the International Building Code. How do we inspect? How do we sample, test, quality control, quality assurance? What about reliability? At this instant, the ACI 318 building code is looking at a 99% uh, confidence level for concrete strength. And building codes will also tell us about construction requirements and evaluating existing structures. Now, we might want to be bold and go it on our own and say we don't need building codes. And if that's the case, we need to put this sign on our innovative structures. Warning, innovative materials and construction methods were used in construction of this building. Long-term response to continuously or frequently applied dead or live load, cycles of wet, dry, hot, cold, freezing weather, or exposure to seawater, de-icing salt, sulfates, acid rain, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes, or earthquakes has not been ascertained. 
There is no consensus about how to reliably design with these materials or methods. Materials and methods do not conform with state or local building codes. Enter or pass nearby at your own risk. Now, Sasha told me that I should print these and sell these, that we've got uh, people here who will buy these for your structures. If we're going to go into the code business, we need a wide range of, uh, of mechanical properties, not just compression and tension strength, but there's a whole array of, uh, of other properties that we need to know. And how will they vary with changes in our mixes and changes with our uh, installation methodology? We need to know what the vulnerability is to uh, uh, environmental degradation. We heard a, a very exciting discussion earlier about one single vector, and that being carbonation. What about alkali reactions, fire damage, chlorides, corrosion, sulfate reactions, freezing and thawing? Generally speaking, in the United States, these vectors will kill the concrete before carbonation will. What about reliability and reproducibility? Our current building codes make assumptions based on 100 years of experience on how reliable our concrete is. If we ask a concrete producer to give us 5,000 PSI concrete at 28 days, we roughly know about how closely they are going to, uh, to do that, and that's built into our codes. Do we know that with our innovative materials? We know a lot about batch-to-batch -batch and within-batch variation within conventional concrete, do we yet know about batch to batch and within layer variability for 3D printed concrete, for example? But as we're thinking about can we solve these problems, I say yes, ladies and gentlemen, there is hope for the concrete heart. <laughs> there are issues, and we just heard the issues, but I think there is hope. And strangely, some of the evidence for that hope comes from the most recently published version of the ACI 318 code, that is the 2019 uh, version. And what do I see in there? Because I participated in some of these. Uh, Shotcrete was adopted in the 2019 building code, acceptance of recycled aggregates, and acceptance of alternative cements. And what I want to do is tell you brief stories about those three new entrees to the building code that I think help pave the way for how we will get this innovation into the uh, other code. One could say shotcrete, which is technically known as pneumatically applied mortar. One could say this is the first in a long series of 3D printing in which it is just pneumatically uh, applied instead of hydraulically or gravity fed. Now, uh, shotcrete has been around for a very long time, but only in 2019 has it been officially recognized in the building code. And, one, and a couple of the things that really helped that adoption, this happened in one single cycle. The 2014 code was done, the 2019 code was the next one up, Shotcrete was not in 2014, was not even discussed. And in one single code cycle, Shotcrete was uh, fully embraced. But what made that possible? Pre-existence of consensus documents from industry as to what's the right way to do Shotcrete and how should architects and engineers specify Shotcrete. Those Consensus documents existed in advance of the, uh, of the building code. And it tells us about uh, uh, freezing and thawing, reinforcement, where you are allowed to use shotcrete. What about materials, proportioning and mixtures, documentation mixtures, placement, consolidation, curing, joints, evaluation and acceptance. Those topics there would apply to 3D printing, for example. We just have to fill in the blanks and figure out what we want to say there. Another thing that made this possible is the existence of the American Shotcrete Association, a professional uh, organization in which people could get together, could discuss good practices, and allow some of the ideas to uh, start coming together. Without that, it would not have gotten into the, uh, the building code so easily. We heard that there's a shortage of sand. We heard that there is a shortage of, uh, of course, aggregate. In, uh, in the Hawaiian Islands right now, they are building concrete structures out of sand and coarse aggregate that is shipped to Hawaii from British Columbia. They used to ship it from California until California woke up and said, we've got to stop shipping our state to other places. We're going to run out of state. So 
Recycled aggregate is a, is a very popular idea, but the problems are recycled aggregate can be very, uh, very heavily contaminated, and recycled aggregate is an extraordinarily variable material. You don't know from loader scoop to loader scoop exactly what you've got in there, but, uh, but we managed to get it into the building code, and the big help here is American Society for Testing Materials, ASTM, has a standard document C33 on aggregates, that standard document acknowledged recycled aggregate. We could uh, piggyback uh, on that one. The contractor proposes the use of the recycled aggregate. The uh, uh, licensed design professional and the local building official have to approve it. The building code essentially gives a uh, uh, guidance for what the acceptance program, what sort of data would have to be uh, uh, presented to, uh, to gain uh, acceptance. Uh, essentially, the responsibility is on the user to demonstrate acceptable mechanical properties, durability properties, for the duration of the project, not just on the loader scoop that we sampled this morning. And then lastly, alternative uh, uh, cementing materials. Essentially, there are a wide range of cementing materials beyond mere Portland cement, which is essentially a calcium, silicon, aluminum, iron, and oxygen uh, uh, composite. So these are now into the, uh, uh, the building code. There are compliance requirements for all of our standard cements, plus there are uh, options uh, in the building code for our alternative uh, materials, which include what sort of evidence you have to prepare and how, str how much stronger that evidence is if you can point to its prior use in the same uh, environment. But a beautiful phrase that comes from our current building code commentary is as with all new technologies, a project owner should be informed of the risks and rewards. Now, to bring this back full circle to where uh, uh, Sasha began, the observation uh, that uh, a worker from the 1950s or 1930s would have no problem fitting into a similar construction gang in this current year. And in many other fields, Changes have been spectacular. The author of these words is uh, Adam Neville, uh, one of the most influential of all concrete uh, experts. He wrote the definitive work. He said new materials are being developed and new uses for concrete are being found. An intelligent engineer or architect will be on the lookout for the possibilities. I think that's what we are doing here today. We are on the lookout for possibilities. And Adam Neville said, the time is come to leap forward. Thank you all very much. This is working? Yeah. for the um, very provocative presentations um, and very well crafted, I have to say. Um, I, I definitely want to hear more because there's um, more to each of the presentations, but I'd like to maybe find a thread that, can, um, that all three presentations um, can address. And it's perhaps an area that, um, that we're not addressing today, actually, because um, given the short day, we couldn't fit everything in, but it is a question of um, conservation. And uh, the question of conservation, I think, ties back to issues of like dealing with what we got today of these buildings and structures, infrastructures, um, the actual physicality of the material. Um, but there's also a kind of cultural relationship to these building out of these built structures and so what, how and what do we do or how do we engage these works um, but there's also there's a kind of sense of like a, a kind of collapse both the physical building but also the um, institutions and economies that goes with it and as well as a kind of what kind of culture gets um, lifted or suppressed so if um, any of you like to talk about that all right still mic are we oh, um, well, I, 
Uh, we haven't developed that part of our research, although it will obviously come up. And one of the things to say is that the um, research in conservation labs on concrete is very advanced and, and customarily has the conversations between architects and engineers and material scientists. And those conversations are completely siloed, just like all the other conversations into their... Uh, so it would be a good idea to have that conversation across subdisciplines. Um, I, I have to say, as someone who knows a lot about the history of conservation, that I don't think that it should hold a special um, claim over the fate of the built environment. Conservation as a field, even in, in reinforced concrete, tends to be devoted to the special, to the bespoke. And so there's very many people involved, for example, in figuring out how to restore this very beautiful church de Rancy by Perret in Paris. And it's a worthy cause, but the, the solution they will develop will have to be transformed in order to become applicable. The other thing is that from the perspective of climate change and carbon sequestration, actually, um, you're going to have to say this better than I, but essentially, uh, concrete, if it doesn't fail through carbonation, um, begins to uh, sequester carbon. So, of course, it's better not to have built it in the first place. <laughs> but sometimes destroying it is not the, the better sort of ecological option. Is that yeah. That's so right. technically, moving forward, how does our desire to conserve address our desire to also conserve like the longer time scale dynamics of climate change and, and large scale global challenges? Yeah, I mean, the question of mind health um, conservation, the way that I think of it uh, in terms of the methods of history that we mobilize to talk about concrete, uh, and I think that definitely both of our presentations belong to this sort of genre that it's now gaining quite a bit of traction in history of technology, which is to think about innovation in terms of maintenance, actually, sort of the history of maintenance that comes with innovative processes. Um, so how shocking the old can be, and I think that's kind of like the 100 percent years of, of concrete, um, which um, implies looking less you know, at the single expert designer that has the brilliant idea, and then they start technological processes and technologies like concrete as a technology in use, no? which is constantly being reinvented, but is a maintenance of reinvention. So, because the maintenance, the, the conservation concept draws to this sort of larger theme in architectural history, which is about the monument and the, you know, how do you, um, yeah, conservation theories. But maintenance, history of technology as history of maintenance, I think it's sort of the realm within which we can start discussing concrete again, as, uh, in terms of the single author, expert, and more in terms of the many other forces that, um, that think of technology in use, yeah. That's how I think of it. Yeah, uh, you know, thank you for the question. I was thinking about this emphasis we place on visiting these objects as students, as architects, and um, the pain we feel when they are destroyed. And a lot of concrete uh, modern architecture in India has been destroyed for different reasons, some of it in fires, some of it in other ways. And I think perhaps while we're talking about archiving, we need another way to archive this material, not just um, a kind of physical and tour, tour, the archive, you know, through a tour, but some sort of other way to think about the history of these that isn't necessarily just, you know, make a virtual gallery of it all. I don't, I don't know, it's somewhere there. And I'm just wondering how we can think about um, these buildings and the legacy of them in terms of how we remember them. Um, some way, I don't have an answer, but. In terms of legacy, I, mean, I have a question for you guys about conservation, and that is when you do prototypes, like we don't tend to conserve the history of the prototype. And one thing we haven't touched on in the, the name of the conference from lab to site is the fact that a lot of concrete, the lab is the site. And I mean, to see the chairs first presented at the site and then go back to the lab and they get crushed or the standards, right? The way they get put in places through all these tests, yet we kind of tend to focus on the conservation and the maintenance of the final structures. But how much is that actually related to the initial prototyping and the initial, which we don't necessarily think of as conserved in the same way, yet it has to be so that the knowledge is there, right, going forward, and whether it's in a standard or whether it's in um, presentations. Well, it, it kind of expands the notion of the archive, I would say. I mean, the, the a building code is an 
is an archive of, of procedures and, and standards that have been proven to, to work. Um, and in, this, in that same sense, the laboratory, I think, operates in a, in a similar way. I mean, we're kind of engaged in, uh, in sort of an absurd immediate effort of convert, uh, uh, con conservation because we're just trying to make things work so that they operate over a time span of, of a year or maybe a month or uh, just one experiment. And so to me, the, the, the question of, of time scales is, is also something that um, really unites these three presentations in, in different ways in, within that context of conservation. I was going to say that um, one of the greatest uh, revelations I had was that the thinness implies a time scale. This is what the carbonation equation does. As soon as you know how close the steel is to the atmosphere, that's how mm. little, that's how short the lifespan is. Mm. And I had never before thought such an iconoclastic thought against thinness in concrete, which as you know, you know, thinness is the greatest value. Um, but there's this project in Moscow where uh, it's a, it was a constructivist building, not particularly elevated, but nevertheless very thin, which was conserved by OMA by putting, just encasing it in more concrete. So the thin columns got thicker. And this also worked to protect the steel. I'm not recommending it, but I'm just saying that it's, it's indicative of the fact that form uh, carries lifespan, mm -hmm. carries lifespan limitations, and which also happened with your chairs. I thought about that with your chairs, which got thicker and <laughs> chunkier. Well, again, it, also, it also points to how efficiency is not necessary. Inefficiency is sometimes very helpful. That's right. Inefficiency lasts longer than efficiency. Yeah. 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 <laughs> But I think that one aspect of, um, of the maintenance question or the conservation question that it's kind of like think of, of the opposite of it, which is the failure of the concrete, because you're saying, you know, you have the codes that um, sort of secure some sort of conservation of the structures and provide risk for the public, but they come through multiple moments of failure, like the ones that you chose and the ones that run through all our presentations. Now the shells need to fall before they can just stand. Very interested to hear that essentially what you're describing is a legacy of code, code innovations which get filtered into further codes and that innovation there happens essentially through inheritance. It's not at all a break with the past. That new codes, that let's say new codes um, are able to bring in innovative techniques by borrowing from older codes. That's right. Yeah, that's a, it makes you want to develop strategies for dropping in little pieces of innovative code so that it can then, there you yeah. Know. yeah. There you go. In fact, uh, a line of thought that uh, actually developed as a result of preparing for this meeting and looking back on uh, how we were successful in getting new things into the ACI code, uh, it really caused me to recognize the, the need for organization with within the community that is dealing with that innovation. The organization among the aficionados of, uh, of new concrete and, and placing methods, because that has always preceded the adoption. The, uh, the building code people never thought up what's the best way to place concrete. The building code committees never thought up what's the best way to consolidate or cure or the recommendations for mixed design. It is consensus of the, uh, the users and the promoters of the innovation who then demonstrated that and then the, the building code said, yes, this uh, looks like you guys have, have got this solved. So, so it looks to me, and I may be wrong, but right now in some of the topics that we're talking about, we're still in this very, very heady, very exciting kind of wild west or, or wild east of, uh, of new ideas and innovations with, without bound and this is the way it needs to be, but at some point we need to think about how do we start focusing this into something that we can all agree with that these are the fundamental principles of the way to do things if we really do want to promote this and so that the public can have confidence in our structures. I, I do believe um, that the um, ACI actually has a committee on uh, yes, 3D ACI printing. Yes, ACI just recently started on a uh, committee on 3D printing. That's uh, that on some certainly... some materials. So that's, that's definitely a that's start a, for a key piece of the certain puzzle. kinds of innovation. Um, is there an American Concrete 3D Printing Association? An American? Um, concrete 3D Printing Association. There's an American Concrete Association as a, as a kind of uh, I, organization. Maybe there is, but I, I'm not aware of that. 
Okay. Is there a 3D printing society? Sasha hanging out with his friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically. But you know, all these things start with hanging out with friends and colleagues and uh, folks that think differently than you do, and that, that generates uh, new ideas. That, that makes this an important conference. Yeah. Can I just add to this question of organization? Um, I'm, I'm thinking about like organization in order to keep producing innovation as the, new, as the normal. No? The normal is to keep innovating. Um, but with innovation comes failures, and that implies the risks that also run, I think, through all of the presentation. Now, what are the risks? And, and, and the question being, who, who's, um, who's supporting those risks? You know, whether the risks are physical in the case of debt laborers or economic in the case of the sort of construction companies going bankrupt. Like within these new organizations that are being put together with incredible minds to think forward, the risk is going to still operate somewhere or on to somebody. So I guess that the question of, you know, in our case, in my case, is the worker, the laborer, but who's incurring that risk? That risk is it economic, I assume, and are these institutions, these organizations um, carrying the risk financially, perhaps, or otherwise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I find it interesting that a lot of, um, especially seeing your work, Sasha, and all the failures and testing, and a lot of people here also in terms of the fabrication work is um, trying to figure out R&D, um, doing a lot of the prototyping, testing, um, and finding limits, understanding the parameters. So in, in a sense, who carries the risk more than just the engineers, but now maybe also other disciplines are taking on some of that risk and um, establishing standards and data for um, further research. But I think that might be a, a, new, a way to like um, lead into my next question, which actually has to do with the framing and the kind of the production of knowledge. Because mm -hmm. um, as we can see, there's definitely um, certain certain themes that keeps popping up as kind of in our consciousness now. And I'm, I'd like to maybe ask, like, what might be some areas that you're thinking that um, actually, based on this kind of sliding scale, um, where, where some of the gaps might, might need yeah. to be addressed? Well, a lot of this started for me um, because I, maybe I didn't clarify that I'm actually not at all a concrete researcher. I do thermodynamics. Um, was with my colleague who is a concrete researcher and she does alkali activated cements and these are cements that don't have the huge amount of CO2 emitted when you create them and so there's a lot of really interesting knowledge in that domain and that's what we kind of refer to in some of these like she's way down in literally neutron beam scattering machines looking at like how the atoms form in there so that they know how they crack and this comes back to sort of the knowledge that Ken's talking about in terms of standards because one of her biggest challenges and our challenges and when we really want to innovate and make it so that I could ubiquitously deploy that type of concrete in this floor in this building yeah. so that it doesn't fall down and it keeps us all safe, it's a huge task. And it requires a huge amount of research to provide the precedent that comes before all those standards get created. Um, and I think understanding how that knowledge navigates and actually come, come, brings us back to the risk question, in fact, right? How do we decide the risk appetite we have, because I would argue in some cases she's faced with challenges where it's a little bit unfair, the, the expectation that you should be able to test a concrete that you've only developed in the last 10 years against concrete that has 100 years of empirical testing and evidence. Yeah. And then there's sort of an expectation that you should be able to prove your stuff is as good as this stuff that has 100 years of data when you've only had 10 years to experiment yeah. with it. Same could be said for, for 3D printing. How do you you know, look at what happens in 10 years of layers that might delaminate, because you don't know, you don't have the time, and it's really difficult to understand how yeah. knowledge of, it can be done with, there's an accelerating testing can't always be the solution. Right, yeah. and, and the, this goes back to the difference between operating a lab and on a site. The ubiquity of concrete actually sometimes works against the development of a consensus, precisely because the concrete paste might be a solution for a certain type of concrete which might be, get authorized for that, but not for its ubiquitous use. Um, in other uh, places. So that's a time scale that's pretty practical for this colleague. She cannot get tests made because no one, um, because she does not have pre existing, it would take her 40 years, you know, her career would be over <laughs> um, to, to make sure that that paste has, a, has the level of safety. This is very interesting, and I'm thinking that she perhaps needs to be a modernist again. 
because <laughs> I was thinking about the production of trust, no? How do we project that, that trust? And I'm thinking about your experts. They're saying, trust me, I'm the expert. I don't need 100 years or 150. These thin shells or these dams are going to save the nation. They did it rhetorically. They did it by their own embodiment, this efficiency. You know, they invented this idea of efficiency and expertise in ways that you know, were mobilized and they were trusted. So there are these mechanisms that the, 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 these organizations have been able to you know, produce to um, make up you know, for the lack of, of, of technical, perhaps, trust of, or otherwise. I, mean, I think the material science, this is why we included the history of material science. Material science is, a, on the one hand, highly multidisciplinary hmm. endeavor. On the other hand, has the effect of sequestering effect. Right. Um, innovation, expertise into very you know, instrumentally specific, yeah. scientifically specific, and thus subject to industry bullying. Acceptance, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So as we said, it gets removed a little bit from architecture writ large and buildings and yeah, it's funny that you call her. You should meet her. No, I, I haven't. I think that she, if oh, she yeah. became a more a, a sort of. Um, yeah. um, you know, self-secured modernist, she might be able yeah. to come up with this. Yeah. Which, again, what I find interesting in putting all of this talk together is to identify that these mechanisms, the efficiency, the discourse, um, came at a cost of hiding other things. In our case, in particular, you know, the labor that just, you know, the, the fact that we don't talk about them, that they're not in the archives, even though they're in the photographs, and perhaps the fact that they continue to stay in the same stage, it's because they were hidden by design through these um, categories uh, of description of concrete. As, as you pointed out, they, uh, these, these procedures, they also come at a the, at the different type of cost, at, at the environmental cost, which then in turn might change uh, our precedents to begin with. I mean, precedents are deeply important uh, for us to generate that knowledge, but as you guys have demonstrated, uh, precedents will change because our, envir our environmental conditions will change at an ever accelerating speed. So we are trying to catch up with precedents, even if you were to build something now that uh, manages to withstand environmental issues or hazards today, th those will likely look different tomorrow. Yeah, what I was going to say is that um, the we um, of the we in the Anthropocene is changing. So one of the ways in which uh, anthropocentrologists like us to think is that the risk is now spread across humanity and therefore this kind of tends to erase some of the barriers to um, acting on environmental risk. Um, but in fact, it uh, shouldn't, so what we should do is choose the proper uh, precedents that are pertinent to certain we's. So the sign that you made, which I do want a copy of, yeah, totally. uh, would, be per would be pertinent to certain we's. And basically, you made a sign for a passerby. You made a sign for like an urban dweller in this city or city in the West. And that's not the same sign that you would make for somebody else who's maybe building their own home in their backyard or uh, you know, using concrete. Um, and I, I just want to put out there that that's perfectly within the thinking of the Anthropocene. Just because risk is, is spread globally across all humanity and creatures and buildings doesn't mean that one can not therefore make choices and apportion, you know, what is the proper precedent for this, um, yeah. It's for really this where we depend on the knowledge that you're making by doing new tests and pushing new things out there. But we have to get the standards maybe faster. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> for some of these things like, Alternative cementious materials. Well, I, in, in terms of speed, I, I think a lot of folks would automatically believe that it's the code writing and approving bodies that are the slow ones. That that was not the case in these yeah. in these uh, most recent three examples. It was uh, getting enough information to demonstrate that uh, yes, we 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 can reliably. Uh, do this. So there, there is a maturation time that is required just for the development of the, of the technology. But on, on the issue of risk, one of the things that's interesting is the, uh, the, these new code provisions, I think they undeniably put more risk back on the building designer and on the local building official. Yeah. They're saying, okay, you, you can do this, but you have to develop the testing program, you have to do the quality assurance program. And uh, there may be some designers, and there certainly will be some contractors who will say, look, we, 
we're not, we don't want to buy into this, so we're not going to use the recycled aggregates. We're not going to use the alternative cement. Yeah. So I'd like to maybe open up uh, yeah. the uh, questions for the audience. Yeah, um, exactly. We have a throw mic that I can uh, pass along. Any questions for the panel? Oh, wow, it's a patch. Oh. Look at that. That is fun. It's so weird. You can't hand it. It looks like it's... <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for the engaging presentation so far. It's been a great symposium, beginning from Mr. Barry yesterday to Ken's uh, very strong finish. Uh, my question is, uh, I, have, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, I'm curious if all of you, the panel have, if you guys have noticed a sen sort of sensitivity towards using fresh water. I know if the pH of the water is a certain amount in its purity, uh, the concrete strength is, it changes. So I'm curious if you've noticed in certain projects maybe perhaps you wouldn't need a certain strength of concrete if the industry has a sensitivity in using perhaps not the purest and cleanest water out there. And then my second question is perhaps mostly towards Forrest and Lucia and maybe Ken, um, how did galvanization uh, affect any of your research and how does it uh, help with the quality of concrete? Mm -hmm. um, well, to the first question about the purity of water, I'll just give an anecdote because, again, I'm not an expert and I would argue that probably there's some empirical evidence where people tested different water qualities. But historically, we found, and it's interesting, that they used salt water in concrete at one point because they thought it would help with the process when in fact later we very clearly understand that the salts make the rust happen very, very quickly. So uh, it's a big oops on some things. Um, so you learn, it's a good, just an example. My answer would be em empirical evidence is largely where a lot of these things are found. Um, and then leaping forward now to the actual material science as we sort of discussed, so there probably is some also analytical analysis of how the interactions happen in the cement paste and with what pollutants, what other variations of the cash. I love that the substance is not a chemical compound, we just call it cash. Um, and the, the, the ability to mitigate that oxidation through galvanized steel, people use uh, stainless steel if they really want to prevent rust in their, in their structures. Or even, I mean, completely alternative systems with post-tensioning and using alternative materials. There's a lot of pathways of innovation that avoid the rebar problem, which we didn't address in this talk. Um, and going forward, I think even you can even electrify bridges, right? Cathodic protection is another way to passivate oxidation by running electricity through it. So there's a lot of innovation that's available to address this. I think what we're trying to say is we should be thinking about it um, in this broader uh, uh, context of we're all siloed in our, uh, kind, somewhat siloed in our, the material scientist, my friend Claire White, I should say her name at some point, yeah, yeah. Claire White is in the lab making little vials of cement paste, right? And it's actually really hard to have this conversation with her about, to help her help teach me about whether carbonation matters and, and the fact that still 99.9% .9 of concrete is just standard rebar put into the concrete. And so how do we break out of the innovation in the, like very much in the lab and then kind of bring about a little bit of change, more in mentality maybe than necessarily um, in, some, in many cases than just in, in technical innovation. I mean, in the very specific case, the way you phrased it was, wouldn't pure water make stronger concrete? Um, and the answer is, I mean, I don't know, but in the case of Claire, she's working on denser paste, which makes for less water and stronger concrete. And although she's working on strength that also mitigates the carbonation we're talking about because remember the carbonation comes from the water that's anyways in concrete. It's not the water that's coming out there. If there's salt coming in, that makes it worse. Um, so literally the assumption that you made, which is that strength is a good thing and it comes from, you know, that it comes at the moment that the water's put in, that's one of the things one would have to work kind of against to mitigate, to mm. make slightly more subtle. And coming from me, who is definitely, just to be clear, not a concrete engineer at all. Uh, in, in regards to the, the water, that standard specifications up until recently always said the water you use to, for concrete has to be potable. They could have said drinkable, but they said potable. But 
Recent changes have uh, actually permitted uh, a variety of, uh, of gray water sources to be used in making concrete and given, uh, given provisions for uh, uh, the conditions under which you can do that and what the chemical composition would be of that non-drinkable uh, water. A couple of the comments that were just made here re reminded me that there is an underlying economic reality to concrete construction which is absolutely the elephant in the room, and here's the best way I can explain it. A few years ago in the springtime, snow was receding, the glaciers were receding in Ithaca, so I went down to the Lowe's Garden Store, and I saw that they were getting everybody excited about getting back into the garden. And I saw about 50 pound bags of mix it up yourself concrete, 50 pounds of concrete, $2.89. I then walked on, and I saw 50 pound bags of horse manure for fertilizing your garden, $5.89. I then realized why we don't build bridges, highways, and buildings out of horse manure. We can't afford it. <laughs> We, we are looking at a material in bulk, which is about two and a half cents a pound. Go to Disneyland, fudge is $14 a pound. That we are operating on the basis of the cheapest material that we have found that will work. And our current state of the infrastructure has demonstrated that we cannot afford to fix it with the cheapest stuff that we've got. So as we think about uh, more interesting long-term life cycle pricing of a material which will have a higher first cost, we got to think about where, where that money is going to come from and who has to wake up and say we got to spend more when we build the bridge the first time. Yeah. 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 Is there another question? Thank I think you we for have the time for one more. <clears throat> Talks. Uh, I was wondering if um, concrete codes and standards have been hacked um, in any way. Um, and I'm kind of thinking of IKEA hacking and how early on the corporation tried to clamp down on that because of, I guess, copyright infringement. And then they realized I was foolish. And now they're supporting it. If you anticipate that happening in, in this industrial field or, um, or if it's already happened, uh, other question about this is a history of a specific technology, concrete. I wonder if there's anything to be said about brutalism. So I guess two questions. Brutalism. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear the question. About, what's the question about? So the hacking, hacking of the codes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, oh, hacking the codes. Right. Like, yeah. And brutalism. Well, to to maybe to maybe speak about that. I think it, it's something that that happens. I don't know if it. Well, hacking is perhaps one way to describe it. You see some of these uh, 3D printed buildings that uh, only work as hybrid constructions. I think that's a, one could describe that as a way of, of hacking the code or somehow uh, interacting with the code that makes, makes it easier to get something implemented in an early stage. Um, so so perhaps, that, perhaps that happens. I'm not sure if it happens at, at the actual code writing level. Um, I mean, I, you want to hear about brutalism? I'll just say about hacking. The codes were unique to concrete. Codes were made by hacking, whereas many other materials like right. steel is you can empirically do deflection models of I beams and every beam and know exactly how it bends analytically. Concrete, all the codes originated for the majority of its existence out of empirical testing and formulations and water ratios, right? Yeah, no, but but I mean the industry plays a huge role. There's been concrete monopolies in the yeah. you know early 20th century each. Uh, the reason we recognize these companies' names is because they conspired to have their patent uh, system, which came out of this experimental milieu, turned into basically monopolies. So yeah. we should also not sort of fetishize the... But I grew up on a farm in Iowa, and I saw farmers throwing all kinds of weird crap into concrete just to, like, make up space. So, I mean, that's also IKEA hacking, maybe, yeah. on the farm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so about brutalism, I don't... Um, not a historian of brutalism, but there are people who are now correlating the supposed end of brutalism due to its ugliness to other things such as the energy regime change. So Lukas Stanek has a nice paper on the end of brutalism. I don't know if he ever said it publicly in a paper, but I once had a conversation with him when he said, you know, I think that they stopped building brutalist buildings in the Middle East basically because the energy crisis produced that, uh, which is a nice way to write against the 
the fantasy that brutalism is, you have to either be for it or against it, that it's a purely um, you know, fetish-driven uh, paradigm, et cetera. Can I add something not to the brutalist but to the code hacking? I think it's important to understand, or for me at least, um, when I understood that the emergence of codes sort of came after or alongside the emergence of labor rights. So in many uh, ways, you know, the codes is a way, again, to divert the costs because, of course, the material is very, uh, very cheap, but the labor can be very expensive or not depending on the level of labor rights that you have. Like, the, 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 literally the amount of workers that die on, on the site. Um, so to understand that as much as you're invested in code, you're also invested in um, sort of appending the dynamics on the site and, and the, the rights of workers, uh, I find that both go together. Um, so when you're hacking the code, you must be doing something also to the, um, to the social cost of, of concrete. So just to keep that, I think, in mind. It's critical to the invention, I think, yeah. I was wondering how hacking is defined in this context. Like, is it uh, abiding by the letter but not the spirit? Is, is that what hacking is, yeah. right? Because uh, then the question is that, yeah, how can you stay within the codes? But do, I, I think that that's what you mean. I'm just thinking about how, yeah, concrete is a material that because it's so connected to our um, bodies, you know, the thumb rule by which we make concrete, yeah. we're just constantly it's much more used on site than in the kind of more technical ways. I think really the question is how do we democratize maintenance? Like how do we take this knowledge and really make it something that everyone has because you maintain it in an everyday level. Like how do we, I don't know, that's, yeah. More than the academia or research. Yeah. So with that question, I think maybe we can um, continue with the next series of talks. Um, I want to Thank you, everyone, in this panel for a provocative presentations. So join me to thank them for the talk. to um, invite Jerry Lynch, um, Chair of um, the College of Environmental and Environmental Engin no, College of Civil and Environmental Engineering to um, introduce our keynote for the new lecture. All right, so as Tian said, I'm Jerry Lynch. I'm the Department Chair of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at the University of Michigan. And I wanted to first, before introducing our distinguished speaker, I wanted to first say thank you to Dean Massey, Tien, and Wes for having this opportunity to be part of such a wonderful event. It's been incredible seeing all the talks this morning, so thank you uh, for inviting us. So it's a great honor to introduce our uh, keynote speaker this morning, Professor Sarah Billington. Professor Billington is a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University and a senior fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment at Stanford. Professor Billington received her bachelor's degree in civil engineering as well as operations research with high honors from Princeton University. She was also awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to study at ETH Zurich from 1990 to 91. Shortly thereafter, she continued on for her graduate studies at UT Austin receiving both a master's and a PhD degree in structural engineering. She also has an extensive record of work with industry, having had brief periods of work with Skidmore Owen and Merrill, ElectroWatt, as well as Greener Engineering, which is now part of AECOM. Professor Billington began her academic career first as an assistant professor of structural engineering in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Cornell University, where she was on the faculty from 1997 to 2002. She then joined the faculty at Stanford University in 2003, and that was the first time I met her, actually, when I was still a graduate student at Stanford. She has twice been a visiting faculty member in civil engineering at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, first in 1998 and then later in 2008, as well as 2009. She has an extinguished record, having received a number of awards and honors over her long career, uh, including paper awards from ACI, 
as well as being recognized by the National Science Foundation with an Early Career Award, which is one of the highest awards given to a young academic uh, in the sciences and engineering areas. Her past research has focused on sustainable, durable construction materials, including ductile cement-based composites, as well as bio-based composite systems that have a closed-loop life cycle. I'm also excited to see her talk today because I believe it's on some of her newer research areas uh, that are equally pioneering as her past work. And her new areas of research are in how built spaces, both the physical and the digital environment, impact and can sustain human health and well-being. So join me in welcoming Professor Billington for this morning's keynote. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Jerry, and thank you for inviting me um, and being willing to let me talk about something that's been really exciting me um, more these past couple of years. Um, I, as uh, Jerry mentioned, I've been doing research on, um, let me just advance that, oh, that's me. Oh, is this? Okay, that's the, I don't know what the other is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, um, yeah, my past research has been on pre-stress and reinforced concrete and ductile concretes. Um, I've been to Michigan many times collaborating with Victor Lee and Jim White. Um, and then I got into bio-based composites, but more recently I've been really interested in how all of these materials are impacting our health and well-being. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So my co-speaker is not here, unfortunately, but he is James Landay, and he is a professor of computer science um, at Stanford. And so the motivation for our project, we're leading a large interdisciplinary project um, on this topic, and the motivation is that people are, or many Americans, are overstressed, overweight, tend to be wasteful, unhappy, and many feel isolated, either at work or at school. And we spend much of our time with these afflictions indoors, inside the built environment, 87% of our time, according to the EPA. So imagine the worst room you've ever spent time in. How did it make you feel? So for me, it was a couple years ago, and I was in the faculty pub on campus at Stanford, and it's this enclosed room with cinder block walls. They've actually since renovated it. But it was cinder block walls, no natural light, dingy, gray, beige. Um, it was really oppressive. And actually, the experience of leaving a, a meeting that I had spent two hours in there was what inspired me to start going into a new direction of research. Um, my colleague James, it was his grad student office. <laughs> Pretty common experience. He almost dropped out. Now he knows why. Um, but maybe you haven't had that experience of being in a horrible space. Um, so imagine this is Kate, um, and she's in her office here. Can we do that again where it's not quite so loud? Okay, thanks. <laughs> it's not usually that bad. Okay, so Kate is in her office. It's noisy, a lot of artificial light, um, a lot of artificial furniture. It's hard to get work done in here and feel good. And these, um, <clears throat> these building attributes and building features um, impact her psychologically um, and emotionally and physically. She might experience stress, anxiety, distraction, and this actually impacts the organization in terms of its finances and how people might be using or wasting resources, as well as it can really change the cultural norms of the company. Um, and it doesn't really stop there, because if the organizations are being impacted this way, it is going to affect society, our, our economy, um, our environment, and the public health and well-being. I think this audience probably can believe that building features could have this big an effect. Some audiences don't. But just to give a concrete example um, of, of that the building features can really affect society, I'd want to give one example here of absenteeism. Um, so it costs U.S. companies about um, $226 billion a year. It's a big problem. So most of this is likely due to long hours or a lousy boss or low pay. <laughs> um, but there is one study, um, for example, that has shown that a lack of nature, so offices like Kate's, actually um, accounted for about 10% of the absenteeism in that office. And if this were true in general, that would be $23 billion in the U.S. economy. And even if it was just a couple percent, it would still be several billion dollars. 
Um, so it uh, could have a pretty big impact. So the framework for our research is that building features not only have individual impacts, but also organizational and societal outcomes. Um, so we've been inspired by this quote, which has been used a lot, um, and it's a little bit out of context, but Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings, and thereafter they shape us. And what we really like is the they shape us part, um, because they do, buildings shape us. And so our thought is, well, what can we do? How can we make buildings shape us in positive ways that keep improving over time, um, that really last and adhere? Um, so we have uh, some ambitious CS undergrads that created a video for us um, to kind of imagine the workplace of the future. I hope this one's the right volume, and I want to just share that it's brief um, with you here. This is a couple years ago, just a concept video. Imagine an office in the future where a digital display reflecting worker activity can inspire them to um, get more exercise. Where they might take the uh, stairs instead of the elevator and thereby save on building energy. Or imagine that we could personalize temperature for different individuals so some aren't too cold and some aren't too hot or where we could actively cancel noise so that an open office floor plan wouldn't be so distracting to work in. Or where the building could infer the stress of a worker and sensing their stress, adapt um, scenery, maybe to provide natural scenery, play some music, lower the lights in maybe a non-creepy way. <laughs> Or imagine digital art built into the walls that could encourage people to meet other people they haven't met before. And to perhaps even lead them outside to take a break. It's a quick acknowledgement. So how would we get to this future? Um, well, first, there is a lot that we do know about having um, buildings that might support well-being. So we do know things like greenery and living walls improve mood, they lower blood pressure, they can decrease hospital stays, um, increase mental engagement. We know that daylighting, uh, natural lighting, can lead to uh, better concentration and increased productivity. And we also know that social engagement and inclusion can reduce stress. But there's actually very little information on how a built environment might impact that belonging, that inclusion. Um, so at the outset of trying to propose this project, actually, we did an online survey. This was exciting coming from Concrete Research because we got all this data in one hour. <laughs> did not have to wait 28 days to test anything. <laughs> so there were over 300 participants, half men and half women. It was with the Mechanical Turk um, online survey that we did. And we asked them to imagine that they're starting a new job, and we showed them a series of pictures. And um, all, the main variables were natural materials, natural light, and diverse representations. And then we asked them about their belonging, their self-efficacy, and their environmental efficacy using sort of known instruments from psychology. And across the board, um, with one exception, their sense of belonging, their self-efficacy, and their environmental efficacy increased statistically significantly um, when there was natural, when they thought they were going to be somewhere with natural materials, natural light, and diverse representations. And this was particularly interesting with the um, belonging and the diverse representations for women and people of color, as we know from um, business studies that um, a lot of Profit or uh, businesses have increased profits when they have more gender and racial diversity in their workforce. Um, so we knew. So we know that also just across the board with all of these things that we're onto something, and we're not the only ones. Um, of course, there is this nascent sort of well-building movement that everyone here is probably familiar with, and lots of things coming out like checklists, a little bit like lead. Um, and why is it so popular? Well, I've made the economic argument before, but another one is just to say that a company putting a lot of money into a building, um, actually, when you think about how much money is going into the building, 90% is actually going into the salaries. 
um, just 1% maybe into energy. So if you can tweak something by 10%, you'd really want to tweak that the productivity or the, um, the wellness of your, your employees. Um, so that's um, why this is uh, gaining, I think, more imp um, imp er, attention. But the issue is that the research behind it is pretty piecemeal and not very um, thorough. So the, the studies are generally like um, they're short term, they're limited populations, just like one, diverse, one gender, one ethnicity. Um, they're like before, after, and a lot of self-report. Um, and so what we really need to do is fill in the missing pieces of this puzzle and take a more integrated approach to how the built environment is affecting our well-being. So how can we do this? Um, we're inspired by another quote, uh, so which is, when you cannot measure it, you have scarcely advanced to the stage of science by Lord Kelvin. And so the point is you need to measure it. Um, so that's what we're focusing on first. And so our project is really um, trying to establish the science of what building features impact what occupant states um, in naturalistic settings and over the long term. Uh, but we do have to start in the lab, so it's also sort of a lab to site thing. Um, we really need to understand acceptance constraints, what people are gonna be willing to accept in terms of um, what we're inferring about them, and then design adaptations that could support the well-being over the long term and make sure that it really adheres. Um, so along with those um, goals, or those uh, three things that we're doing, we have research questions for each one, and I wanna start with just the first two. So again, how do building attributes um, impact occupant states in naturalistic settings over longer periods of time? And then how can we use AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, for example, to detect occupant states in a privacy-securing manner? Um, and, um, and then I'll get to the interventions later. But so what we're doing, basically, is running experiments um, where we're gonna systematic, where we are systematically varying things like the views to nature, diverse symbols, um, and temperature and airflow variability. Um, also things like access to greenery, indoors, um, or water features. A lot of things from the biophilic design uh, movement, I guess you could say. Um, and when varying these features in our experiments, um, we are trying to measure well-being. And there are a lot of definitions for well-being. What we're focusing on is not um, sort of one standard one, but we're focusing on stress, belonging, creativity, physical activity, and environmental behavior. And I'd say that stress and physical activity have been studied pretty well, uh, but not so much on belonging, creativity, and environmental behavior. This would be the building's impact. Um, and so the way we're doing this is starting with, we are gonna do self-report, but we're moving sort of beyond the simple surveys, and we're using something called experience sampling methods. Um, where you sort of ping somebody during the day periodically and just ask a quick question or two um, to get the, to get that self-report. And then we're going to take advantage of all of the building sensors that we have in our buildings, especially in smart buildings, so like occupancy sensors or energy or recycling, and make use of that data. And then much of our data will come from leveraging the personal devices that we all have, so watches, phones, laptops. Um, and together with those three, we can then triangulate in on what building features might be causing which outcomes. Um, because the self-report alone, we have seen, for example, that, it, that people might report that they're calm looking at real nature versus a screen that shows nature, but actually when you measure their electrodermal activity, they're quite agitated by the screen compared to the real. So that's why we need to have these three different pieces um, to try to infer what's going on. And so let me give you a couple examples, or three examples actually. Um, and so one would be here, like if we wanted to, oh this is Kate, she's in her new office now. Um, and so we want to check on her like environmental behavior and for that from various sensors. So we could use the building data of energy and recycling. We can use um, her smartwatch to detect if she's using stairs versus elevator. Um, and then we can periodically ask her um, things about her environmental efficacy. And she's or environmental attitudes or connection to nature. Um, so that's one example. Another um, would be belonging. So for example, we could use the occupancy sensors to sense how much social interaction she's having. Um, my colleagues in computer science have experience using mobile phones to detect affect in speech, but in a privacy-conserving manner, so it's non-conversational. Uh, but you can tell from the affect um, if they're having positive social interactions or not. Um, and then again, asking basically the self-report on belonging. Um, another way to find out a little bit about social interaction, just to give you some of the technologies behind this, most of these technologies are off the shelf. 
um, and they might, computer scientists tell me, they have to maybe write some new algorithms and things, but it's mostly off the shelf. But there is some new research that's going on too, um, and one of my colleagues, Rishi Jain, um, in my department, and his grad student, Andrew Santa, have, they've um, used the plug loads. I didn't actually realize that the plug load is variable. <laughs> on my charger, but it, it varies depending on how much activity you are doing on your laptop. And so they can track that and see when people are active versus on break. And they've done this in an office in San Francisco um, and also at a place in uh, one of Stanford's um, hubs. And so you can kind of see where the activity is happening. And this could be useful for like building energy. So if if there's certain people that are working at certain times of day, you might want to actually clump them in certain areas so you, your zone management can be a little bit more energy efficient. But they're also um, developing network models to try to understand when people are on break and who might be interacting with whom. Um, again, to sort of, that, and we might be able to use that for belonging, but we're just starting to talk to them about that. And then the last example would be something like stress, where this is kind of similar, so occupancy to see how much social interest social interaction they're having. Again, the affect from mobile and the, the self-report. But the other interesting one here would be laptop or mouse usage. You can actually get a sense of people's stress based on how they're using the trackpad. Um, and this is the data from that. And this is from Pablo Paredes, a colleague of mine in um, the School of Medicine now. And this is a little bit more of a dense slide, so let me just explain. He did an experiment where people were either like showed a calm video or they were stressed out by making them do math, which most people get stressed out by. <laughs> um, so the, the two people that didn't get stressed at all by the math, their data was actually thrown out. So, but they, <laughs> they, um, uh, but so the point of this is on the, the, the graph on the left, so the self-reported stress, the idea is if they were shown the relaxing thing, they self-reported being relaxed. If they were stressed by math, they self-reported the math. And then they were asked to, after being shown, you know, after being sort of conditioned that way, they were asked to do things on the trackpad, like a point and click or steer something or drag and drop. And um, so that was that the T stressed and T relaxed. Again, while they were doing that activity or after that activity, after having seen a calm video, they report relaxed. So the point on the left is just that um, the conditioning worked um, and maintained that some were calm and some were relaxed. And then so the kind of finding is what's on the right, um, and I probably would have plotted it differently, but this actually is statistically significant. Um, there was a 5% difference in the average area of pressure of the finger on the trackpad when they were stressed versus when they were relaxed. So there would be a way to figure out or to infer that somebody is more stressed based on how, the, how they're using their trackpad and the D number is the Cohen's effect, which is reasonable. So um, yeah, so that's another just example. Now all of this data is pretty personal and sensitive, um, and workers might not like this, and I'll show you later that we're pretty sure they're not going to like a lot of this. Um, so as we're doing this research, we're not just going to say that everything will be private and secure, but it's actually a big part of our research agenda. Um, and so we have experts from the law school who are privacy experts working on the project with us. And so we're using mixed method assessments, so you know, finding out what people think about this, and then also um, asking them like, how might they want to um, communicate their privacy preferences to the building or within the building um, to try to get that kind of information. So these are both technical and non-technical approaches too. And then all studies would be opt-in. Um, no one has to do the study if we're doing it in an office space. It's opt-in, and they would have the option of deleting any data they want. Having a really bad day, they can go in and delete their data, um, and we won't see any of it. Of course, it's all anonymized, too. Um, and then security, we have um, CS people that are um, uh, security experts. And, and uh, as researchers, no one sees the data unless it's a need-to-know basis. Um, and again, it is all anonymized and through the IRB. Um, but it is a research agenda for us. So um, where are we now? And then at the end, I'll get to the interventions. But um, what we're doing is controlled lab study, where we have two rooms, and we're systematically varying some of these variables. And we have, we're going to have over 400 participants. We're at about two-thirds of the way through. So now I'm back to something that's even worse than concrete research, because it takes a lot longer than 28 days <laughs> to get this data. Um, but it's, uh, and we're not really allowed to look at it, so I can't tell you too much about it um, yet, because you're not allowed to look at it, or at least not test, check the hypotheses until it's over. Um, so we're working on that. And we're designing field studies, working with different companies. Um, again, sort of going from lab to site. And then we were doing some more of these online studies, and that's what I want to just show. Um, and they are called um, in the wild studies. And we're doing these to sort of generate new hypotheses. And um, 
So the goal here is to um, collect sort of naturalistic data. So we, instead of like t uh, getting people online to say, okay, imagine you're working in this space, we're just saying, okay, where are you working? What does your space look like? And then we ask them to do certain tasks. So this is, again, the sort of in the wild thing. So we're trying to observe links between everyday built environments and their well-being um, on kind of a broader scale. So it's from all around the world. Um, oh, wait, actually, I think we no, maybe we were just doing this in the US so far. Um, so we ask people to report on and take photos of their current workspace and then complete these self-assessments. So far, we have 71 people. It could be um, a lot more, because again, you can get this data pretty quickly. But we're going kind of slowly just to see what we're finding, because you'd have to pay them um, for the survey. And at first, almost everybody was working from home. And so that wasn't quite what we wanted. So now we've sort of um, made it, if they say they're home, we just kick them out and pay them a little bit, and <laughs> they don't take the rest of the survey. Um, but so this data has about 20 people that were home and the rest that were um, in an office space. And these were what the office spaces look like, um, or just examples of them. Um, so they were in libraries, cafes, other corporate locations and things, which is kind of interesting that they're taking the survey then um, at work. But um, so considering our lab study variables, um, of natural light, natural materials, and diverse representation. So like we asked them about that in their spaces. We have found um, some confirmation of our hypotheses, which is really pretty exciting. So people with natural light um, in their space showed um, higher levels of creativity, both divergent and convergent, um, and lower stress that we would expect, but the creativity was um, exciting to see that that's happening even in this small data set, and also higher convergent creativity when they have natural materials more around them. And then the diverse representations, again, sort of supporting the first original study, they do have a higher feeling of belongingness um, in, in their environment. Um, and then we also are using this data to sort of generate new hypotheses. So, um, and some of this stuff isn't so new, like a lot of people have studied air quality, temperature, and all of these things. But again, kind of around belonging, creativity, um, a little bit of pro-environmental activity or um, awareness, we have um, not seen as much data out there. So um, we're seeing these kinds of trends, um, you know, that air quality and, and quiet can help with belonging, temperature can actually help with creativity, increase creativity. So these are kind of interesting things that we might then be able to use um, when we're done with our controlled lab study, where we have two rooms. Um, we can try to test out some of these um, hypotheses as well. And now, about the privacy and security part, um, this was, I guess, not surprising, um, but it sort of shows how important it is that all of our studies are going to be opt-in. So not being monitored at work um, was somewhat or very important to 75% of the, of the respondents. Um, and 64% said they would be very concerned or somewhat concerned if someone has access to this passively sensed data, um, as would we, um, too. And uh, so we're now set planning um, a set of studies that will directly engage with these issues. Um, another thing is, is that the idea is that you would have this sort of inference platform that would um, help support well-being, which kind of change the role of a building manager. Um, so that they could, instead of being like, no, you're not allowed to eat over there, they're like, oh, well, people want to eat over there? Let's figure out how to make that work, because that's going to be supporting them, you know, their well-being. So it's sort of a different take on building management. Um, but again, like, you, we, we wouldn't want it to be like the employers are trying to figure out what people are doing and, you know, get mad at them or something. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's a, a lot of sensitivity. But again, another thing is that we would really hope that we could infer things without too much per personal data. So that's kind of the idea of the triangulation and using machine learning so that we don't have to actually use all that personal data, um, but we could still kind of infer things about their well-being. And that's really the work of the computer scientists. So the last thing, then, is the design adaptations to support well-being. Um, so once we know what works and what really helps, um, we can begin to design these adaptations. And so on the to support their well-being, again, try not to be creepy about it. Um, and you don't want the lights to dim and be like, oh, boy, Bob is pretty stressed or something, you know, in, a, in an office environment. So um, on the digital side, there have been um, things like this, and like was in the concept video, but you could imagine, for instance, um, maybe the petals on this digital display, large public ambient displays, or they could be displays on your phones or watches um, that would represent something. So like the petals here, the colors could represent the energy usage of a working group in an office or something, and it can kind of nudge um, behavior. You've seen the aquariums with the fish, and that's tied to your Fitbit, maybe, 
how active you are, but nobody has to know who's who. <laughs> you know, but, um, and so some other um, brainstorming that some of the students were doing over the summer, like in the middle one, would be like a community garden and everybody's, um, you know, maybe activity level is related to or well-being is related to how many flowers are growing in the garden and that could be a large ambient display. Um, or you can have objects, people are creating objects that depending on their activity level, if they're really busy, it's closed, but if they're less busy, it's a little bit more open, it sort of signals that they're open for discussion or collaboration at that time or something. Or tactile displays that you could interact with that would be biophilic as well, some of the other ideas that, the, that they're thinking of. And again, it, it really comes a lot from early work on attention restoration theory um, by Kaplan, and then also stress recovery. So that, that how nature has a restorative um, impact. And then on the physical side, here's some concrete. <laughs> um, we're thinking of things like how to get more greenery indoors. So living wall systems are pretty expensive and um, they often die pretty quickly or they're, or they're just very expensive to maintain. Um, so we're thinking about some things um, there and then also how to make natural ventilation, which is only really workable are truly workable in certain environments. And if we could extend the temperature ranges where we could use natural ventilation, we know that that would have good impact on well-being, as also um, just health um, with the air quality. And so in a little more detail, so we've tried, not too successfully, but with pervious concrete to grow moss, for example. Or, um, and I, I could not find a moss, there's like one moss expert in Northern California. He wouldn't answer my email. So we haven't gotten very far with this. <laughs> but um, uh, the, the idea there is just that there's no roots. It's not going to break the concrete. It doesn't actually need a lot of nutrients. It just needs water. Um, but maybe if the digital, or not the digital, sorry, the, but the physical walls, modular walls could be moved around um, that are green, but just lower cost, because um, that's a, a big issue. And then on the natural ventilation side, um, we're interested in some work that was actually done by an architect at CMU, um, Dana Kopkova, I think his name, um, who I s met at a conference once. And um, there were some interesting things about the morphology of the wall. So we do a lot with thermal mass with the floor. Um, and I'd love to talk to Forrest about this more. But the, we're thinking of, can we do something more with the walls? Um, and my colleague, Katrine Gorlay, she's a, a computational modeler of airflow and wind engineering. And she's interested in natural ventilation also. And so we're doing some models of airflow over like a plate that has different morphologies. Um, and you actually do get a difference in the convective heat transfer, which isn't huge, but it is something. Um, and so we're trying to see if there might be a way to play with um, the morphologies and also the actual materials. I'm thinking of using um, some waste materials in there like biochar um, that might be able to change the thermal properties. Um, just to see if we can kind of control temperature in other ways within a building. So it's all very exploratory, but those are just a couple examples of the digital. Um, I mentioned that my past work has been in reinforced concrete, pre-stressed concrete, um, so we're still doing a little bit of that. Um, but I've also worked a lot in bio-based composites. And I just mentioned this, but it's, I haven't quite figured out how to link this yet <laughs> into this research. Um, but the bio-based composites were, uh, are something that it's a polymer that grows in bacteria. Is there a pointer? Oh, yeah. So a uh, polymer that grows inside bacteria. Um, so the, uh, and it, the bacteria grabs carbon from the environment and stores it as polymer, kind of the way we store fat. It's an energy reserve. Um, and then you mix it with wood, natural fibers or, or wood flour to make um, a composite that's kind of like wood, but it's more rapidly renewable. Um, could be used in the construction industry, for instance, with formwork. Anaerobically biodegrades to methane, and then you feed that methane to the bugs, the bacteria, and you get more polymer. So it's a closed loop. So anywhere that there's waste gas, you could grow plastic. So there's a startup that's working on this. Um, we've made some foams to so try to get um, better acoustic um, mo and moisture resistant, but acoustic foams for building materials. And then um, a big question is just about the durability. So this is a traditional wood polymer composite. They, they're not that durable. Um, and ours aren't either, but it leads to questions of like um, the life cycle. So if maybe it's got a shorter life cycle, but even if you have to use it twice, you know, if you have to replace it more often, it could still be greener. Anyway, so this is another whole area of research I've been doing, but it hasn't really made it into the built environment. Um, it does have sort of the look of a natural material. So it might be something interesting to, to test out eventually on the well-being side. And it could be when people know about it, it could impact the environmental behaviors as well. Um, right now, I think there's a little bit of bio, fully bio-based composites on like for trims and flooring and stuff, but it's not a big market yet. 
It's not cheap enough yet, <laughs> basically. So um, yeah, so again, just the, what we're working on is like trying to establish the science with these controlled lab studies and then doing field studies. So we originally were working with WeWork. Don't think that's gonna happen anymore, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but uh, we do have some contacts at Google and some other companies locally that are um, very interested in well-being. Uh, so we're gonna be setting up field studies, again, understanding the acceptance constraints and design adaptations, and then the goal in the long term is to kind of release the platform, the sort of inference platform that other building managers could use so p other owners would know what their workers need in their space. Um, and we're very interested in bringing this into um, sort of like shift workers or the nighttime workers, um, so in the factories or warehouses, there's interest there. We actually, one of our original concept videos was a homeless shelter. Um, so there, we, we hope that it will have a much wider impact than just sort of the fancy looking offices that, that I was showing before. Um, and it would be really important to be able to then just measure the long-term adherence and impacts because most of the before after studies of green buildings, um, they're not really going over the long term. Um, so we don't really know if there's like a die off effect once you get used to it or if, how do we keep supporting it as we move along. So I mentioned this is a really big project. Um, so James is right next to me up there on the right with the blue box in computing. And so this is sort of the team, um, not including most of the students. And we represent actually all seven schools at Stanford. It's part of a program that Stanford had called Catalyst for Collaborative Solutions. That was the grant or the, where we got the funding for this um, research. And yeah, so we have people that represent buildings, computing, and people, um, sort of the social sciences. Um, and again, our goals to really understand which building attributes impact occupant states in naturalistic settings over long times, over long periods, sorry. Um, developing the science infrastructure and methodologies that allow others to learn more um, and be user acceptable and privacy conserving, and then design several digital and physical interventions based on inferring well-being so that our buildings can adapt. Um, so the ultimate goal um, is not only that we're having a very resilient infrastructure, but also one in which people can flourish and thrive. Thank you. <laughs> so there's lots of time for questions, <laughs> if you have any. The cube. Oh, that's nice. Hi, um, thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Ala al -Gurgush. I am a PhD uh, student in architecture, and my research is um, on the impact of architectural acoustics in well-being, so oh, that was really interesting to me. Uh, you mentioned the effect of sound on well-being, and you mentioned uh, some of the results on how it improved the sense of belonging and um, how it reduced stress. So I'm interested in learning how did you um, modify or change the acoustics oh. uh, in the project, and was it uh, only active noise cancellation, or was there any passive solution with the architectural design? So the data that I showed with that was just from that online survey, so it wasn't a controlled study. It was just finding out what people were describing about their environment, and then we would see how much they felt a sense of belonging or stress. Um, and so we could link the two, and there were correlations, um, and I think a colleague did like t-tests to kind of see that this, this was holding, um, but we haven't actually done the active controlled study of it yet. So, but for sure, um, we also are thinking that we might get some data about that with our controlled lab study, because it's basically two offices in a building at Stanford that um, we converted to make seem like they're conference rooms. Um, but like the building manager is next to one of them and sometimes he was kind of noisy. So, <laughs> so we think that they're, and we're getting that data like of how much stress because we have the, those rooms are like fully sensed out. So we might get a little bit more data just from that, not, it wasn't controlled, but we might get some ideas. And then we're gonna um, do the experiments that would have um, sound issues with them. And I think we would be using, looking at some of the technologies that are actively controlling. And um, there are several companies that have it, but also definitely the passive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. Um, 
I'm struck by the use, the desire not to be creepy. The, creepy. the desire not to be creepy. Right. Um, and some people are just creeped out by being in this kind of building. Um, and so to what extent do you prepare for eventually having to cater to only actually really one kind of person who finds this kind of building as a subcategory of well-being as opposed to creepy? That's the first question. Like, uh, to, to what extent do you control for your own presence at all being creepy, whether it's, you, only use, you only use the lights as an example of the creepiness? But having, being a responsive building, in a responsive building, right. on the one hand might just creep people out. And then right. my, my other question, which is a mirror image, is um, have you accounted for the fact that people feel proud of being in such a building and thus uh, that contributes to their well-being? So how much do you control for your own feedback, basically? Oh. oh, that's really interesting. Um, so, let's see. <laughs> um, the the creepiness thing. I, I think you know we're going to have to find that out by by when we do the experiments. So one example with the plug loads, nobody seemed to care. So that was kind of a positive thing. Yet with our naturalistic study, they were like, "Whoa, I don't want to be monitored." But I think like once it's happening, maybe people okay. don't realize. Or, and that's not really a good thing. <laughs> so, but you're waiting but it's for not... there to be a moving wall of, of acceptance, something like that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for sure, like, um, we would, again, I think, like, at the experiment level, things are, you know, we have, they're wearing watches and they're wearing ED, like, these things called empatica. We wouldn't do that in the, in the field. Or, you know, we might ask people to wear watches, but not everybody is going to in a building. So I think... The idea is to get as much data as we can to see what matters, and then kind of figure out what level of monitoring would be acceptable, you know, or changes in adaptations. There's also a really important piece which the psychologists always bring up, which is just having more agency. So you don't want the building to be doing everything, you know. It's kind of like when you couldn't open, can't open windows. That drives me nuts. So, like, you know, it's like you, so we definitely would want to be thinking about building an agency for people as well. And the second question again. Uh, well, to what extent do you, are you factoring in pride in being at oh, such a, an environment? Yeah, so I think that I think that has probably come out in some of the before after studies. People moving from a non green to a green building, um, and they're all very upbeat and positive. But it's we don't know if it adheres, and how long. So and but we do think that if I mean just a feeling is that if if you are having the building constantly trying to improve, or the building managers are thinking about well being, not just energy. Um, that then it would adhere, that's sort of the hope. Yeah, it's a great question. So. Um, I'll just follow, tag on to that and sure. maybe help out on the building side, measuring the things that make you feel creepy. Do you, dis, dis, do you have um, a kind of breakdown of the fact that buildings are already measuring a bunch of things that we're doing with them all the time anyway from the background data? And do you break down between those and how the things that maybe you would want to measure in a more responsive building whether or not those can be aligned better with like the, the more conventional building yeah. systems and they kind of fall into the background or whether exactly. it's necessary that people accept them or be the proactive type. Exactly. And that's the point about doing the triangulation in our experiments yeah. is to, to see which pieces of data we really need, right, to, to understand the well-being. Because it would be great if it could just be from the building sensors alone, for example, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, very fascinating project. Uh, I think that we found the modernist in the room that we were looking for before now in terms of like saving society through design. Um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit. You've talked about sort of the reception of the workers and the impact and that sort of seems to be your, that was your focus of your presentation. But obviously you've been working with, you know, the uh, managers, the ones on the corner office to implement these? Well, not yet, but yeah. Not yet. Ah, because I, I, so perhaps you can sort of predict a little bit sure. the reasons why they would invest in these kinds of design oh. beyond, you know, being benevolent to the workers. So if we, probably that's how they would talk about it yeah. out in the world. But why are they doing this for their own gain? I mean, what's the gain? I, I think the biggest gain is the economical, like is the economic. So, I mean, for example, the one with the plug loads that my colleague did, I think there the argument was much more for the energy savings that could be had by understanding who's working at what times of day more, kind of, or who's busier. Um, so you can have savings on energy costs. But I think the point is that if you can improve the well-being 
and basically also your health and mental health, and that also brings down the costs of insurance, that, you know, and all of those things that the companies are investing in, um, and the absenteeism. And then also presenteeism is the other one, where you're present but not working, which we're kind of guilty of making people do by having them do these surveys, because <laughs> right? they're doing our survey while they're at work. <laughs> Maybe they're on break, but, um, but yeah, so I think it's mostly the economic one, that it's the, they're putting so much money into the people that if they can support their well-being more, um, yeah. Yeah, and, and so we, and we have had, there's sort of always a battle, I think, between the staff at Stanford, or, I mean, at any institution probably, and the faculty doing research on buildings and stuff. They're not a battle, but sometimes it's really productive and sometimes it's not. Um, but we've had a lot of support from the Stanford facilities people to, to do this. So I think they see the benefit. Yeah. It's like the wellness programs, but trying to make it something that'll really last, because they often don't. Hi, Professor Bunting. Uh, thanks for your excellent presentation. And uh, uh, I want to ask a question like in my uh, life experience. I don't know how many people have uh, the same experience like as many students in, uh, uh, as many students like living in uh, like apartments. And we have this uh, same experience like having noise from the up, uh, up, upper like stairs like, yep. uh, because I have been living on the first floor and there, there have been like step noise from the upper stairs. And, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, when, I, when I was in China, like m many, many of the buildings were built in concrete. And, 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 and here, I think most of them are, are based on wood or wood pieces. The smaller ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if the concrete building is, has, has an advantage, like, uh, from like preventing the noise from other 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 buildings or other floors, and uh, uh, do you think is there any like other materials like would uh, keep the noise like beside concrete, <laughs> like or so, uh, how about the in future will t this uh, being taken into account when we are designing buildings? Thank you. Yeah, I th I'm not an acoustics expert, but I think a lot of, there probably is a lot of work on that with the concrete. I mean, in our building, for instance, it's an, a thermal mass, so it's an open floor. It's very noisy um, because there's no carpets. But if you put the carpet in, then it kind of ruins the thermal mass thing. <laughs> um, so um, I, I don't think co concrete is necessarily better with the noise, um, but I, I don't, I'm not an expert, so I don't know. I just, that's just from my own, like, experience. Um, but then they, they, they do things like they'll put fabric panels around and stuff, so the acoustic experts know how to handle that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question fully, though. Like, I think, yeah, I think more and more noise is being taken into account, for sure. There's a lot of interest in that, especially with companies going to the open office floor plans um, and the distraction of that and then everyone having to put headphones on and, and then they're actually emailing each other even though they're like two faces away. Like it does something to the, the culture of the organization. So I think there is a lot of interest in figuring out, you know, novel ways of dealing with the noise cancellation. We are just focusing on office and education right now, not so much homes like on apartments, but that is a real issue too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, hello, um, my, my name is Tim. Um, I, I've worked in offices for 30 years and I, I was just noticed on your slides, everything looked like the uh, open office environment. Um, do you have, is, is that what it's primarily focused on or are you kind of making some comparisons to workers who have a closed office space or oh. higher partition walls between their uh, offices because I, 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 just from personal experience, I hate working in a completely open office environment with no partitions, but. Yeah, so um, no, we're definitely interested in all kinds. Um, and I think like also from that naturalistic one, the in the wild, a lot of people are just in their own single offices. Um, and our field studies would certainly be f with places that are probably gonna have both. Um, and so it, it's, it's definitely targeted also to those closed ones, because the enclosed ones, especially if they don't have natural light, I mean, there are countries where it's like, by law, you have to have an access to a view, and here we don't. <laughs> um, so for sure, we're interested in both, because I think that can be oppressive. One person that um, heard a similar talk was, who works at Facebook, said that they're in an open office, but everyone actually kind of likes it because it's so, it's actually like a double height, and they have natural light. So that kind of made sense to me, that there was some competing factors that helped make it like a better 
a better place for them. Um, but no, it's not that we're like promoting open offices or anything. It's just kind of a reality that there are so many. So we're trying to make it work for both kinds of offices. Really quick, uh, first great talk. Uh, you talk quite a bit about productivity, well-being. Have you given thought to how you would assess creativity within space, right? So a lot of those yeah. companies probably would be more keen on creativity yeah. as opposed to productivity, although they probably couple. Right. So we're not actually measuring, measuring productivity. We are just doing creativity as one of our outcomes. Um, and so what we're doing there is just the sort of the kind of established Psycholo psycholo from psychology, their, their instruments that they use. So convergent thinking and divergent thinking. Like there's a classic example of you have a brick, how many things can you do with a brick? And you just write down as many things as you can do. And that would be kind of the, I think the divergent. And then convergent would be, you know, there are things like filling in the blanks for the words. And figure. So there, these are just tasks that have been sort of va validated by the psychologists as, as being indicative of creativity. And that's what we're having them do. So we're definitely, and it was nice in the naturalistic study to see that both natural materials and natural light led to that increase in creativity relative to when people didn't have that. So we're hopeful that that's going to come out of our controlled lab study. That's the one that the psychologists really want to see. Then they'll really believe it. <laughs> yeah. I know you guys have lunch, so we have lunch. So <laughs> you uh, touched upon... Uh, people sitting and texting to their neighbor <laughs> right down the road. Uh, how are you treating generation of these um, new generations of people coming up who are using their s cell phones, the, their pods, and so on, and not communicating directly, and using <clears throat> texting and other ways to communicate in this open office environment? How do you, um, how are you addressing collaboration and FaceTime and that direct communication, which I think we see disappearing as younger people move into the workplace. Yeah, yeah, I'm a parent of two teenagers, <laughs> so see that too. Um, so I, I would say that that would, we're not necessarily directly addressing that, but the way we are would be um, by trying to infer like sense of belonging which a lot of times has to do with the social inclusion and also stress, so how much social activity and interaction you're having. So the more face-to-face -face you have, probably they know generally, and there are a lot of studies, that there is less stress. And then we're seeing here that also when there's more um, social inclusion or diverse representations, there's that sense of belonging, um, which would also lead to more interactions with people. So it's, it's more that if we can inf um, support that belonging and lowering stress, that we are probably increasing the social. But we're not directly trying to get people to talk more. I would say the plug load thing, uh, again, this would get a little bit dicey in terms of what the managers get to see. Because I, I could imagine the man managers or higher ups in the office could want to look at the data and see, OK, I need to do other programs to get people to be talking more. And I don't know if you know we would want them to use the data for that. Maybe, you know. Um, but the, like with the plug load data, where they're trying to make the network models of figuring out who's interacting with whom, to sort of understand like when they should, or yeah, which people should be working together, which ones are collaborative, which would make successful teams. So that you could use the data a little bit for that too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, why don't we act, it's, it's lunchtime, but I want to thank our keynote speaker at this room, um, Sarah, so thank you so much. <laughs> so the lunch is actually in room 1360, which is right down the stairs, and um, you'll, you can just follow the line. Um, we're going to convene back at 1.15.
here. Yeah, I don't know why someone put a mouse up here. Oh, maybe. maybe oh, just, in, just in case. Could be. But I think for, if, some, if for some reason it doesn't play, okay, then so you, can, you can, you can, yeah, yeah. Katie said it should just work with your advance. Maybe yes, maybe not be prepared. You're an asshole too. Hey, what's the name? So I'll um, <coughs> introduce you guys. Oh, I have, a, I have a brief look. Okay, good afternoon. Let's um, get started on the afternoon session here. Um, looking forward to discussing a little bit more emerging technology and uh, but still highly related to the, the topic of concrete. Um, I'd like to introduce the, f the first group of speakers, um, Brian Ellis and Victor Lee. Um, Brian Ellis is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. His research focuses on the development of safe and emerging energy technologies. And Dr. Victor Lee, who, I'm work who I've worked with for many years, is the James R. Rice Distinguished University Professor of Engineering and the E.B. Wiley Collegiate Professor of Civil Engineering at the University of Michigan. His research interest is in multifunctional materials targeted at enhancing civil infrastructure, sustainability, and resiliency. He led the research team that invented engineering cementitious composites, popularly known as bendable concrete, which I think you will see some exciting pictures of in this presentation. So let's welcome Victor and Brian. So you should be able to advance the slide, I think. Yeah. Right. OK, so uh, talking about Concrete innovations, it might be good to get started with some historical <laughs> background, how concrete has been developing. Uh, where is it? <laughs> there, okay. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> going back all the way to 3000 BC, we have the <laughs> Egyptian pyramid. And of course, later on, we have the Roman structures those are the pre-modern day concrete, uh, perhaps using the invention of Portland cement as the defining line for modern day concrete about 200 years ago. And the uh, first uh, concrete bridge in California, first uh, concrete road in Ohio, not that far from here in Michigan. Um, and the uh, first tall buildings made out of concrete and marching forward the Edison homes that are built out of concrete um, and the first ready mix truck. Um, and then the uh, Hoover Dam, which is still standing, of course. Um, and finally, to today, we have the tallest building and the longest bridge uh, in the world made out of concrete materials. Now, throughout this whole period, the modern day concrete, about 200 years or so, concrete strength has been rising continuously over time so that we can build bigger and longer things. Uh, but what is in the future for us? What do you think? Well, I think we need to be motivated first 
by asking ourselves why we need concrete or innovation in concrete. So we've already seen this a couple times in different ways. What we're looking at is the increase in global temperature over the past 50 or so years. And what I want to point out in this graph that's, that's most critical is if we want to avoid the critical temperature rise of 1.5 degrees Celsius, we, we, we used to operate on a 2 degrees C, that, that's actually been lowered down. If we want to achieve that temperature, we need to act now. There has to be innovations in materials such as concrete, which coupled with building energy use, it accounts for almost 40% of global CO2 emissions. And so this is really, um, the take home message from this isn't trying to understand what tra trajectory we're on, but it's to, to really hit home the fact that there's an urgent need to find innovative strategies um, right now to, to address the global climate change related to, by and large, CO2 emissions. And we know that climate change impacts are happening, right? So just a couple of months ago, we were seeing devastation of hurricanes in the Bahamas, and we see these events taking place more frequently. You know, you might have heard about 100-year floods, right? We're having 100-year floods every few years, right? So th th this is an, uh, an opportunity where the whole society is being affected and, and actually seeing these effects of climate change. Um, and currently, right now, we have uh, the fires taking place in California. But climate change does not just mean everything gets more extreme or, or drier. It just means that you have wet events or dry events that happen in greater extremes and greater frequencies. So there's going to be parts of the world that are going to be experiencing drought, while other parts of the world are getting flooded in extreme events, such as shown here in these pictures. But what we're really focused on, and, and this is trying to motivate some of the work that we're going to talk about here, is that we see that this is obvious to the, to the younger generation, right? This recent climate strike. What you're seeing here is people out protesting, saying we need to attack this now, right? And so one of the things that we're trying to think about is how can we innovate in the world's largest consumed material, concrete, such that we can address the climate change uh, problems? So um, climate change is here. What we need to do is both adapting to climate change as well as try to mitigate it. And coming back to concrete, what I see is that we need previous concrete. We need concretes that are much more resilient. Our infrastructures built out of concrete that are much more resilient to extreme forces, fire resistance, self thermal adaptive materials that are smart, not just carrying load, but being able to respond to the environment. Uh, and mitigation strategies like greener cement, carbon sequestration in concrete material, I'm sure you have heard a lot, and even self-healing concrete that allows the material to be much more durable and require less frequent repairs. Okay, so if you ask me, what is in the future, I would say, con how about concrete for climate change, CCC. <laughs> um, so the uh, transformation that I'm seeing into the future is concrete has to transform from being a brittle material into a ductile material, ductile concrete. I know it doesn't sound very smooth in your ear, for some people, this is obviously an oxymoron, uh, but let's move on a little bit. Okay, the second transformation that I observe also is that we need to make concrete that goes from being dumb, just low carrying, into smart material that responds to the environment. And we need concrete to be green, uh, and I already mentioned carbon sequestration, we need concrete that are able to allow us to build efficiently, okay? Uh, 3D printing that will, I'll just mention at the end, but the next talks will also talk about that. Okay. So the, think, thinking about how we can treat this as a conversation, Victor's now gonna take a chance to tell us how we can build more resilient material, how we can innovate in our concrete materials to make more resilient infrastructure. I'm more used to giving a talk myself. <laughs> <laughs> so we are practicing trying to communicate <laughs> and make a conversation out of this. Uh, but we are not professionals. All right, so how do you make 
infrastructure more resilient, concrete more resilient, um, more damage tolerant. Uh, we need to learn from nature. Now let's see if this works. Okay. So nature tells us that you don't really try to resist by being strong. You need to sometimes relax and give. And willow trees is like that. So these willow trees are very hard to be blown down by strong winds. They are stronger than actually very strong oak trees. They are more difficult to pull it down because they are resilient. They, are, they have a gift. When strong winds blow, they just let go and the wind forces pass by. In fact, this idea has also been used in materials created by nature. Uh, what you're looking at here is the necker material, the iridescent color material called necker, on the inside of abalone shells. And these materials are built out of something very close to cement, like calcium carbonate, equally brittle. But when you test necker, it's actually more like a metallic material. So they can go undergo plastic yielding. How about that? Making, turning chalk-like material into a steel-like material. And nature already have done that. You, how many of you know why nature do this for necker inside the abalone shells? Survival, of course. The abalone doesn't want to be eaten. Okay, sea turtles is their enemy. Sea turtles can break the shell. And so what the uh, abalone tries to do is to protect itself, its body, by having this kind of material which is ductile. Very difficult to break them. So we copied the idea of nature. We borrowed this idea. And so uh, we can see here concrete that is brittle, high strength concrete. Okay, can break very easily, fracture into two pieces under a bending load. Uh, whereas we can make AECC material, a new type of bendable concrete that can undergo large amount of deformation without breaking into two parts. And the trick is actually creating internal mechanisms for the material to give as opposed to resisting the force by not moving at all. So this material is no longer an academic curiosity. It's already gone out into the full-scale application, including, for example, this uh, building, this picture I took myself. And the material is used in these coupling beams, illustrated here as the yellow portions here. Uh, the material is used to keep the building safe and resilient under extreme load. That building is in Japan in a seismic zone. So the material is developed and has gone out into the field applications. Now, not only is the material resilient, but we can make the material self-heal. And let's see if this video works or not. Hopefully it does. So this is a piece of the specimen that has been deliberately damaged in the machine. And it's exposed only to air and water. And you can see that the material can undergo self-healing. So the analogy here is that it looks very much like my paper cut, paper cut on my hand. That's, my, that's a photo of my hand. Just happened that a graduate student came in when I had, ouch, and, a graduate, and I say, take my picture. <laughs> and there it goes, right? So if you have paper cuts, uh, biological material, my hand can repair itself. Okay. If I have a chainsaw that goes through my hand, obviously that doesn't work, right? So unfortunately, normal concrete is somewhat like chainsaw cuts. The crack widths can be quite large, um, millimeters even larger. Uh, but in ECC material, these, these uh, damages, even when you strain it to that bend out uh, smiley face shape, these micro cracks are self-controlled down to less than 50 microns. How large is 50 microns? Our human hair is about 100 micron, so it's very, very thin, almost invisible to the eyes, to the naked eyes. Okay, this material, apart from self-healing, it can also uh, have this self-thermal adaptive behavior, um, and what it does is that it can 
include phase change materials so that when the outdoor temperature rises and it's trying, the heat is trying to get into our homes and we are about to turn on the air conditioning, then you see the thermal capacity jumps, okay, um, and it actually blocks the heat from coming into the interior of the home. In this way, we use the material as a means to reduce energy usage and reduce carbon in the use phase of the material when the building is operating. So this kind of material, for example, has been tested in this uh, chimney. Uh, this is a home in Ann Arbor, and it's a technique where we combine both passive design and this advanced material, and it turns out that we can decrease the temperature by about five degrees and delay the peak temperature by about two hours. So, um, the material is resilient, it's durable, it self-repairs, has lots of smart functions, and coming back very close to climate change, let's talk a little bit about, can we make it really super green, Brian? <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think we can. All right, so that's, we're going to have confidence. But one of the things that, you know, so we just heard about how we can tune the material to be more resilient, maintain crack wit, self-heal, potentially provide better heating and cooling for a building. But how else might we be, we be able to change the way we make the material to actually turn it into a greener product, right? And so this is directly looking at opportunities to sequester the CO2, whether it be from fossil, fossil uh, fuel power generation or from the actual making of the cement itself. As we heard earlier, the cement industry is, it accounts for about 8% of global CO2 emissions. And so we, we are pursuing some work, and, and, and there's others also looking into this, where we're actually looking to take advantage of that CO2 and put it back into our concrete materials. Now, this is somewhat counterintuitive to what we heard at the, the start of today's session, where, we're, where the, we basically learned that CO2 ingress eventually can lead to loss of alkalinity in the material such that you get corrosion of your steel reinforcement. In our case, we're taking advantage of, of, for example, the ECC, which does not necessarily require pre-stressed steel reinforcement, and we're utilizing CO2 from point source emission sites and directly incorporating that into the, the manufacture of a precast product. And as shown here, this is, I think, where's my pointer? We have a project right now where we're actually going to be building precast ECC carbonated railroad ties. And this isn't a picture of our chamber, but we just found out today our chamber is finished. And this is a you know, 12 foot long, four foot diameter autoclave where we're able to pressurize uh, and, and carbonate materials um, at con under controlled conditions. And in this case, we've actually demonstrated at bench scale that we were able to store 30% of CO2 by cement mass. Right, so you're taking a, a CO2 intensive material and greening it by actually pushing it back towards calcite production. Also, you can have the opportunity to do cast in place. So cast in place, this is where you, you know, poured foundations or roads. This is, accounts for 70% 70, 70 of the concrete market. Right, so we have to look at new opportunities to incorporate CO2 here. And one of the things that we've examined is actually carbonating waste materials ahead of time and then mixing them in directly with these cast in place applications. And this is an opportunity to take care of waste that has no other value while also directly incorporating CO2 and effectively using this as aggregate. And in the end, we hope to be able to do this in a way that utilizes a waste product and generates a, a longer, more durable concrete product, right? So we're looking to have a, a balance between um, use so like the usefulness of the material and its longevity uh, it, as an infrastructure uh, component and effectively close the loop where we're even considering opportunities where you can create these carbonated ECC materials and then reuse them, reconfigure them. Um, at the end of the day, trying to treat CO2 as a resource and not a waste product just associated with the production of concrete materials. But the, the question I have for Victor to, to end this discussion is, if we have innovation in material design and applications where we might be able to utilize waste products, where are the opportunities to innovate in the actual manufacturing of buildings? So the uh, 
many of you have heard of 3D printing, and um, it's not difficult to imagine, however, that 3D printing of concrete structure is a challenge in the sense that concrete being brittle, after 200 years of development remaining brittle, it requires steel reinforcement. But the placement of steel reinforcement and the 3D printing process are incompatible. It's very difficult to make both of those work together in an efficient manner. So how about if we 3D print bendable concrete that is self-reinforced without the need for steel reinforcement? Can we really print such material? And the answer is, yeah, maybe, if I can turn this here. <laughs> so this is work done, collaborations between the School of Architecture and the Civil Engineering <laughs> Department using a cooker robot. Uh, we are able to print, and let's see if I can activate that uh, little movie here. I apologize for the uh, shading there because uh, there is uh, some innovations here which are being patented. <laughs> Uh, and we were advised not to show this publicly, otherwise it, it destroys the patent application. Um, but you can see here f uh, this uh, ECC material being 3D printed into a wall panel uh, for building applications. Okay. So uh, given the fact that we have limited amount of time, so I'm going to come to a conclusion. Um, so we started off with this discussion with whether we can create new innovations in concrete that is suitable for climate change adaptation and mitigation. And I would say that such material do exist now. Okay. So um, it, we don't really necessarily have to wait for the future. Of course, there are further development work that can be uh, beneficial but such material is available and, as you saw, can be put into full-scale structures. Okay? Um, and in terms of architectural appeals, apart from resiliency that we talked about, there are also the uh, possibility, I believe that earlier this morning there was a talk that mentions corrosion of the reinforcing steel as a challenge to deterioration of con reinforced concrete structures. Um, in this case here, because we are using a self-reinforced cementitious material, at least the steel that is typically used to control cracks will not, no longer be needed. Okay? We may still want, need to use structural steel, but the steels that are used to control cracks we may not need anymore. Now, if we can get rid of that type of steel, then they cannot corrode because they are not there. So that's not, that becomes an elimination of a major source of infrastructure decay problem. Okay. So um, the, uh, with the removal of the steel, we can also lightweight the structure. Uh, I already mentioned that the material is 3D printable, so it supports automation and construction efficiency, building faster and better uh, with this kind of material. Uh, our concrete um, construction industry is not the most efficient one. The productivity actually is lagging behind the general economy by a factor of seven. So anywhere we can improve construction efficiency and build faster would be welcome, I believe. Okay. So ultimately, what we are aiming at, for ex of course, in the development of such materials is to create stronger harmony between the built environment and the natural environment. I don't believe anyone would argue that we need both of them. We just want to make sure that they are harmoniously coexisting. Okay. So is everything good and everything's done? I would say no. There are still challenges, uh, including earlier discussions about codes and standards. We are in a relatively conservative industry. Um, and li reliability or liability can become obstacles to innovation. So these are work that we still need to do. Uh, we need further R&D in education and training. Um, and there is a lot more that we can do that goes beyond the materials, but into the design of 
buildings and other types of infrastructures, their construction, their uh, operations and maintenance and end of life. There's a lot of opportunity where we can cut carbon emissions throughout the life cycle of our infrastructures. So we need to exploit this. And um, just to put in a plug for a center we are building, uh, so this is the UM Center for Low Carbon Built Environment. We're just starting up. I see my time is up. Uh, but so those of you who are interested, uh, you're most welcome, and we can chat afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next we're going to continue along this theme of innovation but explore potential applications outside of our planetary boundaries. Um, Michael Fisk currently serves as the Jacobs ESSCA Technical Fellow for Advanced Materials and Manufacturing. He has over 30 years of experience in design, development, fabrication, and testing of unique material processing hardware. This encompasses ground and spaceflight hardware, rocket engine assembly and test, additive manufacturing, and most recently additive construction. He's joined by Shadi Nazarian. She's an associate professor at the Stuckman School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the Pennsylvania State University. Her research focuses on novel material and production processes, specifically 3D printing with functionally graded materials, which enable the concept of a seamless architecture. Thank you. Glad I got that out of the way. <laughs> Thank you for having us. This is a, a, a novel venue and opportunity for me to see what, what's going on in the rest of the world. Um, I'll start by, by saying that in 2004, I was asked to, te uh, to lead a team aimed at development of in situ based uh, infrastructure elements on the moon. Uh, roads, um, landing pads, habitats, shelters, etc. Um, these structures were all to be um, built autonomously. They were, being, they were to be built using nothing but the material that was available on the moon with hardware that we would deliver uh, to the moon. And uh, been looking at these technologies pretty much ever since. Um, jump ahead to 2013, 2015 maybe, uh, NASA sponsored a 3D printed habitat challenge. Um, that was a multi-year, multi-phase challenge. I was one of the judges. Uh, Dr. Shadi Nazarian um, led one of the teams from Penn State. That's where we first met, and we've kind of been collaborating um, since that after the, after the competition was over. So we had several conversations between us about how to do this, and in the process of doing it, we asked each other a lot of questions, and we thought the way we would handle this today was basically to duplicate some of those conversations and uh, see how, how that worked. So the first thing I'd like to uh, ask uh, Shadi to discuss is, from her perspective, um, where does the point between, foc where does the focus between aesthetics and function uh, change to one of primarily function, or does it? So. Sorry, I'm trying to start this. I don't know. Ah, there Maybe it is. Click right there, yeah. Use the, the mouse. mouse yeah. oh, right. Sorry, I don't work with PCs, so I'm a little lost here. Oh, you're good. It's on the screen. Oh, okay. So, ah, great. Thank you. So before I talk about the project uh, for which I actually didn't bring m much images or didn't include m many images in the PowerPoint, but there is a poster later on that has some more information, perhaps. Um, I want to explain the research approach that Penn State team has taken. Um, we have a transdisciplinary team of, of uh, six faculty and many, many students. So at any time, we have about 20 people working. Um, <clears throat> What we have decided is to think about what, may, what 3D printing makes possible. We were not interested 
in doing things um, that already were um, uh, available or possible by doing conventional construction. So, for example, we decided no form work. Even though 3D printing, in fact, is free form, many people are creating or printing the form work and then pouring concrete inside. We wanted to stay away from that. Then we decided no assembly of parts. We were interested in monolithic structures, and I'll explain that a little bit more later. We also decided no support structure, which meant that we needed to study the maximum angle at which we could print, and um, no prefabricated parts, meaning we weren't interested in using any skylights or uh, build walls and then finish it with a um, typical or conventional roof structure. We were interested in actually exploring how we can complete the structure totally built using this technology, enclosure and all. And also, we're not interested uh, in mass production, but mass com um, customization and automation. And that's something that when we joined NASA 3D Printed Habitat Challenge competition in phase two, uh, we, were, uh, we had to um, engage um, automation even though we weren't much advanced at that point. But the competition actually helped us to, to facilitate and speed us up. Also, we uh, had to think about deployment of the technology and building on harsh conditions and difficult sites, such as Mars. We realize um, that this results in a transforming language of architecture. It is unavoidable. Every time there is a new technology, architecture responds and pushes that new technology to its boundaries but this causes a dialogue between that new technology and architecture. They're both affected. And um, we also recognize that 3D printing or additive construction is a disruptive technology, which means that it really sets in motion innovation of multiple different types of things. Um, so the answer to your question is we never stop that <laughs> the relationship between material investigation of materials, printing systems, and design is ongoing, and all the time there is not, no point at which we would stop designing and start thinking about material. It's always uh, everything all at once, and they're constantly, they are related, interrelated completely. So we model complex relationships between the variables we look at the affordances of the additive construction technology in terms of form and structure um, to determine the impact on design, but also how, what we want to design, how could it impact the development of technology. We want to be at the table where uh, materials are designed and developed, where technologies are designed and developed, and as well as systems. We're also interested in aesthetically pleasing and uh, spatially uplifting environments. So for example, in the Mars Habitat Challenge competition, we did not want anything that is claustrophobic. We, one of our, em the emphasis on, in the design of the habitat was to create tall ceilings and environments that felt good to live in. So the design of the material, for example, uh, the material needs to be flowable through the hoses. It needs to set quickly enough once it's deposited so that it holds its own shape and also takes the weight of the following layers. The system, um, from everything from end effectors, the uh, manipulation of the reach of the robot, uh, mixer, pump, everything is constantly being designed and, and altered and hacked. The architectural design is informed by the technology, but also informed by the history of architecture. Where, for example, we look at um, masonry construction techniques, such as corbeling, specifically where there is uh, no mortar, so mortar-less uh, construction of um, units, modules, uh, building modules. 
We also explore to achieve articulated and inter intricate surfaces that are articulated well and also spatial quality. So these are all always at the table. So we work uh, with these uh, uh, goals for projects on Earth as well as on Mars because of the competition. And I'd like to ask Mike to uh, expand or uh, speak about how the lunar environment um, provides the drivers for concrete construction. Thanks. So as I started working with this team uh, in the early 2000s, and we were looking at, by then, 3D printing of concrete was becoming uh, known in the community a little bit. And we realized, realized pretty quickly that if we printed anything on the lunar surface, and, and we wanted to print because it was a very, you know, it was a process that looked like we could automate it, um, we weren't going to be printing Portland cement-based materials. Uh, there's, there's no carbon. There's no um, very little sodium to speak of. Uh, there's no clay. Um, so, and we were tasked with using in situ materials. So we started looking at other materials, which I'll, I'll talk about. But the primary material available to us is regolith, lunar regolith. It, regolith is, a, is a term, another term for soil, but in this case, it's soil that has absolutely no organic matter to it whatsoever. It's, it's very, very fine. You, you probably, those of you who remember the Apollo days, it's very fine powder. It sticks to everything primarily because of the glutenitic structure that you see up on the upper right. It's a very jagged, very um, cohesive structure. These particulates are on the order of 10 microns, um, and they are several, cent uh, several meters deep um, across the surface of the moon. The composition changes a little bit between the highlands and the mare, um, but this is what we have to deal with. So when I start looking at, at a, um, a composition for a cement, for example, all I have available to me is this. I can, I can melt it and see what I can extract from it. I can run it through various processes like, like ionic liquid uh, select, selective extraction. Um, but this, and then I can use the, the regolith itself as the um, aggregate for the concrete. So before I really begin to talk about the environment, um, as a, as a little segue into this chart, I want to ask everybody here if, uh, if you're familiar with the fact that there's a new restaurant on the moon. Anybody? The food is great, but it has no atmosphere. So there's another show at 6 if you guys want to come back. Um, so tell your kids that. They're going to love it. Um, so that's the main thing everybody thinks about on the moon. There's no atmosphere. It's dusty. It's a hard vacuum. Um, large temperature swings, both the equator and the, and the poles. Um, it's significant. You think about concrete withstanding some of these temperature swings, and it's a real problem. Um, very long um, uh, days and nights. I mentioned the dust. Very sharp, angular soil. I've got it right here in front of me. Very sharp, angular soil with a high angle of repose. You can dig a trench with almost vertical walls about three feet deep, and it won't collapse. Um, it, but in the, doing, in the process of doing that, you'll tear up your shovel because it's incredibly abrasive. Um, and you'll notice, uh, well, those of you who look, looked at any lunar history, when they were trying to dig probes to do prospecting on the moon, they, they were, it was much harder to dig deep than they thought it would be. And they're having the same problem on Mars now. Um, the solar flux uh, is the same as on Earth, um, but there's no protection by, within, from any atmosphere to the radiation environment. So solar um, uh, GCR, galactic cosmic radiation, and, and so, uh, single or solar particle events, excuse me, um, are prevalent and very dangerous to hardware, so everything's got to be in a garage when it's not out, ex or, or shelter when it's not exposed. Um, the moon is much more seismically active than we thought it was. Um, between 72 and 77, there were something like 28 earthquakes detected by the Apollo Seismometer Network that were five, five and a half Richter scale. The problem is there's no dampening by the soil. So an earthquake on the moon would, might ring for 45 minutes to an hour with, with significant movement that we would have to deal with with any kind of a structure. Um, and I think I mentioned the environment. And um, lastly, the impacts of this environment to um, concrete construction are significant when you look to both the hardware that we're printing with and to whatever structure we're building. Um, you can see these are the two of the the uh, structures, the, the upper structure there is the one built by Penn State at the at the head-to-head -head competition in Peoria. The lower one was built by a company called AI Space Factory. The 
the gantry style printer in the middle picture there is one that we built at Marshall Space Flight Center. We delivered it to the Corps of Engineers so they could print barracks for their troops, bridges, um, other anti-tank obstacles, et cetera. That's about 50 by 30 by 20 feet tall. And the lower left there is just a, a my artist's rendition of what a, uh, a habitat on the moon might look like. And I'll show you that in a moment. But the um, as we looked at, started looking at some of these structures, we began to realize that, you know, when you talk about natural light, for example, even on the moon, you'd like to get natural light if you can do it in a way to protect um, crew members and, and hardware. And um, I was intrigued by uh, Dr. Nazarian's proposal to NASA when they submitted it that she had a background with studying functionally graded material. So I'd like to ask Dr. Nazarian to talk about some of her research in that area um, and impacts to potential impacts to habitat structures. So this is an area that I'm quite passionate about. When I first joined the faculty at Penn State, uh, within the first few weeks, I approached material scientists with a vision. I wanted to create a joint, seamless joint, from concrete to glass. Meaning, uh, imagine, for example, where you have a wall and there's a glass window. There are so many tiny little uh, details and um, mechanical joints for the, to, to bring the glass inside the concrete wall. I wanted to avoid that frame if you don't need to operate that window. So um, also, in today's construction technology, we have multiple layers. Um, inside the wall, and I wanted to also somehow uh, think about how to avoid those, to simplify the very, very complex system that we have created for ourselves to join materials and to join um, um, building elements. So I wanted to avoid the complexity. And uh, so it took us several years, but we did, um, we did create the joint, so we invented the joint between a particular kind of concrete geopolymer concrete, which is far more environmentally friendly than the Portland cement con concrete. Uh, so we created this joint not only uh, bringing the two materials together, by that I mean no, clearly no uh, mechanical frame or adhesives, but truly when you look at it with scanning electron microscopy, you do see that these are united. Um, and also we uh, were able to achieve it in a graded fashion. So uh, imagine if you were walking along a wall, the wall gradually transitions from um, uh, opaque to totally transparent. So you could place structure where it's needed. You could place opacity uh, or translucency where you would like it. Um, and the other thing that was actually a surprise but very interesting learning experience for me was that these two materials are actually from the same family of materials. They're both ceramics. So to achieve this union, I had to raise the temperature in my furnace to about 950 C, which means it is a little bit difficult to make that happen at architectural scale, but we are looking at different um, techniques of sintering. So the, the, the positive things are that uh, it is impermeable, this uh, both along and through. Uh, no water, air, gas, nothing goes through it. And also we have functionally graded material from cork to, uh, with cork. Um, this explains a little bit of that. And I'd like to ask Mike to come back and uh, talk about the advancements of uh, uh, how to configure Mars I mean, uh, a lunar um, concrete, right? Thank you. Um, so, as I mentioned, when we started this, um, everything I knew about, con I'm a metallurgical engineer by background, so everything I knew about concrete was on the side of a bag of quickcrete. And um, so the first thing we did was get out there and start playing with uh, ordinary Portland cement-based materials, but we started adding lunar soil simulant, or lunar regular simulant, and Mars regular simulant to it, and trying to develop compositions that we could still pump through our, our printer at, at Marshall. Um, the results of that are shown on the far left there under, under standard mix. Uh, well, no, I, I'm sorry, let me correct myself. Standard mix is basically a mortar with no, uh, with very, very small aggregate in it, but it's just uh, sand. Um, the Mars simulant column and the, and the Moon simulant column are OPC with, with um, 
the, the respective simulants added as the aggregate. Um, we then began studying um, MGO-based cements with limited success. We have a, a uh, what we call a CAN um, cooperative agreement with the University of Mississippi. And they're continuing to research for us on MGO-based cements. There's a number of ma magnesium oxide sulfate, magnesium oxide, magnesium chloride, the Sorel class of cements. Um, but the work that we did at Marshall, we got fairly low strength, as you can see by that red um, bar, which barely met our, our threshold. With the, um, when we started looking at CSA mixes, calcium sulfate aluminate concretes, we had a lot more success. Um, we're able to, th they're, they're fairly rapid setting, we're able to temper that set with, with additives and still uh, be able to print without significant cracking or, or um, and with good flowability through, through our pump. And you can see the compressive strength is uh, fairly high for those CSA cements. And we actually have samples of those now that are, that are just being launched. You probably heard that the X-37 just landed in, in California. Um, they fly an exposure experiment that, in support of NASA, and we have samples of most of these cements um, that are flying on the next version of the X-37. So it'll launch at a TB time, TBD time. They don't tell us till afterwards. It'll be up somewhere between nine months and two years, and then we'll be able to get the samples back and see the, how they withstood the atomic oxygen environment and solar radiation. Um, so these are a number of the concretes we've looked at. We can also, we've been able to demonstrate that you can take regular simulant and melt it, and we can pull fiber from that. It's a very glassy material. Approximately 60% of lunar regolith is oxygen tied up in various metal oxides. We can pull a very glassy fiber from that. We can chop that fiber up and mix it with the, with the concrete material as we're casting it as reinforcement. We can also cast it into molds and use it as actual rebar. Um, it's a lot of work and there's not a lot of regular simulant, so we have to be very judicious in how we use the simulant for these tests. Um, um, we're also looking at sintering the regolith itself on the surface as a potential for roads and landing pads. We know we can print we can print a concrete structure, but I don't know if a monolithic structure will be able to survive, say, uh, the, the engine thrust. Um, and let's see, I think I have one more chart on this. Yeah, we can also extract water, we know, um, and use that in the binder. Um, but if we use water in our, in our binder, we're going to have to provide some kind of overpressure over the printer as we build a structure, just because the water will try to come out of the concrete and it'll, it'll turn into a big muffin. Um, we, now we've done it, <laughs> voice of experience. Um, the um, water that's trapped in the shadowed regions of the craters, we refer to that as icy regolith. It's even harder to excavate than the normal regolith. The density of the regolith uh, goes up with depth and it's, it's very difficult. And you can imagine the only thing you have working to your, in your, to your advantage an excavation is mass, and that's why you see, you know, excavators are typically huge, heavy structures, but we can't put that on the moon. Um, so we have to be able to um, excavate uh, very small amounts, but for a long time, so in order to, to offset the, the cohesiveness of especially the icy regolith. Um, and we're also going to be competing for water with life support, propulsion applications, and um, and potentially other construction applications as well. So um, with that, I, we'd like to show a one minute video, I think, that was at the tail end. We're gonna have to skip these. Okay, well, that, how, do I, how do I run that? Just hit the green button? No, it's next one, not this one. Oh, well. Go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. After that, all right. Use the mouse.
All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, so moving on to the last presentation in this session, um, I want to introduce Vineet Kamat. He's a professor in the John L. Tishman Faculty Scholar in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. He directs the Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Engineering and co-directs the Construction Engineering Laboratory. His research is primarily focused on virtual and augmented reality, visualization, simulation, mobile computing, robotics, and their application in construction. And I'd also like to introduce Matt Hedke. He's the Senior Virtual Design and Construction Manager at Barton Mallow. Matt's been with Barton Mallow for 19 years, holding a variety of roles from rebar detailing, estimating, project estimator, detail estimator before now, his current role is senior VDC manager. His current role is focused on how Barton Mallow leverages technology to improve quality, safety, workflow efficiency, and field productivity for all the trades. Thanks. Thank you. I'll just keep going. Uh, thank you, Wes, uh, for the uh, kind introduction and uh, for giving us an opportunity to speak here uh, this afternoon. So Matt and I met for the first time in our life five minutes ago, so I hope this is <laughs> worth your time. Uh, I'm just kidding. We've been in touch for quite a while. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, robotic construction and uh, you know, some of the current work that has been going on uh, both in the research spectrum as well as in the field and try to blend our perspectives uh, along the way. And um, I'm going to uh, begin with uh, a slide that many of you folks may have uh, seen in one context or the other. And that represents the fact that, uh, you know, even though there is some debate on how you measure productivity in construction, there is general consensus that uh, productivity in many other industries has consistently gone up over the years, but uh, uh, construction is at best uh, stagnant or maybe going down a uh, little bit. And uh, since we are talking about uh, concrete construction, we thought it uh, befitting to see uh, you know, how concrete construction looked like uh, historically. So here we have an old picture, uh, courtesy of a friend of mine at NIST, about concrete being poured at uh, Somerset Dam. Uh, this was before my dad was born. He was born in 1939. And then um, uh, this could be you know, this building uh, maybe a few years ago. And uh, as we can see, not much has changed, right? So things are done pretty much the same way. Concrete is poured, handled, managed in the field uh, pretty much the same way uh, as well. And uh, even though construction in the field per se, and concrete construction in particular, uh, is a good candidate for what we call the three Ds, uh, meaning like uh, dull, dirty, and dangerous work, uh, the question uh, really is why is field construction, particularly as it relates to concrete, uh, like this today and maybe not something like this, right? So uh, uh, from my perspective, and um, you know, Matt will uh, share a few things on this as well as we go along, uh, there are a few uh, key reasons as to why we don't see a predominance of uh, robots on construction sites or you may say in concrete construction. And uh, generally speaking, I think we all agree that each project is unique and in many cases uh, expression of the designers or architects intent for that particular situation. Uh, from a more technical perspective related to deployment of robots, it's very difficult to put uh, you know, any kind of metrology or sensing system on a site that can track a robot, make it do useful work in a mobile uh, context. So the environment is rugged, cluttered, dynamic, and unstructured, meaning uh, things, uh, uh, the folks who work on a site generally know where things are, but it is far from a controlled environment in the sense that uh, it's not uh, a situation where a robot will find what it needs at the place it expects. So that's why we call it a slightly unstructured environment. Another important issue is something called to to tolerance stack-up. So uh, unlike a manufactured product, uh, tolerances in construction are relatively uh, weaker, and it's that much uh, difficult for a robot or any kind of automated process to do useful work when there can be discrepancies between, between what is designed and maybe slightly uh, what is built is slightly different from that uh, design intent. 
And last but not least, uh, uh, you know, in a typical factory, the general idea is uh, the worker or the robot stays fixed to their location and the work comes to them. In construction, particularly on site, uh, generally you, you need, even if the work is repetitive, you, uh, you need to go to that place to do uh, repetitive instances of those. And I think that causes quite a bit of complexity for uh, deployment of uh, robots. Um, having said that, though, there are quite a few instances where uh, automation and robotics has been successfully deployed on construction sites uh, or in other factory type of settings. And we are going to focus particularly on four aspects of uh, concrete construction and integration of robotics within that context. First, we are going to talk about prefabricated concrete manufacturing, then talk about some work that has been done in on-site concrete uh, construction. Uh, talk a little bit about retrofitting concrete structures after they are initially built. And finally, wrap up with some thoughts about cutting edge work uh, that has been going on, including 3D printing that we have been seeing extensively uh, here. So let me briefly begin by talking about prefabricated concrete manufacturing. I think uh, this primarily has uh, stemmed from advances in uh, precast construction. The idea being that if you can manufacture concrete elements in a factory like setting, uh, the environment and therefore the quality of the product can be better controlled. You can have more consistency in the units that are produced. And the problem is then reduced to taking these uh, units to site and assembling them in some way. Uh, I'm not an architect, but I would assume this may res restrict some expressiveness in the form of design, but it does offer many other benefits of uh, uh, modular construction. And I know uh, this is something that the industry also uh, looks at uh, uh, quite closely. So I'm going to you know, uh, start to begin a conversation here, here with Matt myself and ask him, what does industry think about prefabricated construction? Yeah, so let me start by saying that whole intro, Vineet wanted me to sit here and do the robot when he was talking, but I told him no. So, um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, hey, if you, you know, to Vineet's point, I think if you look at the industry as a whole and some of the challenges we face, um, we need to start to look for, for areas that we've seen success like precast and how can we take a lot of those means and methods and apply them to cast in place. And, and, and look for other areas that we've done innovative things and, and figure out how do, we, how do we continue to advance the ball. Um, I think there's little pockets within the industry that we do well. Um, some things that we, we do at Bart Mello is if we have a tight site or you know, tight schedule or things like that, oftentimes we'll take and prefab you know, rebar cages or we'll pre-build formwork and, and gang forms together, things like that. But that's not the type of innovations that are gonna get us to where we need to go. In the context of prefabricated construction in particular, some of the innovations we are seeing uh, from a research perspective are occurring in robotization of the rebar cage manufacture process. So many of you might know that uh, when uh, prefabricating structural elements, uh, bar bending and you know, creating the rebar cage uh, to perfect specifications is kind of a big uh, deal. And from the work that I have seen and quite a bit of work that we have conducted here at the University of Michigan uh, as well, this is a very potent area where robotics has significant uh, implications. So uh, the work we have been doing here primarily stems from uh, BIM-driven robotics. So the idea being that if you have a detailed model of a rebar cage, how can you use that information to automatically extract that uh, uh, into instructions that can be used by one robot or a team of robots to, to fabricate the cages, uh, both for longitudinal bars as well as the stirrups that tie them uh, together. And because we are operating in a digital environment, much of this work can be conducted in the form of what is called a virtual prototype. So you can experiment with several different options before committing to one particular design that we can then build and test out in the physical world. So here we are showing an image of uh, one contraption that originated in our lab several years ago. The idea was if we can create a modular aspect to the number of longitudinal bars uh, that comprise a, a particular cage, and then use that as a way to swap out various designs uh, using a team of robots, in this case two robot arms, and then have a collaborative process where you could draw in the longitudinal bars and then tie them up together. This was seen as a first step uh, into uh, robotizing the tedious uh, rebar cage fabrication process. 
And our hypothesis at that time was correct because uh, uh, when we began speaking, uh, Matt confirmed to us that uh, this is indeed taking on speed uh, in the startup arena as well as in the field. So uh, why didn't you tell us about that, Matt? Yeah, I think it was interesting that, that as we're kind of preparing for this presentation, you know, I get the Construction Dive is a, is a publication. I get the weekly in, or email from them kind of talking about what's going on in the industry. And uh, as I'm kind of scrolling through the headlines, I see this article that uh, Mark Cuban from the Shark Tank is given seed funding to one of these companies that is looking at exactly this, right? So we're starting to see a lot of this stuff uh, start to come to industry, which I thought was really, really uh, positive. Yeah, so now we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, things that we're doing in the field to kind of, uh, you know, what we say, plan our work, work our plan. Um, you know, some of the challenges from a, from a cast-in-place perspective on projects that, um, that we're challenged with is, is, you know, hey, things are always changing, things are always moving, we got challenging schedules, we, um, how, you know, how do we control that? So our approach to that is we want to build what we call like Lego-type instructions. So I'm sure everybody in the room is gotten a box of Legos before, right? You got a bag A, bag B, you got instructions in there and it tells you exactly what to do. Um, that's kind of our, our approach. So we want to look at things like site logistics and how are we getting materials on, on and off the site, where are things going to be staged, where are our laydowns going to be. We want to control that environment as much as we can and take a lot of that variability out of it. Um, how are we going to sequence the work? So we'll take, uh, you know, and, and use our BIM models that we're building and tie our schedule to it and be able to visualize and validate our schedules as we plan for our projects. Uh, concrete and rebar modeling in-house. So all of our con uh, cast in place concrete that we do and all of our reinforcing steel, we model in-house. We want to be able to understand every bit and piece of that concrete and we want to understand exactly what's going into it and, and again, control that. Um, and then what we call lift drawings or again, those Lego type instructions um, and then work packages. How are we making these into small digestible pieces so that we can look, look at uh, some of those efficiencies that, that we're looking for? Um, so this is just, a, again, a quick, uh, I think it's a quick animation maybe. Yeah, so I'll kind of let this, this, this play. So this was a pursuit we were going after. And again, we want to understand every part and piece. Where are we going to put our cranes? How are we going to get material out? How are we going to sequence this? And we're doing this at the pre-construction level. So before we go and we're with one, won the job, we want to make sure that we have the right plan of attack and we know exactly what's going to happen on the site and how everything's going to flow. So again, this isn't you know down to the detail that we're going to build off of, but it's a really, really great starting point to be able to visualize and make sure that we have the right plan of attack and the right uh, pricing associated with it. And then, you know, I talked a lot about concrete and rebar. You can see this is a pretty complicated structure, but whether it's complicated like this or very simple, we want to put every part and piece in there. We want to model every piece of, you know, reinforcing seal that you see in there, every embed, every anchor bolt, any, anything and everything that goes in there, we want to be able to capture and understand where it is and then be able to give that location uh, to our men and women in the field. And again, those, those, um, those Lego type instructions, this is a pour on a project where we give them an isometric view and all the necessary information they need to be able to go on site and it's not an entire job. We've already flushed through all those questions, uh, building it in the 3D environment and we've broken it down into bite sized pieces so that we can go then and, and, and execute it. And then lastly, you know, we're going to give them a whole package of information that they need to go do it. So it's not just, um, you know, it's not just a 3D model. There's everything from schedule to how we're gonna, they're gonna charge their time, any safety uh, concerns that we need to have. Um, you know, everything is in this package so that they can then go and execute the work. Um, so I'll talk a little bit um, about some industry challenges. Um, you know, hey, if you start to look and, and think about why are we up here talking about robotics? Um, so safety is our number one priority. We want to send our people home the same way that they come to work. And it's very, very important to us. So, you know, if you kind of look at the, the you know, four, the fatal four, as they call them, um, of, of safety incidents in the industry, it's falls, struck by, electrocution, and caught in or between, right? If we can start to use robotics to eliminate some of that risk, like, that's what we want to do. That's a huge advantage. Um, 
Secondly, it's no secret we have an aging workforce. There's been such an emphasis on people need to go to college. And while I think that's great, we're, we're, we're starting to see it within the industry right now. We're starting to see that, that we're not getting those young people coming into the industry that want to work the way that they do. So we got to figure out, as an industry, uh, how do we solve that? And then, again, kind of in that same age, you know, aging workforce is, they, uh, is a trade number decline. Again, a lot of people are wanting to, not wanting to get into the trades. So I'll play this video really quick. In, uh, so this is a, a product that we've been partnering with Construction Robotics in. It's called the Mule. It's a material unit lifting apparatus. And originally it was designed for cinder block. We went to them and, and started to have conversation with them on how we can use it for things like form work. So what we were able to do is uh, customize and change the gripper so it can go and, and, and grip concrete panels. So this is, you know, they kind of modified the gripper and this is some testing they were, they were doing with a, a local company in, uh, in the state of New York. But the idea behind it is rather than have those, those guys pick those form work up and carry them across, uh, the other side of the site or, you know, figure out how do we, again, put people in harm's way, whether if they're lifting or, um, or whatever, you know, can we use a, a, a machine like this to enhance that? So now uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the third phase of, you know, uh, structure constructed of concrete, and that is uh, retrofit or uh, maintenance. And in that regard, we're going to speak uh, first generally of uh, the benefits of uh, as-built uh, uh, reality or scanning as-built reality and what benefits the industry has seen uh, from that. So from our perspective, I, I think, um, you know, how are we ensuring that what needs to go into the concrete is in the right location and what measures are we, are we um, putting in place to make sure that that, that happens? So you've got things like our pre-pour, our post pour checklist, um, laser scanning is a big one. Um, when we do high rise deck that have post tensioning in it, the last thing you want to do is drill into one of those and have a cable shoot out the side of the building. You know, it's not safe. It creates a whole lot of, of, of issues downstream. Um, again, now we have that, that laser scan, and because we're modeling all that concrete, we can start to bring those laser scans together with our, with our BIM model and start to understand hey, did we, did we put these things exactly where they were supposed to go? Did we have everything covered? Again, it's just another QAQC measure as well as an as-built. Um, and again, we're using laser scanners or we're going out there and shooting, uh, you know, a lot of those things, um, you know, out on the site. And then, you know, one thing that we've kind of, um, again, as Vineet and I were trying to figure out exactly, you know, what we're going to include in this discussion, one of the kind of internal debates we're having right now is things like anchors, you know, so not just anchors, there's probably a lot of things that apply, but like how detailed do we get in that BIM model? Like what makes sense to include and what doesn't? And, and you know, it's kind of that um, internal debate that we're having. So Vineet's going to take it from here and kind of show some of the research they've been doing. So as an example, uh, several uh, years ago, we were approached by a railroad company. And the problem was that uh, they built several concrete bridges uh, that uh, you know have the right of way for two railway lines maybe going in either direction but for whatever reason right now they build one set of rails with the second one to be built maybe several years later and uh, what they do is uh, they leave uh, specific anchor points on the unused side of the deck the idea being 20 years later we'll come back and start drilling the deck at those points and connect the second uh, set of rails uh, the problem was uh, when crews came to the bridge deck and started drilling such holes, they began to, you know, hit utilities, hit pre-stressing tendons, uh, thereby, you know, uh, affecting the structural integrity uh, of the bridge. So um, what we were able to do along with the team at uh, NIST is first understand how this uh, the industry currently solves their problem and then introduce a measure of automation in this process of general maintenance and retrofit of concrete structures. So the way this is typically done is to uh, leave wooden embeds in the concrete and then you know, place concrete as you would. The idea being when you come back later, you're going to find out exactly where those embeds are, pull them out somehow, and then they serve as your anchor points. Uh, in reality, what happens is, and I'd seen this myself when I went uh, uh, on a bridge, 
20 years does a lot to a concrete deck. It's not uh, easy to find out where that embed is or even be able to distinguish it from everything else uh, that's around it. And many times the workers who work there, they go by trial and error. I think it is here, so let me start drilling. And the next thing you know, you hit uh, something else. So based on this understanding, we developed a two-phased uh, process to try and address uh, uh, an issue like this. And I'm showing these two things uh, here in this uh, row here and the second row here. The first one uses uh, detailed as-built scanning and modeling of the rebar and any utilities that you eventually don't want to uh, strike or hit later on when the concrete is on top of it. So the basic idea there is you're going to create a model of the obstructions that will be under the concrete and essentially model that as a grid structure. And once there is now some new work to be done, for example, drilling on this surface, you are going to track the drill or the jackhammer or whatever device it is accurately, and the system can automatically tell you whether, whether you are in a clear zone, one of these cells, or there is something else <laughs> below. The second approach we also uh, explored uh, in this regard is to use uh, uh, a laser projected augmented reality. In other words, if you imagine this to be the surface of concrete and there is rebar under, if we have a detailed model and are able to georeference it with the coordinate frame of the bridge, we can project where obstructions lie under it so that now whoever is working can be cognizant of what obstructions are uh, below. So this is just a very brief uh, uh, overview of the uh, drill tracking uh, uh, system in perspective. So, uh, sorry. Uh, what we have is um, a situation where uh, we know where the utilities and obstructions are buried. We create a grid model of obstructions. From that point on, track in detail uh, the end effector of the equipment that is to work there and provide real-time feedback to the worker whether it's safe or unsafe or whether any kind of lateral movement is uh, needed. So let me now uh, try to conclude with uh, talking very little about uh, some recent innovations in robotic concrete construction that we are foreseeing. Uh, we have uh, heard a lot about innovations in 3D printing, so I won't speak much to that. And we'll only say that uh, as researchers at the University of Michigan, we are very interested in this line of work, uh, largely in collaboration with Professor McGee and the Fab Lab here. And last but not least, we also think that uh, uh, modular construction can take on a whole different shape and form, uh, particularly through a project like uh, digital Lego-inspired construction that is led by our very own Professor uh, Victor Lee here. So we have just one more thing to uh, show you before we conclude, and that's this uh, short video about how we think industry is going to adapt to such changes. So I play that now. Has long been criticized for stagnation and lack of progress. As an industry, we've been constructing buildings using the same means and methods for decades and lack the advancements that have been realized by the manufacturing industry, for example. We are finally entering the transformation. As a company, we're developing software that will design complex systems in seconds. We're investing in robots that can lay a thousand bricks a day. We're planning projects so that we know where every material and piece of equipment is in real time. We're creating 3D models of projects with drones where the entire site is accurate to the inch and putting technology in the hands of builders instead of just computer experts. And the lift build team are literally turning construction upside down. And it's just the beginning. So in summary and conclusion, I think uh, as researchers and uh, you know, industry, we are both very interested in seeing where the trends of prefabrication versus on-site construction go, uh, how far advanced mobile and adaptive construction robots can get, and uh, you know, are particularly keen to see what the potential disruption from 3D printing of construction methods uh, come along. So I'll have uh, Matt have the last word on this on what he thinks about industry.
Yeah, so I, I found it fascinating this morning. You know, I think, you know, being from the industry, we, we often think about, you know, kind of post to what was talked a lot about today. Um, you know, we, we get a project and we're assigned to go and figure out how to build it, you know, on budget, within schedule. Uh, so it was very enlightening. I, I, you kind of saw that video from, from Bart and Mella to talk about, you know, kind of our stance and what we think we have control of and, and kind of on the, on the construction side. But uh, again, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be here. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you guys and really learned a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, if I could ask all the speakers to join me up here, we'll have a brief panel discussion. I think Vinny has to leave. That's okay. Yeah, yeah he's got to leave. So I felt that was a particularly diverse group of presentations, so it actually kind of covered the spectrum of, you know, a lot of contemporary topics that we're very interested in, I think was kind of the goal of, of the symposium. I wanted to kind of start out with a little bit of a question for um, Matt. The, um, you know, I'm, we have a lot of industry representatives here, and, and I think it's a big um, interest in how we deploy these methods to the construction site, and I wanted to ask, what methods of collaboration do you see between the construction industry and the academic research labs that, that work best? I mean, what are the modes of not only collaborating, but also working, you know, through a project, you know, whether that be funded research or just co-engaged research that, that has the potential to get some of these quite advanced, maybe far yeah. future yeah. ideas sure. out to a construction site? Sure. Um, I think, quite frankly, it starts with, you know, opportunities like this. Um, I think we're never going to get to where we want to go, like, you know, in silos. I think it has to be exactly what you just described. You know, I, I certainly don't have a recipe or don't claim to have a recipe to say this is exactly how it's going to happen. But, you know, hopefully with, um, you know, dates like today where we can, you know, meet new people and have these discussions, you know, we'd love to continue to have uh, have the partnership with, with the folks at the University of Michigan. and. Um, continue to do our part, certainly. Um, and from your experience, uh, what do you think sometimes is lacking from academia to make the collaboration really effective for you? What do we sometimes miss from the academia? I would almost throw it back on, on you know, kind of industry. I don't think it's academia. I, I, I really don't. I think, you know, that, that curve that Vineet threw up, that says it all, right? That, that was just a hook to try to say what you say. Hey, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I got it. But, yeah, I, I, think, I think, hey, I think, ooh, hey, we like to say at Barton Mellow that we're, we, we like to think different and we like to think innovative. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's uh, it's a challenge, and we, we even you know experience that internally. You know, I always say two people. You know, people are afraid of change and afraid of technology. You know, well, there is the well-known uh, so-called valley of death uh, between R and D in academia and industry. Mm -hmm. Right, there's a gap there. Uh, sometimes what we learn in our laboratory are uh, ultimately not transferred into the market. So uh, in construction, this, this uh, value of that is particularly deep, in, in my opinion, sure. uh, compared to other industries. Uh, what would you like to see from us, from academia, uh, you know, in order to make that bridging? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's really, it's, it, it comes down to communication and partnership, right? Like a, a lot of the things just, again, through, through this opportunity with Vineet, a lot of the things that he was studying and talking about were really eye-opening to me. And I, probably otherwise wouldn't have known about it, you know? Um, so somehow we gotta collectively figure out how do we communicate better and, and, you know, maybe we can host things at our office to have, you know, similar type discussions and then vice versa. Yeah, the, just picking up on that, Shadi, uh, you mentioned something that really kind of, kind of stuck with me. It's something I think, feel like I've worked my whole kind of academic career working on, but it was really around the importance of engaging architecture and design early 
in the development of, of new construction processes. I mean, traditionally, architects worked at one end and delivered shop drawings, and, and someone else built the project. But I think, at least in the academic end, there's been this kind of resurgence of interest in how the building gets built and really understanding that process. And how have you seen in your work, especially with um, NASA, that how that importance of keeping architecture at the table translates to the eventual success of the technology? Yeah, I think uh, the, uh, a lot of architects, or the way I um, was trained at least, was that you design and then you assign materials and things like that, but that doesn't work anymore. I mean, for example, for me, I need to start thinking about material, in fact, designing of the material. And so all of it comes together. You need to think about um, the whole process and everything involved from the um, beginning. And so I think the use of BIM uh, platform also, uh, expanding that to include optimization, to include analysis, um, you know, to, to bring that too during the construction. Everything needs to work together. Yeah, and I also think that touches upon what another thought I had is this idea of the disciplinary silos, which traditionally have kept these things stuck in the lab because we're all looking at our specific problems when, you know, the other fields could help solve that. I mean, does anybody want to comment on how that's changed, I guess, over recent years? Are we, are we more siloed or are we less siloed? I'll say something. I think that the, the project and the collaboration that Victor and I have uh, been working on for the past couple of years is an example of where we took somewhat siloed research areas and were able to cross that. It's in the same department, but um, I'm a geochemist. I, a couple of years ago, I didn't really know that much about cement materials. And I think in, in combining my experience in carbon mineralization with Victor's experience in designing new materials, we're actually able to optimize the, the production of a, a, you know greener, functional products uh, in unique ways. Yeah, unfortunately, I believe that in academia, we have been much too much become silos and separate disciplines. So in our department, it's called civil and environmental engineering, and Brian is in the envir environmental engineering side, and I'm on the civil. So it occurs to me that uh, in many situations, uh, civil engineers build the built environment, and the environmental engineers come back to fix the problem that we cause. <laughs> and that, of course, is not the most efficient way. Uh, that's, that was one of the origins of our trying to break that mold to collaborate across disciplines. You know, I might add, I'm, I'm kind of a fish out of water here, but um, even, even within NASA, after the moon landings and everything kind of went stagnant for a while, uh, they tended to start siloing there as well, and you'd have a propulsion group and a stages group, and when they came together, lo and behold, the engines didn't fit on the stages, and so they started assigning systems engineering to, to fix that problem. Um, now, now they're coming back around, and we're finding, for example, on, on my team, very multidisciplinary robotics, computer science, planetary geology, mechanical engineering, and that's the only way a project of this kind of magnitude will ever be successful is, is so I have uh, good feelings about that compared to say 15 years ago. So I would even add that to your credit and TN and other organizers of this conference it's really a, a multidisciplinary platform that allows us to talk um, in a language hopefully that both communities can uh, understand each other and uh, I see <laughs> uh, Sarah over there is also a very good example. She used to work, well, we used to work together on uh, construction materials, particularly on the bendable concrete high shots. So, <laughs> and I can see her from her talk that she's really very much into the built environment, the human building connection side. Um, to me, I think this is a, a proper, the, 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 the right direction to go. But we need mu much more of that. Agreed. Also. So I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience and see where Ash is ready to go here. Uh, I have a question for Matt. Uh, where do you see uh, good opportunities for augmented reality in construction? Um, I think there, there's, there's a lot of opportunity. I think it's one of those, those technologies that it's, um, 
it's new, right? It's it's kind of scary. Um, so let me let me talk about kind of augmented reality and then virtual reality, kind of in in tandem. Um, augmented reality, we're starting to see where. Um, there's companies that, that I've actually spoke to and had conversations with where they're starting to put um, like the hollow lens on to tie rebar. Um, I've seen where they're, they're doing like uh, interior metal frame walls, bottom track and top track and laying studs out uh, all within the hollow lens. Um, so I think there's opportunities there. Um, again, I think we're our own worst enemy sometimes where we're just so afraid of technology. I think it's just over time, and it hasn't gotten better. Um, you know, I don't want to sound cliche, but I, I say all the time, I don't know if I'm determined or stupid. I haven't figured out yet. But it, it takes a lot of that determination to constantly, you know, you try something and it fails, try it again with a different person. Sometimes it's just that right person at the right time, and you, you start to build off of those successes. Um, in terms of virtual reality, we're starting to um, really look for opportunities where we can work with um, VR companies to do things like safety training. So when you have young people that come into the into the industry that have never stepped foot on a job site before, how do you kind of start to immerse them in that space and start to help them um, with those tools so that when they get out in the in the actual job site, they know they know what to look for. It may not be exactly how it looked on a on a on a screen, but they're at least a lot more aware than they were before. So the question is simply uh, for the Bard Mallow rep, with the uh, modeling for the construction sequencing that you use to develop your proposals with, are you using the architectural Revit documents or BIM documents as a basis, or are you creating your own? Um, the latter, most of the time. Uh, again, that's, I think, another challenge in our industry. Everybody's very hesitant to share that in a lot of cases. So oftentimes we're... we're um, you know, I'm in a room full of engineers and architects, so I'm going to be careful what I say. <laughs> um, you know, I, hey, I think sometimes, um, in, in defense to the architects and engineers, their schedules, just like ours, are getting condensed, and their margins are getting less and less, right? So you're, you're still asked to do the same amount in less time and for cheaper, right? So sometimes the quality of those models force us to use some of it and then build off of that, not use it at all, or they're not willing to share it. So we're forced to redo it from scratch. So are you, are you involved more with CMR or in, uh, IPD in terms of project delivery, where you're collaborating with the architect and yep. engineers earlier on, so you're part of that team? Yep, yep. So in those cases, yes, we're able to collaborate and get that. But in a typical, you know, rip and read kind of, you know, hard dollar bid job, it's, it's usually the latter that we have to create our own. Um, I have a question about the NASA work, um, and um, I have a colleague that's doing something kind of similar to the lunar Crete, but, um, so I should probably know the answer, but I'm wondering, especially with the 3D printing, where would all the energy come from? Like, I know you're not working on that, but I'm curious, like, it seems especially like sintering or something would need a lot of energy. Oh, no, exactly right. Um, you know, for years, any, anything we've done on the planetary surface has been solar power, um, and, and while techniques for, for solar energy are getting better, um, and anybody who's seriously thinking about the kinds of activities that we're talking about, running 3D printing and building structures and then operating within those structures, um, NASA has for years uh, developed and tested small um, nuclear reactors uh, that, that have been tested, um, have been launched. Um, there's always a public perception about the safety of those, but it's, um, within the agency, I think they're very comfortable with the use of them and, and nuclear power would be the way we would, uh, it would be isolated. We would probably actually 3D print a, a, a berm or a container that the reactor would be located in. Um, at least that's one of the rationale we've used for 3D printing. But um, I, think, I think nuclear power is the way to go. question for the NASA team. As, as I understand it, 
many of our marvelous uh, technological developments were, were spurred by the space program and particularly by the, the race to the moon. Uh, what, what are the chances that history is going to repeat itself here and that uh, you folks are, are, are going to use the, uh, the moon and the Mars as, as the way to, uh, to show us uh, the way the future is going to be here on Earth? Um, so the, the motivation to go to the moon the first time was political. Um, and, but it was sufficient to get the country behind it, at least for a short amount of time. But even before the first landing, public perception was already turning against the expenditures. Um, NASA is its own worst enemy, I think, in terms of self-marketing. The number, the, you know, everybody thinks Tang and Velcro. Um, the, 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 I mean, it's sad. Um, the, the technology development that took place to go to the moon and since then is absolutely remarkable and it's prevalent everywhere. Um, Anything, um, um, you know, when farmers are out uh, evaluating their crops and they're using satellite communications uh, to, to evaluate, that's all, that was all developed for the space program. The miniaturization of electronics was all driven by the space program. Um, so if you think about it, I mean, if you really get into it, there's more than enough technolo technological motivation to, to go back um, because now, you know, if we're going back, we need to go back to stay which means the technology advancements will be even more significant. They have to be almost by definition. So, I, I, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, and my, my comments were, were entirely positive and affirmative, and I'd just like to thank you for leading the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell all my friends. <laughs> So now I'll ask the dystopian question. <laughs> Since I hang out with architects too much, probably, as an engineer. Um, in the context of CO2 sequestration, um, are, I'm curious about the, balance, the net balance, first of all, in the bendable concrete. This is more specific to that project. But then if and when we go to the moon, will it be because we haven't sequestered enough carbon and we just need a new place to live? Or are we really motivated to go there before that? That's more like a hypo hypothetical. Well, that's a really good question, and, it's, and I don't have the, the real technical background regarding carbon sequestration to address that part of it. But I, I believe the reason to go back to the moon is, is a more philosophical one of, of we're humans, we need to explore. Um, I know it sounds like motherhood and apple pie, but I think the majority of people who work in the space program really feel that way. And we get wrapped up in the bureaucracy uh, like everybody else does, and it's frustrating sometimes. But um, the moon is an excellent place to learn how to live. I mean, there are those that would argue that we're going to destroy ourselves in, you know, in a number of years, and we have to be able to be living somewhere else by then. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know about that, but um, I do feel like we need to have, um, we need to be able to live on other planets. Um, I think the moon is, a, is the next logical step. Uh, if we can live on the moon, it's easier to live on Mars. You've got communications delays and issues, but the moon is a much harsher environment to live in than Mars is. Um, and um, whatever the rational, we know that, for example, for deep space missions, if we can ex if we can extract oxygen from water, oxygen and hydrogen from water on the moon, and put that in low lunar or, or lunar orbit, then it's a logical way station to refuel on our way to somewhere else, Mars or somewhere else, and it really reduces the impacts of launch lo launch mass on Earth. Um, so. Mike, that's my thought. Can, can you repeat your question on the carbon sequestration aspect? Well, yeah, I could rephrase. So, on the sequestration part and the content, how do we address? And you are doing a great job. I'm very excited about the work. It obviously addresses the things that we talked about this morning in terms of reinforcement and sequestration. But one of the um, sort of mental experiments I always do about sequestration in concrete is. When you make concrete, half of the emissions are chemical emissions and half are from the heat to make the cement, right? And then when carbonation happens, it's actually the chemical part kind of coming back in, right? Yeah. Um, so in this dystopian scenario I set up, one of the experiments I always think about is if we all just stopped having an industrialized society, how much CO2 gets sequestered by the buildings just because we, they're sitting there reabsorbing all their CO2. And so for me that also, points out the fact that when you do carbon accounting, oh. 
if you guys are still making new cement to make your cement, yeah. then you're not really sequestering, right? So the new cement doesn't make sequestration. It's actually only the cement we've already made that can sequester, but it can, it can never make up for all the emissions that it originated with. So it's more of like, a, I always have this question of how do we account for across the whole time scale of when things get emitted and when they get sequestered. And, yeah. So there, there are trends in the research community and uh, progressively moving into practice of greening the binder, uh, replacing the Portland cement, for example, by porcelains, and further, as I pointed out earlier, by, um, for example, LC3, uh, which is a uh, material from limestone, calcine, lime, calcine clay and limestone mixed with Portland cement. So those will be uh, effectively reducing the embodied carbon uh, in the material. And then plus the carbon sequestration. Uh, we are not quite there yet, but the dream is to eventually get to carbon negative concrete. I, I, I believe that's what you are shooting for, but I, yeah, we're not quite there yet, but that's what we're aiming at. And, and one of the aspects, potentially thinking about life cycle emissions, is if you have more durable materials or you have materials that you can reconfigure to construct new things, then you can close the loop. Basic, right, you know, right now we, we build a building, and when we want a new building, we just knock the old one down and put a new building in with all new materials. And so if you can move away from that, where you have reconfigurable concrete structures, um, or you just have materials that don't need to be replaced as often, you can at least, relative to current state-of-the-art practice, um, have much lower life cycle emissions. Yeah, th this point is particularly important in transportation infrastructures, roads and bridges. Uh, much of the carbon and energy footprints occurs in the operations and maintenance, particularly the repair activity, uh, as opposed to the carbon or energy embodied in the material itself. Um, so if we can make uh, our infrastructures with materials that are much more durable, extending service life by doubling or tripling or even uh, quadrupling, uh, we would be able to reduce a lot of the carbon footprint. So uh, in my mind, is reducing carbon in our built environment is not just a matter of greening the material, but it's actually every stage of the life cycle of our infrastructure, from material to construction to operations and maintenance and end of life. Uh, in, regarding the end of life, I might just add that uh, Vinit was showing very quickly a picture of the Lego type construction. So that's an idea that we borrow from Lego toys and Lego toys kids play so that one day they make a train, the next day they disassemble it quickly, rapidly, and then reassemble it into, uh, let's say, a, a building. Um, and so this is totally rapid assembly, rapid disassembly, and reconfigurable. And that allows us to have full reuse, not just recycle. Recycle generally means destroying the material and downgrade it. Uh, but we can, there is a possibility that we can uh, reuse the, those Lego blocks. Now, one of the criteria, of course, is normal concrete is impossible to connect them uh, by dry joining because uh, if you use nuts and bolts, they fracture at the joint because the material is brittle. But ECC offers that possibility that we can do dry joining and rapid joining and disassemble and rapid uh, reconfiguration. So those are the kind of things that we are thinking about. We are not quite there yet, uh, but those are ideas that we are toying among ourselves. We're working hard on those. All right, uh, my question is in regards to the uh, ductile concrete. And uh, I'm just curious, you said that uh, ECC could um, once you bend it, it cracks at 15 micron thicknesses, and then uh, as it, it is exposed to water and atmosphere, it heals itself. So I'm just curious if, if that, uh, the more that happens, uh, does that dis disintegrate the process? Uh, the more it cracks and the more it heals, is there a disintegration in the process, or is, it, is that a perpetual retractive process that it could cyclically occur? And uh, 
you know, basically I'm asking about the longevity of the ductile concrete. Yeah. So I think you're, I think you're asking about the longevity of repeated healing. Is that, uh, yeah. So we we do not have enough experience to say that it will be infinite <laughs> uh, cycles of self healing, but we do have experience in the laboratory of observing self healing uh, under multiple cycles. Uh, how much it will heal uh, depends on the level of damage and the type of exposure environment. For example, uh, just humidity compared to wet and drying or just total immersed uh, are different. So um, the answer is a little bit more nuanced. Uh, it's not so easy to reply. But uh, basically, we expect that at least to for common normal usage, uh, multiple cycles of rehealing is feasible. And one of the things to keep in mind too is it, it's not just is it did it regain its original strength, but when you have those cracks form and then heal, you regain the low permeability of the matrix, which effectively can prevent the ingress of other you know chloride or sulfate materials that are going to be. Uh, have a negative impact on the longevity of the material. So it's, it sort of helps in both those ways. So I'm kind of curious if, um, with the self-healing concrete, if is the, mechan is the material of the self-healing mechanism you're using dependent upon the environment, or does its reactivity or, or performance just depend on the environment? Would, would you change, if you knew you were operating in a dry environment, would you use a different material than if you were immersed? We can, yeah. Okay. So in general, we can tune the material. So one of the characteristics of ECC is that it's not just a single material, but it's more like a family of materials yeah. with the common denominator that they are all ductile, like metallic behavior under mechanical loading. Uh, but the exact composition depends on what application. Uh, and what type of exposure environment. So for example, there are versions of ECC that are deliberately designed to be very lightweight. Uh, our st students actually use it to build concrete canoes, uh, which are extremely lightweight. Um, and then there are versions of those that are built for very rapid hardening, high early strength, uh, and so on. So we can also tune the composition to the requirement of the if we are expecting a certain different type of environment, uh, we might be able to tune that. Very good, thank you. So if there's no further questions, if there is, we have time. Oh, okay. Uh, just a quick one on operational matters. Um, there's all this vertical uh, association with things we're familiar with, whether it's materials or systems, but uh, what about lateral, and I'm thinking um, more in terms of AR and VR in the aeronautical industry, um, mechanics? I mean, they've been using these techniques very effectively. Do you go across and have a look at what they're doing? Yeah. So, so short answer, yes. Hmm. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned, for sure. Um, you know, Daiquiri is one um, company out there. They had the, you know, the smart hard hand hard hat that they were trying to get into the industry and then they came out with the goggles and then um, last I heard that uh, that went away. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot to learn from different industries, but certainly. Speaking about training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay well, we'll break for coffee. Please join me in thanking our presenters one more time.
All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Let's take a seat, please, so we can stay on schedule. So welcome to the third session today. My name is Sasha Zivkovic, and I'm an assistant professor of architecture at Cornell University. And I will be moderating the session because unfortunately Glenn Wilcox cannot join us as a moderator today. And I, look, I very much look forward to the three presentations which will all revolve around aspects of academia and industry collaboration. Our first presentation is titled Additive Manufacturing for Geometrically Complex Concrete Formwork by Manja Age Mebodi and Fabian Meyer Bertz. Manja is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of Michigan Taubman College. Her research focuses on developing computational design methods and innovative ways of employing digital fabrication to create smart building elements. Today, she will present a project she has been leading at the Digital Technologies ETH Zurich. Fabian is the head of 3D construction printing at the Perry GmbH in Germany, one of the largest manufacturers of formwork and scaffolding solutions in the world. Fabian's work revolves around paving the way for a broader application of 3D printing in industrial practice and bringing state-of-the-art technology to real-world construction sites. Please help me welcome Manja and Fabian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to make this very short. Concrete is used dramatically in every project. Uh, in fact, this is the second most used material after the water, and the, it uh, is the source of about 8% of uh, carbon dioxide in the world. In the next 80 years, we're going to build more than 2 billion new homes. We are asking how to do it without sinking our planet. Uh, we should be using less concrete, obviously. Um, this is not very easy because the way we built today is just like the way we used to build uh, 100 years ago. Basically, we are facing a, a challenge of um, fast-growing building industry with lack of digitization. Um, here we see a quick example of what formwork looks like in its most innovative fashion. It's a lightweight formwork that can be used for basically every application, be it walls, slabs, or foundations. Um, but we see that this is a standard formwork while it's modular and can be configured. The shapes are still rather straight and we use a lot of concrete. Um, if we go to more complex projects like the National Veterans Memorial Museum in Columbus, Ohio, then we see how complex formwork shapes get. So we can do more complex shapes, but then it gets exceedingly expensive a lot of time and it's not applicable to a very large um, variety of projects. Um, so we are working uh, at, to overcome these challenges. We are working at the intersection of computational design, CNC fabrication, and material processes. 3D printing is a game changer. It's going to change the way we're going to design and build in future. Because it builds material layer by layer, uh, it offers unprecedented freedom of uh, form in high resolution and mass customization with no extra cost. So in the next project, we will show you how we use 3D printing to augment the large-scale manufacturing of concrete elements and the construction of concrete itself. So one approach that one can take and that was um, spoken about uh, in several presentations uh, along the day is the printing of concrete itself. So one can imagine if you figure out how to do this on a large scale, um, and we also figure out how to actually put reinforcement in an automatic fashion in that, we as a company that produces formwork, we would have a big problem. Hence, we've been active in this field for quite a while and, and want to push this technology forward. Um, this is um, a picture of the first 3D printed building in Europe, which was done by a company called 3D Print who in Denmark. Uh, they are now called a company called Cobot, which uh, Perry invested in a while back. And ever since, we've jointly been working on how to make this technology happen in a, in a broader scale. 
Um, this was two and a half years ago, actually, and at that time it, it took us two months to do this small house. Um, and I just want to show you very quickly where this has been going. I mean, we've talked about three con concrete printing in several presentations today, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, so I just touched up on that uh, two and a half years ago. It took us a couple of months, and uh, the machine was a prototype. The cabling was a mess. Uh, the machine hasn't ever heard of any safety features. And now we come to this machine, which is now a safety certified machine that automatically calibrates itself and has all the nice features that you want from a full-fledged industrial machine. And we did the same building, and it took us three days. And we believe if we would do it a third time, it um, would take us um, about 10 hours to do that. Um, so it's really about bringing this to a more industrial scale. Um, we're going to put one of these printers after we have one in, in Denmark, one in Germany, and one in Dubai. We're going to put one of these big large-scale printers uh, to the U.S. in the beginning of next year and are also going to build up a team um, around using this technology. We have the, the focus on making contact with the real world as soon as possible. Um, if we stack a couple of layers of concrete on top of each other, that's very nice, but it's still uh, quite far away from having actually a house or a structure. There's lots of other parts that we need to figure out to do that, and that's what we want to do. Um, but these structures, also the size of the printer, uh, they're not really the application of formwork. Formwork is for big, steel reinforced concrete structures. And here we see less to or no to little reinforced structures. Um, so we need a different approach if we really want to address the challenge of reducing concrete in steel reinforced structures. So instead of printing the concrete itself, uh, we focus on uh, employing additive manufacturing for uh, producing the formwork. Uh, one of the technology that we've been using both in industry and academia was uh, binder jetting technology. This is uh, where it binds sand layer by layer by depositing uh, the uh, liquid bonding agents. And what you see there is the bonded material. We like this technology because it offers the biggest and largest uh, geometric freedom and resolution. Uh, it also exists in the large scale. This one is Voxeljet 3D printer, four by two by one meter. Basically means we don't have to build a new facility to have binder jetting technology. So the first project I'm going to show you, uh, uh, it's a Swiss pavilion at Venice Biennale, designed by Christian Carrots and uh, realized and rationalized by us at uh, Digital Building Technology. Um, this is uh, not a cave. So this is an interior of Swiss Pavilion in 2016 made of concrete, glass fiber reinforced concrete. And you might be surprised to know that a five meter high pavilion is made of only 20 millimeter thick concrete. If you scale this down to an egg size, the shell dimension or thickness is less than the egg shell thickness. What you see here is uh, the formwork. We develop computational method to generate the formwork automatically for any given freeform geometry, and this is very significant. Um, you need a lot of computation to be able to produce the formwork for, for such geometries. Uh, this is the back side of the formwork, which is 3D sand printed, and the front side of the formwork where the glass fiber reinforced concrete was sprayed on. Now, I would like to show you two other projects where we use computation to design for material optimization and 3D printing to produce uh, the stain place formwork, which was uh, unbuiltable otherwise. And these projects are uh, extensively collaborative. We collaborated with research uh, team at material uh, science team. What you see here is human femur that shows uh, the, the, where, where, where the stresses are. The tissues are placed, basically distribution of the bone tissue in accordance with the uh, stresses within the bone. Uh, what we are doing here is, uh, this is the first slab where we, where we design it based on topology optimization, based on four load case, uh, basically um, generating a form for the loads and the forces that exist within the slab. 
This is the 3D printed formwork. Uh, the formwork itself is only six millimeter. And uh, after it was like uh, the sand, the loose sand was removed, removed we uh, cast ultra high performance fiber reinforced concrete in the formwork, which then gives us the composite of uh, concrete and sandstone. What you see here is the slab from below, where you can obviously see the material is placed only where the forces are, uh, are and where the stresses are. While in a solid concrete, uh, with the same bounding, we will need 270 liters of concrete, in this slab, we only use 50 liters of con concrete, which basically means we reduce the concrete consumption by 80%. That's a lot. Uh, the next slab, which I'm not going to go through the computation as we don't have much time here, um, is, is made for three uh, load case uh, and three support. Uh, we also couldn't build this one with any other fabrication method than 3D printing. Uh, you couldn't do it with milling. It was produced in uh, an hour, basically a magnitude faster than if you would have milled. Um, so now that, that Mania has shown kind of the cutting edge technology, what you can do with a 3D printed formwork, um, we as a formwork supplier and manufacturer are then left with the nitty gritty pieces to make this work on construction sites of a larger scale where we don't have highly trained uh, professionals that have been part of the process of design and manufacturing, but you, normal construction workers that we provide the formwork with and then they have to kind of figure it out. Um, so there's a couple of these small problems, um, and one of them is, for example, that whenever we have complex shapes, in some point or another, this complex shape will then merge into a straight line or in a not uh, very freeform shape, maybe a single curved shape. So we will come from a very complex, potentially 3D printed form to a standard formwork panel. Um, usually what architects and designers then would like to see is that the concrete surface is of the same color no matter what formwork you've used. However, the formwork has a large um, impact on concrete color. So this is something that we've, we've tested here with different formwork panels, uh, with different coatings, with, uh, for example, epoxy resin or polyurea coatings on wood and on 3D printed parts. And so we had this nice little checker pattern going on and uh, tried to, to use that as a formwork. And also what always comes up is, um, I mean, now we've had a couple of examples of slabs, but if you wanna do a big vertical structure, the concrete pressure is, as you all probably know, is rather high. And uh, the question is, can a 3D printed material even withstand that concrete pressure? The answer is pretty easy. Yes, it can. Um, we've done that a couple of times, so it can also be repeated, um, which is also important for real-world construction projects. And you can't see the, the checker pattern, but you can see that some of them, um, you can't really tell the difference if it was a coated 3D printed formwork piece or a wooden formwork panel. So we can achieve um, basically the, the, the hybrid forms. Um, another of these small nitty gritty problems that come up is uh, something very simple. Can you drill it? Can you put a screw in it? Can you glue it? What happens if you put a, a hammer falls down on the formwork? Can you then repair it? So these nitty little gritty problems we had to figure out and there's lots of 3D printed materials around and uh, you have to have different solutions in your portfolio for that. So with the sand print that uh, is epoxy infiltrated, that works very well and really has all the, the needed properties for use uh, on construction site. Um, we've done that and uh, even further, so we you built this big formwork piece and gave it to construction workers and told them go ahead, um, connect it as you usually would do it. So we see the double curved structure here coated in white and next to it, which is a uh, only a singly curved structure is uh, a wooden formwork. And both of them connected then come up to something like this where we see traditional formwork which everybody knows how to use combined with a 3D printed formwork. And what comes out is something like that where we again see that the formwork color um, is, is perfectly fine. The vibration of the concrete as you can, might see was a little bit 
uh, of a problem. Um, in, in the real world, this piece would actually have been turned upside down, so it would be a nice architectural piece uh, for our uh, purposes where we didn't want to put too much rebar in it. If it was just a mock-up, we turned it upside down. So it's a very big piece, and we're actually, so that again shows you that uh, 3D printed formwork can be used for real world applications. So FDM is another uh, 3D printing technology that we employed for production of formwork. Uh, I would like to show you the uh, work that we are right now doing at Topman College. Uh, what you see on the left side is 3D printed thermoplastic formwork, and the right side, the, uh, the corresponding concrete elements. We've done this with the students at uh, digital, uh, DMT. Uh, and right now we are expanding the research together with um, Wes Mackey uh, to explore how to develop formwork using robotic, how to explore the material or what kind of material can we really print, what is the scale that we can go for production of thermoplastic formwork. Uh, and again, we, we thought about how can we use that uh, on, on site and what's the, the, the purpose of, of having these, these uh, thermoplastic formwork panels is uh, rather obvious. We can integrate some functionality and not just design into it. Uh, we can integrate cable ducts. Uh, we can integrate lighting, lightning elements directly in, in the formwork. Um, but again, it's about connecting these pieces. You can see that it was a rather complex issue. And uh, the thermoplast, if it's not a round shape that we're doing, it would be very difficult in regard to the concrete pressure. But for round shapes, it actually worked out um, rather nicely. And uh, we didn't make a mess. It, it withstood uh, the concrete pressure. Nobody had to get the shovels out and, and start cleaning up the, the concrete. And here you can see the, the final piece upside down. Um, why did we uh, cast it out again? We wanted to obviously check the part at the bottom if it can withstand the concrete pressure and not print the whole thing. That's the final piece also. Um, so uh, the last project that I would like to share with you is the first real world uh, slab made from 3D printed formwork, but also involved multiple digital fabrication methods. Uh, this work is to enormous extent is a collaboration. Uh, here you see the team, uh, our industry partner, and uh, the involved leading investigators. We wanted to design a slab that uses material only where it, where it needs it, integrates the building services, also expresses the, uh, uh, the potential of 3D printing. This is an early sketch of the uh, slab in its contact, the fab house. That's the slab in the middle that you see. Uh, the slab is 78 square meter, uh, cantilevers from uh, S-shaped wall. It supports a two-story uh, timber frame structure right above it. Again, here computation uh, is a key. We develop set of in-house uh, computation tools to generate grip layout based on the load that comes above to explore design variation, calculate concrete, and the weight of the slab, which are necessary and significant to communicate with the parties involved in the project. From this model, we also generated all the data needed for fabrication, including the 3D printed formwork data. What you see here uh, is the formwork segment. As uh, you may observe, it's made of many puzzles of different parts. Uh, the CNC uh, plywood uh, section, the rebar that are bended previously, uh, and the 3D printed formwork itself in gray. Here you would see the 3D printed parts. We had more than 181 3D printed formwork that came together so perfectly to, put, to create one segment for a concrete element. Then uh, for that segment, the, fiber, uh, fi uh, the glass fiber reinforced concrete was sprayed on the formwork, um, from which a 20 millimeter shell of concrete, uh, concrete surface was created. And immediately right after, we had the assembled timber formwork uh, on top of it. This timber formwork already uh, contained the rebars and post-tensioning cables, which would be then used, uh, the formwork would then be used for casting the concrete for the structural part of the uh, slab. Here you see the assembly of concrete segment on the, on the side. Assembly took only three to four days. It was quick because everything was very precise. Uh, you see how thin the slab is in most part. Uh, the slab weighs only 60%, basically 60% less than uh, a, a normal slab that would stand there instead of this one. 
Um, you also can see the weight that are prefabricated for sending the wires and the pipes throughout the slab. This is the ceiling side of the slab and uh, very uh, filigreed concrete details uh, which also express we, we really reach the limit of what we can do with concrete and 3D printing. If we have time, I run a video. Do we have? Yes, I have three another minutes. three minutes. minutes. So. Yeah, no, really. Yeah. Yeah. Started at like eight minutes. Oh, I see. Okay. So uh, here you see the team, the design team, uh, also rationalization team. We did the design and rationalization of the whole geometry together. Uh, this is the uh, in-house software that was developed, integrated to the Grasshopper software that we have there. Um, a lot of 3D printing, small-scale 3D printing was happening to explore the form itself and the structural capability of the slab. This is the 3D printer that would print sand, uh, basically sandstone, binding it layer by layer. Uh, the uh, darker area is where the sand is bind. And this is the process of sand removal. Uh, all the parts are removed from the print box, then uh, the loose sand is removed. The parts are then sent for infiltration and uh, post-processing. All the other sections uh, which was produced by wood, uh, wood CNC, were CNC laser cut, but the 3D model uh, included both the CNC detail and 3D printed detailing in one file. And here is the assembly in the uh, casting company where the parts come together perfectly. Again, the handling of these parts are, as you pointed out, very important. Where are the holes can be drilled into these things or not because sand can break very easily. Um, yeah, here you would see the post-processing to make the form work in a way that you can remove it easily from concrete. Uh, the 20 millimeter uh, con glass fiber reinforced concrete was sprayed and then uh, the pre assembled wood modules were assembled right right on top of it. This had to be very quick in order for the concrete to have a great bond. Um, and removal of the sand form right. These are the final pieces, 11 prefabricated concrete segments. which were sent uh, to the site. So uh, just to summarize this project, uh, we achieved over 60% concrete reduction uh, through form optimization. We achieve a high uh, surface quality, high precision, and we produce a free form slab from 11 of a kind uh, concrete element. Integral computation is key. The 3D printing alone can't do much. We need to compute. We need to, to develop design method and design software for these tools. Um, the last, last slide, which is empty, I would like to say that we have shown multiple uh, projects uh, that uh, were only able or were, were only been able to be realized uh, through computational method that we developed. And uh, I would like to emphasize on computation more than just fabrication tools that we have. Uh, we have shown that additive manufacturing uh, will bring new opportunity for architecture and uh, architecture element and sustainability in future. Uh, this is a very disruptive and radical change that we will have. Um, these new technologies will come with less restriction for design and more freedom, yet it will demand from us designers to develop sufficient fabrication and computational method to exploit the potential of these technologies. We are also in a very exciting time. Um, there are a lot of changes. Uh, there is an urgent need to rethink the way we built. At the same time, we have a lot of technological 
development and advancement, it's a great time to explore, play, experiment, and I'm sure uh, our exploration will have a significant impact on the direction that our field will have in future and uh, our planet itself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. The second presentation today is titled Moving Mass by Brandon Clifford. Brandon is the director and co-founder of Matter Design and an assistant professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He mines knowledge from the past to design new futures and is best known for bringing me megalithic sculptures to life to perform tasks. And he will let us know about that right now. Uh, please help me welcome Brandon. Oh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Sasha. That was very nice. Um, today has been pretty amazing so far. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak with you. Uh, we've seen incredible collaborations between the academy and industry, uh, but also I think very much between the arts and the sciences. And there's something special happening here today. I think Wes and Tia, and you've done an amazing job. Uh, in particular, the first presentation of the day with Lucia and Forrest. Um, there's something that stuck with me and I think I'll remember for some time, which is the idea of morality of concrete and that we must think of the afterlife of these things. Um, but in thinking of the afterlife of them, it means that we all of us also must presume that they are alive. So architects operate under the false assumption that we build for eternity with materials that have 100-year lifespans. And this is a topic that I share uh, with great passion with you, so thank you very much. Um, I'm here to present a collaborative project today, which I will get to all the bodies that have been involved in this. Uh, while I'm a contemporary designer, the origins of this work are ancient. I've been fascinated with these wonders for the mystery and speculation that surround them, but also for their capacity to force us to think differently. And while there are archeologists and historians that rigorously address these same precedents, we, as a practice, are not in the game of trying to prove any truths about the past, uh, but we are invested in trying to mine that knowledge to project new futures. So this here, this is an image of um, <clears throat> Rano Raraku, which is uh, the quarry on Easter Island. Um, and you'll notice that these figures are buried halfway up to their uh, heads and because they are in the process of being transported to their final destination. Take note, they're standing, right? Um, they're staged and prepared for a journey. But this is the image that I think we as Westerners think that the intention of any designer would have for a statue, its final resting position, its stasis, I would call it its death. When the Dutch explorers first encountered the Rapa Nui, they asked them how their ancestors could have possibly moved these massive statues. And the Rapa Nui said, our ancestors did not move these statues. The statues walked themselves. And for centuries, this was dismissed. But it wasn't until 2012 that archaeologists were able to prove that, in fact, the Moai did walk, and they were transported standing, pivoting from side to side. So the statues are, in fact, engineered to walk by having a precise calibration between the form of the object and the center of mass. They have prescribed a behavior onto these static objects. Megalithic constructions all boil down to two essential principles. These challenges are how things are transported and how they were placed. And I would argue that these are two principles that we as architects today don't address. So for the past five years, I've been engaging a very dumb challenge of just getting big, heavy objects to move and stand vertically. Like this 16-foot-tall statue designed to walk horizontally and stand vertically. 
Uh, by the way, the impetus of this was a cross-disciplinary collaboration between Mark Jarzenbeck, who's a historian, and myself, uh, asking the question of how can we do a really silly studio project. This is an architecture studio project at MIT. Um, and that raised so many questions for me that uh, we tried to do it again. Uh, we produced this floating megalith that swims horizontally under the low bridges of the Charles River and then saturates its belly with the river water to stand vertically. Or, for instance, in collaboration with Simex Global R&D, um, trying to get this 4,000-pound behemoth to spring itself to life to dance on stage. In testing this problem over and over, we started to think about the perception of life in these objects, but also about how humans could engage with these inanimate beings. At this point, you're probably asking, like, what does this have to do with architecture? These are single objects. This is sculpture, art. Uh, but by engaging this problem of transportation and erection, we can start to ask the question about how some of these marvels were produced. Because on its own, any one of these stones would have the challenge of transportation and erection. But then layering in other problems, such as uh, this, raising the stakes beyond that to transportation and placement, getting into logics of assembly and construction. So more recently, we've been asking the question about how we could start to embed the behavior of assembly into the objects themselves. And this is an initiative in collaboration with Matter Design and Simex Global R&D. Uh, this is uh, the team at Simex Global R&D. Um, they are composed of a number of different disciplines, but I think the easiest way to think about this collaboration is that matter design is dedicated to form and computation, and this team is dedicated to material science and developing new strategies for embedding intelligence into these matters. So uh, Simex is extremely accomplished in innovating in materials, but they came to us to try and look for new perspectives, um, and I think we, we've been trying to deliver on that with some strange things. So we joined forces, um, and we've been just having the simple banner of embedding intelligence into the objects themselves. OK. So we'll, we'll, we'll go with this slide. That's fine. <laughs> um, there are really only two things that you need to be concerned about in trying to get objects to behave in a manner that you want. There's a center of mass, which I think we can all agree upon. This is an understood principle. But the center of curvature is a little bit more tricky. So let's just begin with the circle. The center of curvature is dead center, the geometric center of that circle. So if the center of mass and the center of curvature are coincidental, you have a wheel. But if you can displace the center of mass a distance from that, you can get that object to wobble back and forth because it produces a riding moment when the contact surface um, basically displaces those two force vectors. Now, if you get into more complex geometry, such as an ellipse, the resulting, we must have a, uh, you can see this is the center of curvature for that contact point, and this is the center of curvature for that contact point. So that means that as you roll this thing, the center of curvature is actually moving. The center of mass is obviously staying precisely where it is. Uh, but we, we have to start to think about inscribing behavior by controlling the location of that curve. When we start to think about folding in problems of assembly, we deal with two geometric constraints. One of them is the, the mobility surface, or the surface that comes into contact with the ground. That's really determining where that contact point is. Um, and the other concern that we have is the assembly geometries, or how things can start to nest with each other to make sure that you don't have collision problems in that process of assembly. When you start to layer in these other complex geometries to get details to nestle these objects together, uh, you start to distribute that location of the geometric center of mass. So we need a way to be able to pull that center of mass back to a precise location. And that's where the collaboration with Simex Global R&D has come in, where we're using two different densities of concrete that they've developed in any one of these pieces. So they, they can hit a range of densities quite precisely. And we use solver computation to essentially move the division plane uh, so that we can pull the center of mass where it needs to be. 
Um, and in the end, uh, we can produce, here you can see that division plane. Over here is the more dense concrete, and then this is the division plane. But there's this insertion of a tool. And you can see what Matt's doing here is actually providing two possible center of mass locations. So with the tool embedded, you have a wheel. And if you pull the tool out, you have a self-erecting object. And we've been experimenting with a variety of different objects that each have a variety of different behaviors. Some like to stand up, some like to stay horizontal, some like to spin. Um, and we're, we're getting into this moment of thinking about the choreography, chore choreography of how humans can engage with these things. Because ultimately, we're interested in designing not just for the final resting state, but for the complete life cycle of construction. These are, by the way, very heavy. They're, they, they look light, but they're very heavy. They're solid concrete objects. If a brick is designed for a mason to be able to pick up and place all day long with one hand, and a CMU is designed for two hands, these megalithic constructions allow us to decouple that association between deadlifting objects and the behavior of assembly. So right now, anything above a CMU, the construction industry assumes we're going to deadlift, so we need to start using fossil fuel burning equipment, heavy lifting equipment, cranes, et cetera. And we're wondering if we can start to embed behavior into this that we could upend challenges such as the tilt-up wall construction. The, the behavior of these things is quite strange because you think they have so much inertia that if you just grab them and you try and set them into place, uh, they really don't want to go. But you have to slowly apply constant pressure and guide them into place. So as opposed to thinking of a sweat equity, something that you would be uh, working throughout the day, you turn into a dance partner in trying to manage these things into their position. It becomes joyful. So here you can see some of the details. We're, we're wondering about a craneless, uh, mode of construction where we could impart less energy. Um, and it also means that if we can build in locations that don't have access to cranes, maybe rural conditions, uh, disaster relief scenarios, scenarios where we have to resort to tent construction as a, as, a, as a default strategy to engage. And we're wondering if we can get into some of the principles of mass and uh, thermal properties by lessening the burden of that labor. Uh, there's something else that's challenged us is that because these objects are easy to assemble, that means they're also easy to disassemble. I mean, potentially these objects are not destined for the landfill the way the rest of our concrete is cast. But the real contribution of this work falls outside of conventional evaluation criteria. That empirical evidence is an example. So for the moment, just think back to Easter Island. Because as those statues were designed to walk, from quarry to site. Um, there's a notion of spectatorship embedded into that. As spectacular as the Moai are for visitors today, you would have to imagine being there then. Because the real memorial is not the objects themselves, but it's the cultural ritual of bringing a stone to life. Concrete has a life. So in engaging this problem over and over again, we've been doing these experiments. Uh, it's really challenging us to think differently about architecture beyond the results and to encompass the entire lifespan from conception through transportation, assembly, as well as the afterlife. And we did that through a series of very dumb exercises that interrogated ritual, experience, theatricality, and play. By embracing the myth that stones are alive, we were able to reimagine construction, not as a site for labor, but as a site for wonder and whimsy. Thank you very much. I'll just plug one thing. So, by the way, for tonight at the exhibition, I went short, so I'll take the time. Um, we're going to do another experiment called Patty and Jan at the beginning of the exhibition uh, tonight. Uh, this is an experiment of megalithic assembly. It will be a performance, and it should be a lot of fun. It might fail, so bring safety glasses. Thank you. Thanks.
Um, thank you, Brendan. The third presentation is by Andrew Cudless. Andrew is a designer based in the San Francisco Bay Area, but not anymore, I heard, uh, where he's a professor at the California College of the Arts. In 2004, he founded Matsis, a design studio exploring emergent relationships between architecture, engineering, biology, and computation. Please help me welcome Andrew. won't turn off. Okay, um, thank you. Um, uh, those last two presentations were phenomenal. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show maybe a little less innovative um, <laughs> uh, the, the form work and the, the movement of those, the, the last two projects were just incredible. So thank you, Tian and uh, Wes, for the invitation to present uh, this fantastic conference. Uh, I want to begin by recognizing my partners in this project who haven't, weren't able to come today to co-present with me. Um, they, re they wrote the, um, uh, a paper with me and um, are basically co-authors on this presentation. So I'm gonna read this just to get, uh, kind of get their words um, uh, as well as my own. So Tina Florian uh, was the project architect, or project manager at Lake Flato. Uh, Chuck Neves was the project engineer at Architectural Engineers Collaborative and Josh Zabel was the project lead at Chrysler and Associates. So this presentation focuses on the design, engineering, and fabrication of an innovative tilt-up concrete structure using fiberglass composite molds. The design was produced through a small but multidisciplinary team that valued the integration of form, fabrication, and performance through the app application of biomimetic principles, computational design and fabrication, and original construction logics. So the BHP Pavilion um, is in San Antonio, Texas, and is the central outdoor classroom and community hub of Confluence Park. Um, let's see, which is, so Confluence Park is here, the actual Confluence is here, uh, the Confluence of San Antonio River, uh, the city of San Antonio, the downtown is just up here, and this is San Pedro Creek. Um, there were three primary uh, project objectives um, that the pavilion needed to satisfy that were driven by the needs of the client, a local nonprofit foundation <clears throat> that leads educational and artistic projects along the San Antonio River. The first objective was to create an educational venue that would integrate the architecture of the pavilion into the educational mission uh, of the park, which was to educate the community on the critical role of water in the regional ecosystem. The second objective was to create an iconic and inspiring uh, pavilion to help catalyze a new identity for this historically underappreciated and underinvested part of the city. Due to the relatively limited budget of the project, the final objective was to use the innovative fabrication uh, technologies and methods to lower the overall project costs while meeting the client's ambitious educational and aesthetic vision. When the final design team first met in, I think it was fall of 2014, uh, the client had already been working on the project for I think maybe even six years uh, previous to our hiring. 
and was very eager for the project to be completed as soon as possible. I was actually told, like, we want this in the ground in six months. Um, so with their years already on the project, the client was committed to creating a unique educational and community venue, but was also cognizant of their limited budget and the compressed construction schedule. Um, faced with these challenges, the design team focused on pre-rationalizing the geometry of the pavilion. That is, rather than initially proposing a form that would need to be rationalized in order to be produced, the team focused on several geometric forms and fabrication strategies that already had an inherently rational basis. So during uh, the first week of the design, uh, literally we had two days of meetings with the client one day to put a proposal together, and then I presented this to the client. Uh, so it was you know, four days. Um, and, uh, the team had developed an initial proposal that used a toroidal surface patch to generate a series of timber beams of varying lengths but with identical curvature. These beams could all be developed from the same glue lamb mold and then CNC milled into different lengths. The strategy was inspired by several projects um, uh, developed by Foster and Partners uh, that used toroidal patches to rationalize seemingly freeform surfaces. Although the design quickly moved away from using this spe specific technique, the project team continued to think through the material and construction implications early in the design process in order to better integrate the form, material, and fabrication logics, and hopefully reduce the construction time and budget. At this point in the schematic design, several tensions became apparent to the team. The first was the great need in the project for the central pavilion to reflect the primary mission of the client and that the initial design of a large timber shell structure did not immediately communicate this mission. That is, the primary stance that most architecture has to water is repulsion. <clears throat> structures are typically made to push water away as quickly as possible in order to keep the structures and the inhabitants and materials within dry. However, in the context of San, the San Antonio climate, which has long dry spells punctuated uh, periodically by heavy rainstorms, and the specific context of a park devoted to the educational mission of reconnecting the community with the vital importance of water, it seemed that accepting water into the structure was a more effective strategy. After all, the park was being designed to collect and recycle all groundwater for use in the restrooms and the irrigation systems, so the pavilion could be used to highlight this process. Furthermore, due to the intense heat and sun of the region, the pavilion was primarily sheltering visiting students and community members from the sun, not rain. A decision was made to use the pavilion to celebrate the collection of rainwater and to make the form of the pavilion a pedagogical device for the park's guides and visiting teachers. The form that emerged from this process was based on the doubly curved fronds of many local plant species that cantilever out to collect uh, and redirect dew and rainwater back to the root stem. The double curvature not only gives the cantilevers more strength, but the curvature also creates a channel on the top surface for the efficient flow of water. So within days, the project had moved from a singular large shell pushing water towards the structure's fringes to several funnel-like doubly curved forms that directed the water to an underground cistern for storage and eventual reuse throughout the site. The second tension that emerged at this point was the client's desire for an iconic and unique pavilion in relation to the budgetary need for simplicity and modularity. Although the new doubly curved funnels aligned with the pedagogical mission of the client, the complexity of making these forms initially resisted easy construction strategies. Early designs for the funnel involved complex uh, steel and ca cable net structures, with which, even if each was identical, uh, was, were beyond this modest budget. At this point, inspired by the work of Felix Candela, Heinz Eisler, and many others who had investigated uh, the use of concrete to create complex forms that aligned with, a um, with structural forces, the team quickly moved to concrete as the primary material. Actually, a funny story about this was I made this rendering uh, in my hotel room the night before uh, a meeting, still while the, the design was a steel and uh, fabric structure. And I was really nervous because I had already changed the design several times, and I was like, this is, just, this is too big of a change. And during the next day's design meeting with the engineer, all of a sudden the engineer said, I think the structure needs to be concrete. And I was like, oh, well. <laughs> and and then from then on, uh, you can see this was January 11th, um, and very quickly evolved. Uh, I'll show you in a moment. Um, but, uh, as the team shifted to concrete, it became necessary to begin to divide the funnel shapes into discrete parts in order to break the forms into manageable parts while also allowing views into the interior of the funnel. So this was the next day. However, while the early steel, earlier steel funnel shapes were designed to cantilever and be uh, supported through tension rings that could balance the forces around the entire funnel, 
The discrete concrete parts no longer had this tension ring and required a new solution. The design team decided on a simple solution of pairing each discrete funnel part with a symmetrically paired element to create a complex, or a complete structural arch. This represented a major, major conceptual shift in the structural organization of the project. Rather than several um, structurally independent funnel-like forms, the plan was organized into 11 uh, structurally independent arches. Without the tension ring, the project had a new formal freedom, and the funnels could become more open and better communicate the flow of water to the public. The resulting arch is the simplest of structures, the statically determinate, determinate three-hinged arch. An arch structure plays to concrete's significant compressive strength while minimizing its limited tensile strength. Referring back to the biomimetic inspiration for the funnels, each half arch was nicknamed a pedal. By separating the pedals with pinned connections at the top of each arch, the team greatly simplified the scope uh, by producing matching pedal shapes with the expressed pins uh, transferring the horizontal stabilizing force between the adjoining pedals. An additional benefit to this new organization of pedals or half arches was the idea of using a modified tilt-up construction, concrete construction um, technique. Tilt-up concrete construction is defined by concrete panels being cast flat on the ground on site and then lifted or tilted into place and connected to the foundation and adjacent panels. The technique can be considered halfway between cast in place uh, and precast concrete, as the panels are cast on site but not in place. It is, common, it is a common fabrication technique in the region as, as it has a very low cost due to the lack of significant formwork. The technique was invented in the US in the early 20th century by Robert Aiken and popularized by Thomas Edison, who in 1908 stated, tilt-up concrete eliminates the costly, cumbersome practice of erecting two wooden walls to get one concrete wall. By the late 20th century, some tilt-up concrete fabricators had begun producing curved concrete panels by casting against curved forms dug from the ground or wooden forms uh, built up through multiple layers of pl plywood. In the context of Confluence Park, tilt-up had a distinct advantage over cast-in-place concrete, as it, is more easily, as it more easily allows for reusable molds, which can be erected in one place on site throughout the, the construction process. However, in order to take advantage of tilt-up concrete construction for Confluence Park, the panels needed to be cast at roughly a 45-degree angle in relation to their erected position. This allowed the top surface of the panel to be open to the sky, while the bottom surface was against the formwork. Now that the team had settled on a half arch or pedal concept and the initial material and fabrication strategy, the next task was to determine the exact shape, position, and number of pedals. Returning to the objective of creating a unique and iconic pavilion for the park, the team wanted to make sure that the need for modularity due to the project budget constraints did not create a system that was too geometrically rigid or monotonous. That is, when working with any modular system, it is difficult to escape organizing systems that reinforce uh, the appearance of repetition. Several organizing grids were developed that explored the implications of overall pedal qu quantity, module quantity, and how repetitive the deployment of these pedals uh, appeared uh, within the grid. The goal was to simultaneously use as few modules as possible in order to reduce the number of pedal molds uh, and increase the casts off of each mold while also obscuring the modularity of the entire project. This tension between a strict modularity of parts and the overall desire for an informal organization of the whole led us to use an irregular tiling grid. After exploring uniform triangular, rectangular, and hexagonal grids, an irregular pentagonal tiling grid was developed. While the regular pentagons do not tile the plane, uh, and these gaps would have created large unshaded areas uh, within the pavilion, there are 15 types of irregular pentagons that do tile the plane. One of those, type four, which is also known as the Cairo tile after several streets in Cairo um, paved with this shape, has four long edges of the same length and one short side and a vertex angles of 120, 90, 120, 90, and 120, kind of alternating. When this pentagon is subdivided into five triangles by connecting the pentagon center with each vertex, it results in only three unique trial, uh, triangles. So two A's, so you can kind of, see, oh, sorry. So it's a little hard to see, but if you see that pentagon right there, which you can kind of see here, um, that there's like A, B, A, B, and C. <clears throat> uh, so triangles A and B are mirrors of each other, and each have internal angles of 75, 60, and 45, while triangle C is equilateral with all angles being 60. The center of each pentagon represented uh, a funnel drain. So again, sorry. Um, so, like the center 
of all of these pentagons, which you can see like right there, that would be a drain uh, down to the cistern. And the edges of the pentagon represented the apex of each arch. Each A triangle is paired with a B triangle from an adjacent pentagon to produce a full arch. And similarly, each C triangle is paired with a C triangle from an adjacent pentagon to create a full arch. In order, for, um, in order to produce the final pavilion plan, various selections of A, B, and C, C arches were ex explored and analyzed for the shade produced as well as the informality of the arches when seen in perspective. That is, the design team tried multiple options of arch arrangements to produce a pattern that, although, fully, although completely modular, appeared to li not line up and only one full pentagon was formed. In parallel with the selection of the, site, of the specific plan arrangements, developments of the sectional properties of the geometry were also being developed. There were three primary objectives in developing the section and curvature of the pedals. First, for both structural reasons and water flow capture, the pedals had to retain double curvature. Second, the thickness of each pedal needed to change from bottom to top in accordance with the structural demand, building codes, and rebar placement. Third, the surface curvature could be, uh, should be continuous from pedal to pedal. In order to test how water would flow on the top surface of the pedals, a rainwater simulation script was developed that sampled points on the surface and then iteratively found the steepest downhill direction. If paths of rainwater flowing on the surface ran into the gaps between the pedals instead of into the valleys of each pedal, the pedal parameters were modified until the rainwater flows all ended at the central drains. The panel thicknesses were largely driven by building code requirements for concrete clear cover over the reinforcement and by the current reality that concrete is reinforced by tying and placing rebar by hand. The concept for the re reinforcement was to place the rebar in a fan-like pattern from the column base, emerging into the outer thinning uh, field with reinforcement on the inside and outside faces. This reinforcement placement resisted the tension uh, wherever it might occur within the shell. Within the column section, the full structural demand of, of gravity, wind, and live loading was concentrated and reinforced appropriately. In the field beyond the column, stresses were lower and the shell became thinner. Ultimately, the top edges were resolved with a four-inch edge and the, the code minimum for adequate coverage of the reinforcement. Um, in order to create a more seamless flow of space between pedals, both across an arch and bet between adjacent half arches, the tangent of the surface edges were adjusted to align all surface curvature. The resulting, this resulted in smooth transitions between pedals despite the necessary four inch gap for the pin connections at the apex of each arch and the larger 16 inch gaps at the base of each column. So we saw this project earlier in the day, unfortunately, or one of them, which, which unfortunately collapsed. <clears throat> So once the design team had moved towards the use of concrete, it was assumed from then on that the formwork would need to be digitally fabricated to be able to achieve the necessary construction tolerances. In addition, it was assumed that fiberglass uh, composites would be the ideal material for the formwork as it was not only strong but very durable and could hold up to multiple castings. However, due to the contractual relationships between contractor and architects in the United States, in which the contractor is responsible for determining the ways and means of a project, uh, the project's contractor, unfamiliar with digital fabrication or fiberglass composites, wanted to first get bids on traditional wooden formwork made from layered up plywood. Just, we only received one bid um, from a traditional formwork fabricator, um, and it was, in fact, larger than the entire project budget. Um, so I thought I was going to be fired or the project was going to be canceled at that point. Um, so, uh, but luckily, um, then the contractor agreed to um, reach out to our suggested fiberglass composite uh, fabricator, Chrysler, and their bid was uh, an order of magnitude less uh, than the first uh, traditional formwork budget, or a bid. So this is an interesting example of a turning point within the industry. Historically, digital fabrication has been used in some of the largest and most expensive projects, while less expensive projects use traditional techniques. However, in this case, the traditional technique was far uh, more expensive than the digitally fabricated fiberglass mold. In addition, the fiberglass mold was not only less expensive, but it was stronger, more durable, and more accurate. Uh, the three formwork modules for the A, B, and C pedals were fabricated off of five and seven axis milled EPS foam forms. After milling the forms, a uh, two inch thick composite structure of compo composed of inner and outer layers of fiberglass composite with a central core of balsa wood uh, was applied. As you can see, again, sorry. So basically a about an um, eighth of an inch of um, fiberglass was laid down on top of the foam form 
and then this calendared balsa wood was laid over that that could accept double curvature, and then another layer of fiberglass on the back uh, to produce kind of a monocoque shell. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so uh, one of the biggest advantages of using this method was that the milled surface of the foam positive was highly accurate, and that all accumulation errors inherent in the fabrication were offset from the surface instead of working towards it. If we had used a traditional plywood formwork system, the CNC milled ribs uh, would have been produced first, and then layers of plywood would be um, uh, layered up from there, kind of accumulating error, e error each time, um, so the largest error was closest to the final surface. Due to the size of each pedal formwork, which is the largest uh, pedals were roughly 30 feet wide and 27 feet tall, each of the modules had to be subdivided into three primary subsections in addition to several side forms that could be shipped to Texas from California uh, by truck. Although the seams between these sections um, were nearly seamless due to the excellent casting of the fiberglass, the sanding, and small amount of uh, caulk that was applied between the concrete pores, the seams were still designed to accentuate the undulating curvature of the concrete pedals. So if one looks closely, so you can kind of see there's one seam there, kind of undulating, and then another seam kind of in there. You can see another one there. Um, all right. After the formwork was shipped to the site and positioned such that it could be cast uh, as a modified tilt-up wall construction, the rebar was added to the formwork. Due to the curvature of the forms and the lack of a top form for most of the top side of the pedals, several tests uh, were required before the right concrete mix was developed. The fact that the bottom surface of each pedal was cast against the smooth fiberglass while the top surface was cast open to the air allowed the two sides of the pedal to have radically different finishes. In order to have the pedals resonate with the flow of water, even when it was not raining, the open top side of each pedal was broom finished with the direction of the broom aligning with the flow direction of the water. In effect, the top surface of each pedal is one giant valley covered with a network of small valleys produced by the bristles of the broom. Over time, this textured surface of the broom finished concrete will reveal the flow of water as various airborne matter such as pollen, dust, and bird droppings collect on the broom finish and stain the concrete as water runs across the surface. So you can see here um, this laborer, um, it took a while to train them to broom the surface in the correct direction because it's not totally intuitive. Um, when the whole, the whole pedal is tilted at a 45 degree angle, which is the downhill direction anymore. Um, uh, and they had to then build these brooms that had 12 foot long um, handles and it's quite amazing to see. So, and this video shows, sped up slightly, uh, this shows the lifting of two pedals. So each time we put an arch together, um, we had one crane first lift one pedal into place, then the other um, crane would lift the, the uh, its adjacent half arch uh, into place. And I'm not sure how to, oh, let's see if I can, it doesn't play. All right. Um, so you can, they were then lifted together, and while the crane was still lifting them, a pin joint was slid in between into the hinge, and then uh, steel embeds uh, that were on the bottom of each pedal, which you can see in the next image, um, kind of right here. There's a, a, an embedded steel plate, one inch thick, uh, that was then bolted down uh, or welded to another plate, and then that plate was bolted. You can kind of see it a little bit maybe here. Um, bolted to the ground, and that allowed us to, by adjusting the, the nuts on, on the bolts, we could adjust the um, angle of each pedal so that each one was uh, perfectly true. Uh, and I should say, um, yeah, this, so this was the first arch uh, erected um, of the, of, there are three smaller pavilions and then one uh, larger pavilion. So this just shows how they are all um, structurally independent uh, arches. <clears throat> okay, so, oh, um, so um, this was somewhat uh, interesting in that uh, early on, so this was a rendering that I did, um, I think at the end of schematic design, and I had tried to convince the client that while the concrete was still, well, during casting, um, the workers would broadcast, would like throw out little bits of iron to, onto the top surface of the concrete. 
um, so that over time the, the, the iron would um, rust with the rainwater um, and we would get the, basically the, the structure would be painted with the flow of water over time with this rust color. So that's why it's white on the inside and orange on the outside. Um, the client got really nervous about that of like you're telling them like I'm intentionally going to rust your project. Um, so they when they didn't do that, but what I find really nice is that you know the building has been up for a year and a half, and um, just like it's already starting to be stained uh, by the water, just like I said through the you know dust and pollution and bird droppings and so forth. Okay, having completed the project a year and a half ago, there are various things the team has learned uh, in the process and have begun to speculate about how they might do uh, similar projects in the future differently. So in terms of the material, material, a higher strength concrete with improved tensile capacity and uniform disbursement of reinforcement uh, might be considered. So like I was saying that we could have gone much thinner, but the code didn't allow us to go any thinner than four inches because as we saw in the first lecture today, um, you need about two inches on either side of the concrete to keep the, the rebar from um, uh, rusting away over time. <clears throat> Uh, so the building code limitations could have been challenged uh, to allow thinner shells. However, the interest of this project um, by the public and the AC community demonstrates a longing for the beauty and of simple forms well executed. While a diverse team, when a diverse team focuses on the smart application of new technologies and focuses on the integration of form, fabrication, and performance throughout the entire design process, innovative projects that meet the client's missions are possible even within modest project budgets. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, can I ask all the presenters to join me here for our session? So thank you, thank you very much for three excellent uh, presentations. I think it's really, really exciting work. Um, to, to some extent, this, this session or panel was grouped as um, academia industry collaborations. And I think usually what one associates with this is that uh, projects are um, about efficiency optimization, there, there are certain sort of e economics attached to these projects, but I, what struck me very much in this presentation is that I think there's a really a common thread through all these, these projects. Um, and so I, I dare to say that there is a kind of um, perhaps striving for beauty and in, in, in design um, that's present across all the works. So my first question would be, within this collaboration, collaborative uh, setting, how do you communicate the value of design? Um, and what is, what is the value of design and what does it contribute to these collaborations? Um, so on, on Confluence Park, um, I mean, each member of the design team definitely had that passion for you know, bringing the beauty um, to the project and making that central. But I think every team has that. Like almost every architecture and engineering, like they, uh, you know, the reason we're in this profession is we kind of believe in that. The problem is often the the client side saying, "Oh well, yeah, that looks nice, but you know, we can't afford that, or if that's not our priority, you know, something else." So in this project, what I think was the main driver um, was the client, where they um, were so secure in their stance that this had to be a unique project, um, and it ha we had to keep on pushing the aesthetic bounds. So every time we would propose something, they were like, great, let's go further. And I had never kind of had that with a client, where they were just continually asking for more and pushing it, instead of like holding back and like trying to spend less. Uh, I mean, they were, it was, it's very, it was, uh, the budget was $2 million. 
Um, so it was a very reasonable project, um, but they kept on pushing for as much as possible aesthetically within that. I, I would say that in, in all of the, the projects that we've seen in this, this now, um, didn't design and function go hand in hand? I mean, there we had the function of it had to be tilted up, and we had the problem that we couldn't use too many formwork panels. Here we have the, the issue of that the function of the, the the pieces that they have to move, and and for example in the in the defabs lab we, we had the issue of the, the forces that have to come down to a weirdly shaped um, wall underneath the slab. So in each of these cases, function and design were really going, going hand in hand, and I think that's also what makes them special. It's not a design that's then being thrown over the wall to the people that have to build it, um, which still happens a lot, um, but it's about moving the function, design, and uh, fabrication hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, is this working? Okay. I think the, the question is two parts. One, one about the, the presumption that the relationship with industry means that you'll focus on uh, efficiencies, which I'm, I'm sure it's a loaded question. But I think if, you're, if you find yourself having to argue for the merits of design principles um, and you're losing energy by trying to force that argument over and over again, you're probably in the wrong kind of collaboration. Because a collaboration that shares a respect for each other's contribution um, it means I think it's inevitable. So, but the other part of the question is about beauty, and I, I, I don't know, like in our own work, we don't really have discussions about beauty, but we do have discussions about difference. Um, and in thinking differently about things, so uh, the alternative to efficiencies, like our default strategy is to add more mass. We don't, we don't try and remove mass, we just put more mass on the other side. Um, and we found that to be a productive way of moving forward, and it charges um, difference in the things because I think the default strategy in it, the construction industry, I wouldn't say industry at large, but the construction industry is that there's a presumption that we should remove things. We should remove mass and that lighter is better. Uh, Buck, Buckminster Fuller had the, the quote, uh, how heavy is your building, but actually like, I'm not seeing a whole lot of uh, of dome construction happening today in that manner. Like, so in that value, if, it, if you um, operate under the principle that efficiencies will trump every other decision, you're missing out on the potentials of alternative ways of thinking. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, that's evident in, in the project and in the, in the work. To, to follow up on, on the question of collaboration, um, what, what does constitute a successful collaboration and what are, what are the difficulties that come with it um, between academia and, and building industry or contractors? Well, from my point of view, um, some, some sort of friction is always good. Um, I mean, we want that and I think both or every party involved wants that. Um, it's about challenging each other. Um, so if everybody would always be like, yeah, let's, let's go ahead with that idea, that, that would be a weird type of collaboration. It, it always has to have some sort of friction happening um, in, in academia, design, industry, um, collaborations. I also think collaboration is quite challenging, but um, very fruitful if the right people are on, are on the table. Uh, so it's very important who you are collaborating with. Uh, and it's very important that you carefully uh, select your collaborators because uh, not, well, you kind of want to work together and you will disagree in every collaboration, but if you have a vision that is similar, that's very important. If your visions are very different and your agendas are very different, collaboration would not be as easy, I guess. Um, a slight, slight change of, of topic, um, something that was not specifically mentioned in the presentations, but uh, is probably an underlying premise or a discussion is the question of intellectual property and the dissemination of, of knowledge. Um, in, in your collaborations, um, how, how, do you make, how do you make that work? Or how do you approach it? The, the, the simple answer, uh, contracts. <laughs> um, the, the little bit more complex answer would, would probably um, revolve again around the, the, the vision of the partners. 
Um, if it's about publishing papers, then it's just a matter of patenting it first and then publishing the paper, so that's uh, rather straightforward. And um, if it's about a long-term vision that, that both want to achieve something together, then it's also about putting that in, in writing. What does that mean? That can be difficult, especially if very often you don't quite know what's going to be the result of your work together. Um, so a basic, a basic level of trust, I would say, and the joint vision is, is then still a very important in regard to intellectual property. Sometimes also intellectual property could be um, shared by more than one person. I remember in our SLAB project we had a material uh, building science group uh, within the university exploring with us what kind of concrete we can use, how can we mix it, but then at the other end we had few our um, concrete spraying and casting partner, industrial partner, who was mixing material and there was a point we said like can we share this mix with yes within our paper and there was all this discussion coming up uh, and the question is okay who owns what basically at the end every, the one who does the work will own uh, that part of the project I believe right but then uh, those are those has to be clearly discussed in the beginning and it's not always very clear yeah. Maybe add one thing to that. In my experience now with working with different universities and other partners, if we wanted to do the project together because we've seen that we have a common vision and a common goal, we've always found a creative solution to then also make it work in regard to IP and contracts and all of that. There's enough possibilities. So I've, I've, it's been a hassle every now and then with the lawyers, but it's um, it's worth the trouble to get it that out of the way, and it's never um, a showstopper from my point of view. Yeah, like there, there are the institutional challenges of the contracts and lawyers, but I think as a starting point, sharing um, intellectual property and authorship is the best way to start because if if you're not sharing that, you're not collaborating and in, in it together. Um, if you're not sharing that, you're being hired to do something. You're not collaborating with someone. I think I'll, I'll open uh, this discussion up uh, to the audience at, at this point. I'm sure there are many questions, oh, one popping up already. Where's the little catch box? <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the very interesting um, talks and very beautiful images. Uh, I guess my question is really for Brendan, but it, it's around the theme of uh, what is an instrument, what is an architectural instrument, what is a tool? Um, because I've heard you several times self-deprecatingly say, oh, people say, what does this have, to, is this not sculpture? Mm -hmm. and, and then you say, no, it's architecture. Um, but I think that the proper comparison is with an, a tool. Is this not a tool? And I think the answer is yes, it is a tool, a tool for um, elaborating architectural techniques like stepping and pushing and, mm -hmm. and so I guess I would like you to talk more about how th your project is not really about concrete it's using concrete yeah. to elaborate a series of architectural gestures and tools and vocabularies and, and movement uh, and concrete is the proper massive thing with which to do that uh, because and, and perhaps um, this means we're sort of, you're kind of thickening the space of the user for spaces that you're not designing yourself or something like mm -hmm. that. Does that resonate with um, your project? Yes. I don't think that the core competency of our research is dedicated to concrete, but we collaborate with the concrete industry for their expertise. So if I, if I break that out and to think about what is it that we're really invested in doing, it's in um, building reciprocity between how things are made and how we think about architecture. So, um, well, actually, one of the examples that's influenced me is Mark's um, experience with uh, having conversations with stonemasons and that we move away from the drawing and we start thinking about full-scale mock-ups of construction where the logic of how something is carved has an immediate reciprocity with how the geometry and the form is made. So I'd say that's the basic principle. And what's happened is that for us, it's expanded into thinking about the life cycle of how something is produced. So today, uh, the contemporary construction site, for legal reasons, for um, uh, all, all kinds of safety issues, 
we think of construction sites as being fenced off, um, hard hat only, specialty in there, and that we will wait for the building uh, to be ready for us with the occupancy. But uh, if we look back through history, there are other ways of thinking about architecture, which is much more encompassing. Uh, there is a uh, temple uh, in uh, Peru called Oyate Tambo, which was designed with the intention of having no completion date in sight. That it was continuously reconstructed. It was a laboratory for construction. And the Inca, the ruling class, was asking for revisions constantly because they needed to, to ensure that there was something to do for these master masons. That's a different way of thinking about architecture than the way we think today. But I think it would be wonderful if we could re-engage in um, uh, topics of construction that engage community and society, such as Amish barn raisings or uh, maintenance. Like these are things that we have kind of pushed off to the other side. So this is, this is something we're invested in today. And when we have conversations about who we collaborate with, it involves industry, but it also involves composers, chefs, like people that are um, invested in time-based media, for instance, that are challenging us to think in that way. I, I don't know if that, I don't know if I'm talking about tools, but the way of thinking. Uh, maybe somewhat related, but for all the projects, because as Lucia said, they're all very beautiful. Um, and I like watching extreme sports like skateboarding sometime. You realize you always get the best shot and they fell down a lot trying to do it. And I'm just curious, like what were some of the fall down moments like and whether like in the narrative that tip up construction like could be thought of as a process, how is that actually challenged by some of the the barriers you had to overcome to actually make like the final sweet shot that you showed in the, in the presentations? Um, I'll share two. Um, I said in the lecture that there were several early um, tries to get the mix right. Um, unfortunately, when you're uh, casting something that large, um, it's not like you can just do a slump test, you know, down here, like it's the, the surface is changing curvature the entire time. The grid of rebars is differentiated. Um, so, in order to get the mix right, um, it actually took them uh, two to four petals worth. Um, and they were, unfortunately, we started casting with the smallest, which were only 17 feet high. Um, so the first two that they cast um, and erected, you know, 17 foot high structure, um, there were holes in the concrete where the mix wasn't fluid enough. Um, so holes big enough that you could still, you could see the rebar, that the rebar was exposed. And the contractor's uh, solution was just to patch it. And the engineer and the architect and I, we were like, they're like no, you cannot do that. <laughs> like, you can't just patch like a four inch hole. Um, like over time, water's gonna get in there and it's gonna fall out in someone's head and so forth. And they weren't very happy about that because it meant they had to, you know, jackhammer a, I don't know, 20 tons of concrete out and recast them. Uh, and probably $100,000 worth of you know, recasting. The second time they cast two petals, um, they thought they had a solution, which was after they demolded them and before the architects could get on site, um, they did a skim coat over the entire structure so that any of the holes, um, and then they sanded that skim coat. So it looked like just beautiful, like, uh, like marble almost. It was just like super smooth, everything was perfect. And we were like, wow. You did it, like this is amazing. And then we're like, wait, there are no air holes anywhere. Like, how did you do that? <laughs> and they're like, oh, we just did a skim coat. We're like, you can't do that. Like in 10 years, the water's gonna get behind again and so forth. But at that point, they said, look, if you make us tear two more of these down, we're gonna quit. <laughs> so the compromise is that, that if you go to the site, um, two of the, not the, of the main pavilion, but of the, the smaller satellite pavilions, two of them look really nice. But in 10 years from now, <laughs> they might not. <laughs> um, yeah, I also would like to share um, a lot of our experience, but I think the time doesn't allow. But uh, our project took three years, 
uh, of constant uh, design prototyping, discussing with um, industrial partners and the collaborators within the project. And the prototypes that I showed, the slab prototypes that I showed in the beginning were the earlier prototypes for the uh, ceiling that then the ceiling came, they looked very different. The design looked very different. The fabrication method eventually looked very different. Um, a good example is initially we wanted to have a stay in place formwork because we could be more complex in our shape um, and really express the potential of 3D printing. But once we uh, went to city and tried to get this done, they said, well, you have to check if, how, how stable is this sand on the, on the concrete, how long does it stay? Does it gonna crack after five years? Then once we figured out, no, actually it can't be there right now. The, the technology, it doesn't, the bonding is not enough for it to stay for a long term. We had to rethink the formwork and uh, redo the entire formwork system, also the design accordingly. So um, there has been a huge, um, resources in prototyping uh, and large scale prototyping, which uh, you could not replace with small tests, basically. Um, a, a couple of, I mean, things that, that, that went wrong with the big concrete piece we did there is we, we usually calculate where to attach the crane to such a big formwork piece. Um, now we had some 3D printed forms on there and nobody really, did the measurements about how much would that weigh now and where should we now put uh, attach the crane. So you pick up this huge piece of, of formwork and it lifts up and all of a sudden all the weight is on one corner and that corner was made out of wood. Um, so it didn't quite last that. So we had to pick it up uh, off the ground, then repair it while it's hanging on the crane and then put it back down again. So that was uh, the things that we usually think of when we design these big pieces. But in this case, um, yeah, nobody really considered the change of the weight, which afterwards is like obvious, yeah. Um, we, we've never, uh, I don't know, our things always work. We're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we've obviously broken a lot of concrete. Um, <laughs> No broken toes? It's, uh, no broken toes. There's <laughs> safety, you know, safety. I think what's been interesting is um, in, we, we do work with the stone industry as well, and they obviously have experience with moving big, heavy things, and things that you uh, think will be safe um, are very much not safe. Uh, you know, the, so the rule is any anyone that tries to stop a stone from falling over doesn't survive to tell the tale. So I'm like, especially when dealing with students, so because we are doing experiments, um, it's, distance first, like let's, let's get away. Um, but sometimes we have failures that are really instructive that tell us a great deal about the behavior of the object, and other times we have failure for dumb reasons that don't inform anything, it's just process and things get uh, messy. But uh, I find it interesting, you know, coming from the engineering field, like this is obviously testing to failure is something that um, you're, you're, you're well trained in. I feel every time we collaborate with a structural engineer, all they want to do is just break what we've made. That's, the, that's all they're interested in doing. So they just show up uh, right before the exhibition and they're ready to break it. You know? um, thank you. My question is um, um, about the uh, form work for concrete. Uh, the sand casting, I don't know whether you are aware of those. The, the example of the sand casting that I know of uh, in the United States is uh, Arcosanti. Um, and uh, um, all the concrete there is sand cast, the concrete. Uh, huge arches and vaults and so forth and so on. Um, that's my question from you. And the other one from uh, the gentleman with the heavy movements. Um, even though that, uh, that is a, um, um, how should I say, a way of looking at architecture, um, there are uh, similar ways of looking at architecture. Uh, for example, uh, the um, uh, temple, uh, Ise temple in uh, uh, Japan, where you leave the temple to um, live, you know, to deteriorate, and you build another one 20 years later. 
And so, um, so that, you know, that, uh, the, the, and nature is itself uh, go, uh, goes towards this sort of uh, uh, entropy and, and the um, uh, 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 less weight. So what, uh, what Mr. Fuller was suggesting uh, is uh, uh, a, a, um, a way of looking at a principle. Understand the question. Uh, sorry, do you hear me? I, d I didn't understand the question about sun casting of the concrete uh, in that place. What is the question exactly? Sorry. Uh, well, have you looked at the sand casting? Because uh, uh, this fiberglass with all computer and so forth is uh, high tech. Uh, sand casting is uh, low tech. Is it? Oh, in that sense. Well, I mean, I, I don't really, I don't know if I can tag it as a high-tech versus low-tech, but definitely sand casting, um, or let's say uh, there was a lot of project within the history where you have bricks and you cast in, or you have sand, and then you cast into uh, strength the area. Uh, those are a very different project than this, in a sense that this one is a prefabrication of formwork and uh, prefabrication of lightweight concrete elements that you would then bring to the site, if that. Oh, you know, those pedals, the pedals oh, that we're talking about. Oh, sorry. Uh, or both, you know, yeah, but the pedals, you know, it's, uh, uh, you lift them and so forth. Um, there is no, uh, in sand casting, you just, uh, you know, make yeah, it on I the ground. I mentioned that um, with tilt up concrete, one of the, um, there have been examples where they would, would dig into the earth to create like a, a curved mound of earth and then cast concrete against that and then tilt it up from there instead of tilting against a flat earth plane or a flat slab. Um, but uh, one of the issues, like I said, was about modularity and that we needed to have a high level of tolerance um, and be able to cast 28 petals off of only three forms. So those forms had to be reusable very, very quickly, the turnaround time from one uh, cast to the next. And if you had used sand, it would have been very, very difficult to make sure that one mound of sand was identical to the previous mound of sand. And if they weren't, none of the petals would fit together. Okay. Yeah. Do we have do we have, a, do we have another question from the audience? Um, whoa. <laughs> I think that something that I often hear about projects like this regarding um, sort of material research and industry application um, is always is always asking how do you plan to scale this work? How do you plan to apply this later? Um, which I think is maybe a little reductive sometimes. I'm wondering sort of how you all position these projects within sort of a larger scope of research, how you might understand this individual effort in terms of your longer track of research or of making or of potential application, sort of without asking what do you plan to turn these into, sort of how do you understand these own projects in terms of your own work? Um, real quick for me, uh, one of the things I've struggled with since starting my practice was how to grow the practice. Um, you know, there's the, the founder's dilemma that you're probably familiar with where you, you start a business because you love what you do and then that bus you're successful in that business and then you have to grow the business, but then you end up just being in meetings and email all day long and not doing what you started the business to do. You've hired other people to do that. So I've always struggled with that in my practice. So one of the things that Confluence Park has helped me to realize um, was the value of collaboration. Like rather than thinking that I needed to grow my office and to, to have all of the, these you know, numbers of people like under me, it was, that wasn't productive because I wasn't going to enjoy it. Um, that collaborating with others allowed me to go to another scale where other firms who were experts at project management or the engineers and all of that, that it was, now I realize how I can grow my practice in a way that I hadn't before. And I think we need, that, I think that has to do a lot with the way that we teach architecture, that I think there's a tendency to, um, 
to teach architecture as if every student is going to start their own practice and you know become a celebrity architect. Um, and I think a much more productive way of teaching would have, you know, similar to what you probably went through at ETH, the you know this is the power of collaboration between a really multidisciplinary team. Yeah, um, did I understand the question right that? Uh, you want to know how this impacted our research uh, trajectory, right? Kind of, I mean, or how we define our research accordingly. But like for me, these were a step stone of the research. So these are, these are the research. I, I think the first day that we started this project, I couldn't even believe that we could make a slab, a real slab, out of sandstone formwork myself. I mean, like, I could, I thought it was a dream. Like, I was like, oh, we're going to talk about it, and we're going to convince the uh, contributor to work with us. And, you know, it was, it was such a, such a dream that, or like, you know, but then you have to research throughout to make it happen. And when it happens and it's the final result, that's really a demonstrator of a very long time research. Uh, through which we advance a lot of computational method, through which we advance uh, a, a set of fabrication methods, and we learned a set of material processes that we didn't do before. So I guess by just doing them, we did the research through them. Yeah. Um, well, for, for us, uh, scalability is, is key for us, obviously. Usually when we get Contracts. I mean, I've, I've shown you the picture of, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. I mean, that's a couple of thousand square meters of freeform formwork. Um, so scalability is key, and I think we, we, we can do that today. Um, the 3D printed parts are still rather expensive, but I mean, the price is dropping every year, so that, that's good. Uh, but, but what we've heard, um, I mean, the, the, the formwork industry doesn't really have a very good image. Um, uh, all the You've heard, for example, the quote that you got. Um, I don't want to know who you got it from. Um, but that's, um, and so, I mean, our mission as a company is to make um, building for our customers, contractors, builders, uh, designers, um, faster, more efficient, and more safe. And, and all what we're doing is tailored towards that ultimate goal. Um, so so that, that's not a problem. I think if now we, we want to hand over the, this, this technology and show new potential, what happens more often than not is we get um, a design that people want formwork for, then we tell them the price tag, and then usually they change the design because the formwork is so expensive. Um, and that needs to be changed by us. I mean, we need to make sure that these not only beautiful designs but also functionally um, appealing designs ha are not limited by the, by the former solution, and that's what it's all about. Mm. I mean, I think for industry, it's a rather straightforward question of like a, uh, the nature of scaling, and then the cliche in architecture. And I, I sympathize, Andrew, with with your point is that um, you can either scale the project or you scale your practice. Um, you know, beginning installations, residential, the, like building bigger buildings. So I think. The way that um, we have to think through research is scaling impact. And um, sometimes the best value to uh, scale that impact is by scaling the project itself. Another way of scaling impact is by moving into another media to be able to disseminate that knowledge. Um, and if we can convince other people to change their minds about their behavior, then we're being successful. I think that's another way of thinking about scaling. So, uh, for instance, we did a research project on uh, cannibalism of, of stone rubble and produced a cookbook and disseminated that to the world, asking other people to do it, because we are not interested in uh, getting into the recycling of concrete game ourselves. So I think that question of scale is something that we always have to address and ask ourselves, what is it about this project or this way of thinking that will scale best? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much again for the presentations and this uh, great session. Unfortunately, we're out of time and we need to move on to the next one, but uh, thank you guys.
Are you Micah? Ah, okay. Oh, here. Here it is. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to start the final panel. Um, sorry, we had to get uh, mic'd up, um, switched out. So I'd like to um, invite Wander Lau um, to moderate um, this last session. Wander is uh, Wander Lau is a, an award-winning editor and writer who oversees tech practice, tech practice and product coverage at Architect Magazine. She is also a host and producer for Architect's um, podcast. Um, along with a decade of experience in the AE profession, she holds a BS in civil engineering from Michigan State University, an MS in building technology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and an MA in journalism from Syracuse University. So she will be moderating our um, this last panel. It seems like a, a very quick day, um, even though it was a very full day, um, and looking forward to the conversation. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm so honored to moderate this panel of distinguished experts, um, such a range of backgrounds. And this is the very best time slot of the day, so thank you, Tian. <laughs> um, I know this panel is the last thing between you guys and the exhibition or wherever your plans might take you this Friday night, so I will keep my eye on the clock and have you guys out of here by 6. Um, so I attend a lot of conferences in my line of work, and it's very rare to find something so interdisciplinary that actually has experts across the AEC spectrum, and especially having practitioners present against present side by side by researchers. That's a really unusual thing, so please embrace it while you're here at the University of Michigan. Um, and since you're likely familiar with the keynote speakers already, and also some of the faculty and staff who are here at University of Michigan, I will just give a very brief introduction to each of the speakers. And you can obviously see their full credits in the programming bio. Um, and then this is going to be a very high level talk about research. And um, I'll try to leave 10 minutes at the end of this for questions from the audience. So please think about things you want to ask some of these, our distinguished guests. Um, so Mark Burry is an architect, and he is the founding director of the Smart City Research Institute at Swinburne University in Australia, where he's also the, a professor of urban futures. Um, Sarah Billington is the professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University and also a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for, for the Environment. And obviously both Mark and Sarah gave excellent keynotes presentations yesterday and this afternoon. Um, Jonathan Massey. Jonathan Massey is the Dean and Anna Professor of Architecture here at the University of Michigan, which you probably all know. And he's also a renowned scholar of, mar of modern architecture. Renowned. <laughs> um, Jerry Lynch is uh, department chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Program here, and he's, where he's also a professor, and he also have, holds, an, holds a courtesy appointment as a professor in the, um, as, a, as a professor of electrical engineering and computer science. So again, more of that interdisciplinary studies is very um, admirable here. And then Bull Kersik is the director of the Global Carbon Dioxide, Global CO2 Initiative here at the University of Michigan, and this initiative focuses on the technologies, resources, and policies to increase the rate at which CO2, uh, CO2 is removed from the global carbon cycle. So thank you very much. Do you mind if I ask them to come forward? I'm going to make one request. We're in the home stretch here. I think. This panel will be energized and inspired if some of you at the back are willing to move up toward the front so that we can have more of a engaged conversation with you all. Thank you. Well, thank you, but they all know that I'm a chemist and are afraid that I might run experiments. So yes. I understand your fear, but come closer. I request a renowned architect. Can I thank you. <laughs> the protective wall. Thank you. Um, thank you for that prompt, Jonathan. Obviously, you can see he's also an excellent educator, too. <laughs> um, quick question for the audience. How many of you guys are undergraduate students? Or most of you guys, one? Oh, great. And graduate students or postdocs? Excellent. Okay. I know that sometimes uh, it can seem impressive, uh, the 
the backgrounds and accomplishments of these presenters. So I want to start my questions with just a quick introduction to each <laughs> panelist about how they found their way to the uh, found their way to a career that involves research. And if there was a single moment or interaction at which they decided to stay on the course of being actively involved in research, um, starting with Mark. Um, I, I didn't um, become an academic until my 30s. I had eight years of practice first. And um, I hit what I call the plateau. And the plateau is where you realize you have insufficient charisma to ever see yourself in leading a, a practice of 400 people, or you um, just don't have the entrepreneurial zeal, or in my case, you just realize that where you could go in practice was not going to happen in practice. Um, I'd been contam contaminated with my experience at the Sagrada Familia, and um, I just realized after eight years of diligent service that I wasn't going to get what I wanted, and that change would have to come through an academic uh, injection. So that was my, um, my epiphany. Um, yeah, so I was not ever planning to be an academic. <laughs> I went to grad school thinking I would go into design, um, and then I got a fellowship to get a PhD, and I was like, okay. And then as I was finishing, I still thought I would go into design, and someone asked me to apply for a job at Cornell, and I applied, and I got it. So I was like, well, that's pretty good job. <laughs> and so I, just, I really kind of fell into it, but I, I kind of knew that I would like the teaching, but I really wasn't sure about the research. Um, but I'm very thankful that I did. And I think, did you ask like what like led to different trajectories? Or? Yeah. Uh, yes. So was there a singular moment or interaction that led you to, cont to keep staying? Yeah. I mean, I think research? what kept me in academics was um, I, I got to go abroad early on in my career. And I, I went to a conference, actually, and I heard Victor Lee, is he still here? <laughs> yeah, give a talk about ECC, and I was like, that's a really cool material, and it, it just inspired me, and I realized it could mix with some of the things I was trying to do, and it, it just helped give me kind of a research direction, and so I did that for a while, and then, um, I mean, it, 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 it turns out that academics has been really good for me, both for just the flexibility of the career, and then also just being able to move into other areas of interest, because I definitely, as you could see from my talk today, a very different interest, and I, I think that would be, I mean, it's hard enough to do it in academics. <laughs> I think that it would be even harder, I think, in industry just to try to pop over to something new. So I'm really thankful that I went into academics. Well, no, I think you, you, you will hear that frequently, that none of us probably has planned this, right? It all just happens. Um, I was interested in chemistry and physics, so I went to university really scared because I learned that, A, I needed to get a PhD um, to, to really do something in this field. And B, um, to get a PhD, I needed to do something that nobody has ever done before. And, and that I just couldn't even imagine. Um, but once you're on that path and you, you sort of discover that there are so many unanswered questions, uh, as, as Sarah said, I mean, you, you go from one thing to another. I started in chemistry, moved into mechanical engineering, now I work in the medical school and, and other things. So it, there's always an inspiration that keeps you going. And the more I thought about what, what gets me up in the morning is uh, what, what makes a difference? What kind of big questions can we answer? What do we need to do to, uh, to really um, make sure that us as, as humans and the planet as a whole um, can, can continue, to, continue to prosper? And, and lately I find myself intrigued with the question of um, we seem to be rediscovering what we have done for thousands of years, right, in, in looking at uh, we all used to be universalists. Of course, we now know so much that we have to specialize and therefore learn how to work together was what in the past we have done as individuals. And, and therefore, at the university, we can choose how to collaborate with who and in, in what form. And, and I think that keeps us going with, with research. Yeah, so from my own experiences, it's really about being able to push boundaries. And when I was an undergraduate and then later I worked in industry before going to grad school, um, I worked for a big uh, design firm in New York City and I could see that those that had PhDs uh, really had opportunities to sort of expand what those boundaries were in their professional practice. And that was my motivator for doing graduate school. During my graduate years, I could see that by not necessarily going to industry but kind of going to academia as a professor, 
again, you could continue to push those boundaries. Those boundaries are further and further away. So it really is buying you a lot of freedom for the creative process for basically tackling very complex problems and really having impact as a scholar in solving those problems. But it's really about having that intellectual freedom, creative freedom, and not having boundary conditions that I perceived to had existed when I was working in industry. So for me, that was my motivator. I think my, my own path uh, is, is a little bit similar to what Jerry just described in the sense that as an undergraduate, I was so invigorated by the intellectual ferment around the humanities in architecture. Remember, it was, it was the high decon moment and post-structuralism was, was you know, pervasive. And uh, the architects that were most compelling in school were totally disconnected from the market. They were making artworks for display in galleries, and they were making conceptual projects that didn't, at the time, Zaha Hadid, we were talking about Zaha Hadid in this room a week ago, proved, proved that there are pathways to major production out of that moment. But it just seemed to me that market-driven architectural practice was not going to engage me in those big humanistic questions. And so I went into architectural history and theory and found that, that I didn't quite find the impact there. I mean, it's a fairly niche world. Um, and so that is what has brought me, that search for impact has brought me into academic leadership in realizing that if I can support the kind of amazing work that presenters today have shared and that our students and faculty do, if I can support that and tee them up for success, then my little efforts will actually have some of the impact that, that I haven't found a path toward doing architectural history scholarship. Wonderful. And um, many of you are probably on the cusp of your next step in either your career or your continu your con uh, continuing your studies in academia. Would you recommend that a budding architect or engineer enter practice uh, in a conventional setting these days or would go into research in an, if so, what kind of context of research um, such as like a public setting or private se or a private sector or a combination of these? Some, several of you have practice experience. And, um, so what, do you, what would you recommend for the uh, audience? Well, I, I used to get into trouble. Um, at, <laughs> uh, we have something in Australia called Open Day, where um, it's meant to be the high school kids come and see whether they want to come and do architecture or not. But they often, these days, have their parents in tow. And the parents would say, um, here's Johnny. Uh, he's always wanted to be an architect ever since he was two. I said, well, you've come to the right place. Say, but the only thing is, I, I've heard that the salaries aren't so good. And I'd do this kind of, what? Oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, is, is that important? Well, you know, I'm thinking, I'd say, well, and they'd say, well, it's five years. I said, yes, but philosophy, chemistry, building science, economics, social science, history, it's all there. And after five years, if all else fails, well, you can always be an architect. And apparently that wasn't <laughs> the right message, but I honestly believe that's, uh, that's how it is. You, you come to do all these things, and you, know, you may decide that a, a, a conventional practice uh, is what you want to do, but hopefully you'll see other opportunities. And so I've always, uh, I've had three economic cycles now where you've got graduates coming out and almost certain not to get any jobs. Um, that's what happens when you get older, you can sort of reflect on this. So from a very early stage, I've always felt that our primary responsibility is to make sure that entrepreneurship is high on the agenda. So even if you go into a practice, you'll go in there with um, uh, some real sort of drive. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I could ever tell anyone to do one or the other. <laughs> um, for sure, I think it's, uh, it's, it'll have to come from your gut, like what you feel is gonna be meaningful and where you wanna be. Um, yeah, as Volker said about that meaningfulness, I think that really is important. Um, we have a, a D school, design school at Stanford, and they have a course called Design Your Professional Life, and I send all my graduate students there. And it's so nice because they, they go and they, they choose sort of three careers they're kind of thinking about, and they find someone in them, and they go sort of shadow them for a day, and there are a lot of other things that they do in that. Um, but I think it's really important to to see what's out there and explore. Um, I know I kind of just fell into things and I'm glad in the end, but I, I do kind of wish that I had explored earlier. 
one of the things. So I think, um, yeah, just to try to find what's meaningful. And then also there's that point, like if it doesn't work out in one, you can go to another. It, it's, it's really, you're not tracked. I've seen so many people change. Uh, um, that's definitely possible. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. That we're not sort of pitching hole us uh, if, if we make a decision at some point in our life. But I don't know if I can really answer this. I mean, I, I've been in school now for 51 years, never had a job. So um, can't certainly speak from experience. But my, uh, my uh, uh, experience as a teacher, as an educator, certainly is you need to talk with the students. You really need to sort of explore what are they good at, what they're, they're interested in. And we're, we, we're lucky to play a game of numbers, right? It's not that uh, we need to be worried about advising half of our class on this and half of our class on that. It all will work out. And I think, I strongly believe that we are only doing our best if we enjoy what we're doing. So teasing that out um, sometimes takes hours. Uh, just the other week, I had a student in office hours and we spent another hour just to explore just does she really understand what are her own desires and what does she think others expect from her? I think I see that a lot. And, and you need to help students to go beyond that and take it from there. Yeah, and I would just reiterate, I think it's really about articulating the students, sort of empowering them to follow their heart and to really sort of not consider these other considerations that students often think about, which may be salaries, um, schedules, things like that, but really find the thing you're going to be passionate about, the thing you're going to really enjoy, and the thing that won't really be work. And if that's in the research arena, great. If it's in the professional practice arena, great. But it's really just about finding your inner self and what's going to make you happy as a professional. So. I mean, I, right now I'm most excited about the, the places where those things come together. And, and we've seen a lot of that today where, where practice or industry-based work uh, experimenters are connecting with academic researchers and helping one another do things that neither one can do by themselves. So that, that for me is the sweet spot. And at Taubman College, we're focusing quite a bit on the chance to think about what that looks like for the urban tech, uh, for urban tech, for the intersection of data and technology based entrepreneurship with buildings and cities, where I think, which I think is one of the hottest areas like this one that we've covered today. I think sometimes there's a, ten a tendency to get so focused in on your work that's due in the near future that you forget to look up and take advantage of all the disciplines that are available to explore here, in especially in a university setting. So um, that's something I wish I had done more when I was in the graduate study, just to explore and le learn more things. Um, the role of concrete and cement production in uh, embodied uh, in the carbon emissions uh, in the world has been come up today throughout several people's talks. Um, in at the, at the same time, there's concrete it does make up a significant portion of our built environment, both the foundation and the building blocks. Uh, were there any research directions that were talked about here or that you see in your own line of work that you find promising in terms of mitigating the impact of concrete and cement in carbon emissions? And I mean, Volkers, this is especially something you're probably focusing on a lot, but I'm sure everyone else here has touched upon it in their line of work. Sure, and, and I mean, of, of course, there are always multiple avenues in how we can be more mindful in, in how we use materials and, and how much. We, we heard uh, just in the last panel um, that sometimes codes that might no longer apply because we have new materials need to be revised so we can go about making the same thing with half the material. That's one thing, but I think also we need to learn to really explore new materials and be more strategic about how we develop those. And, and I think you have heard this afternoon about, about new ways and how um, concrete can actually be made in a, in a more environmentally friendly manner. Um, all the way starting from cement making to how the concrete is being put together, mixed and cured. Um, I found this one of the intriguing uh, conversations this morning in the first talk, right? That, uh, I mean, of course, CO2 attacks concrete, but in the afternoon you heard that you can actually make concrete with CO2 and thereby lock this up. And uh, this, this finds its, its entry into uh, everyday products. This watch is made with concrete that has uh, incorporated carbon dioxide. Um, so I, I think 
the versatility, as far as I understand, of the material will not make us want to stop using it. So we just have to be smarter in, in how we make it and how we use it. And I think here you've heard a lot of those kind of concepts in, in how to make this happen. So I am... Um... And maybe I shouldn't really admit this, but I'm going to admit it. <laughs> when I learned about the CO2 emissions, I was really like shocked, and I started to get interested in sustainable materials, and I kind of jumped ship. <laughs> and I guess partly because I'm not, I wasn't really necessarily good at the cement chemistry, or that wasn't my area, um, but I was really interested in composites, and that's how I became interested in the bio-based composites. And I still saw that as contributing to construction, um, something like 40% of our landfill volume of construction, well, 40% of landfill volume is construction and demolition debris, and of that, 40% is like wood and plastics that um, takes a long time, even wood does, to biodegrade. So I got into these bio-based composites. So, um, but I, so I guess the point is that there's lots of different materials that we can look at for the construction industry. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about all of the new developments in the concrete with the CO2 especially. It's really cool. Yeah, and I, I was sort of struck, actually, with the first talk. They gave the 100-year perspective. And I think what that teaches you is, is that when we come together um, as a community and we look at how to evolve a material, um, it's amazing what we can do. And looking at concrete and its narrative over 100 years, how much we've advanced that material and the uses that we see it in today, uh, that capacity still exists. So even if concrete isn't necessarily the material we select in the future, just seeing the promise that's held within a community coming together over that period of time and innovating on a material, I think holds great promise for new materials, whether it's you know, bio-based composites or others. Um, so I think we should keep that in mind as well. What is our capacity to change the future in terms of different types of materials and what their attributes are and how we evolve those materials to be more sustainable, more resilient, uh, easier to work with, what have you. So. I think another, another dimension of that historical perspective uh, piggybacking uh, on what Jerry just said is something that I really respond to, Brandon, in your work, which is the, um, the thinking about time in radically different scales. And I know in some of your other work that I think is informing the stuff we're going to get crushed by later tonight, um, I know part of what you're, you're thinking about is, is, is the lifespan of buildings and how can the Cyclopean masonry uh, teach us to think about, you know, building for hundreds of years or thousands of years as well as for 50 and 100 year lifespans. And I think that's a really compelling part of the equation from today's, today's work. Um, one thing, um, well, the, the first talk this, this morning was um, a jolt, um, mostly because it reminded me of something I read in the newspaper. It was either New York Times or Guardian, possibly this year, about uh, most of Euro Northern Europe and North American infrastructure is reaching the end of its life, concrete, and that's tunnels and bridges. Um, I, I would, when I read this, I thought, it happens to be true because it's not being discussed. And I spoke to a few people and said, oh, yes, yes, it is, it is a bit of a problem. But that's all I've ever heard about it until this morning. Is this an elephant that is in the room that we aren't addressing, that we are focusing on all the great things we will do with cement and concrete in the future, but do we genuinely have a legacy of buildings that are going to come to the end? I live in a, a recycled um, factory that was built in 1929 in the center of Melbourne out of concrete. It's one of um, Australia's sort of early reinforced concrete buildings. How carbonated is it? <laughs> well, I, I mean, it, it meant that, from, that. <laughs> I was distracted for the rest of the day was, right. what, what, worrying about this. Sell yeah. now. Um, Mark, in your Smart Cities research, do you talk about materials like the inclusion of, say, timber? Like, I look at uh, Google's, like, uh, Keyside community in Toronto, where they're trying to emphasize the use of timber a lot. Is that something, do you see a hybrid use of materials? Uh, yes. Um, the, so I'm, I, I run something called the Smart Cities Research Institute, and the first thing I said when I arrived is that I don't even know what a smart city is. But it turns out it's a kind of like a generic term that nobody really knows what it means, but it kind of covers, covers it all. Um, so our institute goes across the whole of a technical university because the thing about cities is that everybody's 
got some skin in the game. So the simple answer to your question is yes, of course. We are very interested in knowing how sustainability will be visited on cities by making better use of what we already have uh, in place and adding things which are not going to be um, disastrous from a climate and uh, resources point of view. But um, we're genuinely, con genuinely concerned. I live in the city of Melbourne. It's coming up to 5 million, and it will be 8 million by 2050. It's the fastest growing city in the um, developed world, little known fact. Uh, it's got huge implications. It's growing so fast that we're not able to do things we need to do to take hold of the future. So it, we're going laterally. It now takes an hour to get from the center of Melbourne to the periphery, even when there's no traffic, which is not very often. And uh, so we've got this, you know, this kind of, um, it's kind of like a cancer of suburbs with no work, so it means more and more car journeys. And we've got these extraordinary tower blocks, 50 stories plus, for very poorly planned apartments. And the medium density, which Barcelona does so well, is just not on our lexicon. So I think with materials, uh, medium density is going to be the answer because it does give us a much wider range. Uh, tall buildings of 50 stories plus sort of tell us that we've got a very narrow range. And obviously the um, excrescence of the suburbs, um, that's, we're just using very cheap materials, and building what we call Mac mansions. I don't know if that's a term here, but... It is. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, and, and transitioning and scaling research and innovations from lab to site for this topic. Um, what in transactions and interactions do you see needing improvement? I know Ken Hover mentioned earlier this morning the very um, visceral statement that we're not building buildings out of manure because it's more expensive than cement and concrete. Uh, so obviously first cost is a big hurdle in bringing some of these innovations to scale. Um, in your line of, even your experiences, what can we be doing better with to bring these experiments, such as some biomaterials, from lab scale to actual industry scale? Um, I can address that really fast because I was meant to say it earlier, too, is that the, with the biobase, it, it was a lot of fun, and we get properties similar to wood um, and get these insulating foams, but it's way too expensive for the construction industry, so it's kind of demoralizing. But, <laughs> but in the end, um, uh, this, like the couple of the students that we're working on it have a startup and they're growing plastic next to a wastewater treatment plant and they're, pr they're producing different kinds of products and they're working out kinks to try to make it more scalable and large scale. So it's still fun to see. Um, I think it'll be a while before it's in construction and it would only be temporary or maybe residential because there's the fire issue, you know. But it was, um, but yeah, that's been fun to see. Maybe it has to go somewhere else first before it goes into construction, but you can get it to scale or go to the site. Um, yeah, but I was going to say, oh, I think on the concrete side, I mean, my experience was just that um, there are a few very innovative contractors around that really like doing something new, and when you can find them to partner with, then you, I've seen things be pretty successful. But there aren't very many, and I guess I would ask Ken about it, because I know that what they have to do is they have to use that provision that's like, or you can do whatever you want if you prove it's going to be okay. <laughs> There's always that provision in the code. And I, I get, you know, some, you have to find the building official, is my understanding, that's willing to, like, use that part of the code. I don't know how common it is, but that's what I've seen lead to innovation. But that's a, I mean, that's a real issue if you say what's the biggest impediment. I think it's we're not, not able to innovate fast enough because there's not easy pathways to put things out into practice and then essentially assess, iterate, and then use that as a key part of your innovation cycle. And I really think that is one of the biggest impediments, whether it's cost or it's con being conservative, uh, trying to be compliant with codes, things like that. I think we need to figure that out. Um, it's certainly something that I think is, you had asked before about encouraging maybe students going towards research. This is one of the things that really dampens enthusiasm. When you look at other industries, like the high tech industry, where their ability to put things out in practice, succeed or fail rapidly, iterate, it speeds up that whole, that whole process of innovation. And our process right now is pretty slow. I think it's pretty conservative. I think for very good reasons. Ken raised very good points this morning. Uh, but I think we need to work harder as a community, figuring out ways, how do we accelerate that? How do we create opportunities for innovators to be innovative and show impact? Because uh, right now it's much too slow. I think a lot of technologies are out there, but we don't really ever get chances to test them at scale. And that really detracts from our abilities to really embrace these technologies and move them to a point of real adoption. So 
On the educational front, I think we're, we're tackling it two ways. One is by, uh, I've been pushing a lot this emphasis on prototyping and getting ourselves, you know, architects are the original iterative designers. Um, and this is such a key facet of, of software innovation, right, or tech innovation, things like the urban, urban prototyping practices that New York and San Francisco have used to redesign their streetscapes. Um, I've been really challenging planners and architects here to, to, to focus on paths toward deployment and that prototyping, uh, not just making a single version of something to win a prize and show it in a gallery, which, which is good, our faculty need to keep doing that, um, but also then what is the next, what do you learn from the successes and failures of that and how do you iterate on it? toward deployment and toward market. So I've been focusing quite a bit on that. And one of the most exciting things I see some of our faculty doing is learning from tech transfer processes um, how to recognize, protect, and potentially commercialize intellectual property in and around architecture so that we start to teach ourselves and our students how, to, how, how an idea might find its path to deployment and to market. Um, in ways that are different from conventional architectural practice, which is what I think we're used to prioritizing in our education. Right, and if, if I can add to this, I mean, we, we heard about the, the impediments that are existing out when it comes to, to regulations and, and barriers because of that, but also internally as, as educators, I think we, we need to look at this differently, starting with the students and how we, we educate them, but also with, with faculty, for example, in the, in the Global CO2 Initiative, we only fund work if, if the uh, participating teams have an interest or at least a willingness to engage in translational research. That is, with a purpose to put it into action. I mean, hardware-based solutions often take decades to show up in the marketplace. That's too long. And part of it is not just regulations and building codes, but also our own internal value system. And uh, is, it the, is it the gallery or the journal paper over the patent? Um, as one thing, but also, amazingly enough, things happen in a linear fashion. So what we do is, from day one, ideally, if we capture a researcher having an idea, um, uh, there is somebody from Tech Transfer working with that person. Even if you have no interest in commercializing, we find a person to help you with it, so you don't have to deal with it. Um, we put psychologists together with engineers to help them understand that you have the greatest product in the world, but nobody will use it, and here is why. Right? So it needs to all be looked at in a synergistic way to not lose time so that after the fact we discover, ooh, we should have taken a different approach to developing a product or approach. So it needs all of that to, uh, to make that happen quickly. Um, I was thinking about some of Sarah's research, how you kind of transferred from structural structures research to human wellness and productivity. I think that knowledge about social sciences is interesting and uh, speaks to a large part of some of the benefits of being in, acad in the academy is that you can kind of spread your wings and see what else is out there. Um, what kind of resources do you recommend people like, look into if they have multivariable interests? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I feel really fortunate. I think Stanford has a lot of like sort of small pockets of seed money for these kind of interdisciplinary grants. So that really helped, of course, to get people to work together. Um, and then I think it's been mentioned before just about collaborations. Like you have to, oh, I think um, I mentioned it, that you have to find the right people. <laughs> um, and, and it's not that there's only one set. It's just the right ones for you. So I've been in some collaborations where it's just right off the bat, we'll like argue and butt heads and it's fine, you know, and we, and we can move on and work together. And others where I just like can't even understand what they're saying. Like I just can't speak the same language no matter how hard I try. And I, I had like prided myself in getting people to work together, but then this one group I got together, I was like, this is not working, <laughs> you know? And so that one just kind of fizzled out, but then other ones succeeded. So I think, yeah, it's finding people that you can gel with that have a similar sort of passion or interest. Right. And in order to make that happen, you need to sort of reduce the barriers so that people can start to work together even though they don't know each other, they don't, they don't necessarily have things lined up where there's a natural confluence. Uh, here at the University of Michigan, we have a program called M-Cubed, where every professor receives a $20,000 token. And then if we find two others in other schools or colleges, we form a cube and 
we have $60,000 to spend. There is no review for contents. I mean, there's review for, um, for um, human subjects research, if that applies. But other than that, that's how we found a lot of new teams they now brought their expertise together because they weren't constrained by having to wait for funding and all that. And a lot of interesting things happened this way. In fact, some of the stuff that was presented today was a direct benefit of MQ, Victor's work, Brian, the yeah. robotics, uh, Lego construction. The so. Catalyst program at Stanford was actually inspired by things like MQ. MQ. Remember yeah. looking at it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that's brilliant. Um, I can tell you what doesn't work is when uh, you have a program like that, but then the sting is you've got to get matching funding from uh, outside business, because that's, that's the situation we're in. Mm -hmm. And it's such a pity, because I think um, we would have much better chance if we just got on with the work ourselves. We, we d in Australia, we definitely need to be incentivized. We can't just put a good idea out and expect people to come out of their silos. That's, mm -hmm. But that sounds great to be able to do that without having any strings attached to it. Uh, Mark, you mentioned briefly the headache of finding funding, which is a big problem, a big part of the academy. Uh, has the climate changed? And the, I've talked with a couple of other practitioners or researchers here about the climate of finding funding in a government that's less um, interested in maybe find, funding basic research these days. <laughs> um, how is, how, what changes have you noticed in the climate for research-based funding? Um. Well, I can speak for Australia, which isn't uh, the States. We look at the States with um, wonder at the just sheer generosity of the philanthropic foundations. My understanding is that state, uh, the government funding is not really the only source, but, but philanthropic. In Australia, we have very little philanthropic funding. And the Australian Research Council, which I've been a great beneficiary of, is highly competitive. In architecture, about 6% of our grants get up. So one has a lot of very bright colleagues putting year in, year out grants. But just coming back to the earlier point, which is um, research needing to be quicker, it seems to me we've got a problem with, um, in, in the Western world with political cycles that don't uh, value thinking, well, maybe we need to be putting things in place for 20 years' time. Australia, it's about the political cycle is three years. And you can imagine what that's like. And then the other great problem is the market. And uh, for some reason, and certainly in Australia, the market should lead uh, outcomes. But of course, the market won't. It'll only uh, force us to do the things that uh, will make a profit now, not, not later. So it's uh, quite a bleak scenario, I think. So the only positive thing about climate change is that at some point, the penny is going to drop that serious investments required and that uh, these grand challenges are such that it's not going to be an infrastructure engineer or a planner or an architect or a social scientist is going to solve this. It's going to be a team of really good people. And that's why I think the sooner universities find mechanisms to encourage us to work together as faculty, then we will give students a good model to um, follow. The, the way we have uh, attacked that problem is um, looking at carbon dioxide as a resource uh, to make products, including concrete and, and other materials or, or substances. And, and, and that makes the, the effort more agnostic. So even if somebody doesn't believe that climate change A exists and B work um, into it should be funded, um, we can still talk to because we are actually making products that people need. We are creating a new economy and we're creating economic wealth. So I, I think as, as researchers, we've always been challenged in sort of how do we best package what we want to do? Um, a good example was that um, years ago, funding for soot research disappeared, but nanoparticulate research was all the hype. Well, guess what? Soot <laughs> particles are nanoparticles. So you, you, see, you see some of that, but I, I think my experience in 30 years of of, of fundraising for, for my research is, it's always been difficult. And um, yeah, there are peaks and ebbs, but, but still, it's, it's always a struggle. We spend 40% of our time, even if we're not dean, in, in administering our, our research uh, program. And uh, that is quite a, quite a number. So Monday and Tuesday, we come to work to do paperwork. Uh, 
um, looking back at your own careers, either in academy or industry, is there a field that you wish you would have studied more besides your engineering architecture, such as law or writing or humanities or uh, business even, that you think would be useful now for either gra getting grants or um, our, doing thought leadership? So so our colleague in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, uh, Lisa Nakamura, who's leading the creation of a digital studies institute, likes to say that gaming is the storytelling medium of the 21st century. And I'm sad that I spent so much time studying as a youth instead of becoming a gamer, because I feel <laughs> radically disadvantaged today. <laughs> There's a lot of psychology. There's lots of things involved with that in gaming. <laughs> I, um, I, my favorite classes as an undergraduate actually were my senior year. I took Russian literature and um, religions in American society. <laughs> and so I, I do wish, even though I did have a lot of humanities, I wish that I had had more of that. And um, one, I, I have had the opportunity, I was very was lucky, I got to choose the three books that all the freshmen at, fresh, at uh, Stanford had to read over the summer this past year. And, and then I interviewed two of the authors of the books. Um, on stage, and one of them was a novel called There There by Tommy Orange, who's a Native American, um, but urban, and it was, took place in Oakland, so that was near Stanford, so that's why I chose it. And I asked him at the end of the interview on stage in front of all the freshman class, I said, what, you know, could you speak, like, you're, you're uh, in the humanities or the arts, and the other person also had majored in English, and I said, like, could you speak to the importance of the arts? Because everyone at Stanford wants to do CS. <laughs> so I said, not really, but uh, I said, could you speak to the importance of arts here, too? <laughs> okay, and, and he was so funny, because he looked at me and he goes, you want me to talk about the importance of art? Like, go? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, and he did, and he had this beautiful statement about how when you study literature and you, or, or and humanities and stuff, you develop empathy. And I really loved that because that's what I think like even in the D school in design, a lot of it is as a designer and engineer, empathy matters. And so I think like, I, I wish I had studied more of the humanities. I think I'm empathic, but I just still think it's, uh, yeah, I wish I had done more of that. Well, I went to the University of Cambridge in the UK and it has a system which I don't, I've never seen anywhere else, but it's certainly not affordable in Australia. You basically have a director of studies and you go and you design the course you're going to do for your, um, for your three years. And if you come at the end of that and say, I wish I'd done something, it's entirely your fault. Because it, 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 you, know, you, you could focus on, art. even in architecture, you could just do electives that were art-based or science-based or computer science-based, entirely up to you. I think it's, I was very privileged to have it, and I think it would be great if we could offer that still. I mean, I certainly wish I would have had a broader education at the university. Uh, even though we had a very flexible uh, curriculum, unlike what, what, we, what we offer here, um, we're still directed to, with a little bit of direction that was provided, to stay within our field of, of concentration. But having sort of a requirement of breadth would have certainly opened my mind earlier. Um, what I know now and what I do now, I all require and accumulate, fail fast, we talked, right? Um, it's happening in a row. <laughs> um, that's, that's all acquired through research and, and listening and seeing the importance of admiring arts and seeing the value of international education and so forth. But, but as it so goes, the earlier we get exposed to ideas and concepts, the better it's ingrained in our everyday thinking. Yeah, for me, um, definitely architecture. Jonathan paid me $100 to say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now uh, you tell me. Yes. It's not too late. <laughs> not too late. Um, well, they say every good structural engineer is a failed architect. So, it's, But uh, for me, it's actually as, you know, over my academic career, sort of looking at the problems I've been tackling and the way that those problems seem to continuously scale up, right? And we start looking at some of these grand challenge problems like climate change, um, you know, these are, these are challenges that really have such a deep social dimension that I feel that sometimes um, a little bit handicapped not having enough background in social science and some of the topics that are very relevant to understanding the social dimension to these problems and really how to bring forth solutions that are in concert 
with how humanity is going to adopt those solutions, things like that. And I think that's an area where we need to do more in our curriculum, particularly for civil engineers. It's really about people, right? We're trying to advance the common good, but yet we're so abstracted from that based on the way we're trained and the way we're educated. And I think that that is a real missed opportunity, and I think we should change that. So for me, it's definitely being the social domain, social science and other related areas. So. This will be my last formal question, so I'll open it up to the floor after this last question. But is there anything in particular from the symposium that you've seen that left a lasting impression on you or opened your eyes to new research directions that you want to explore further? Well, as I said uh, at the beginning, this, this first talk this morning certainly was, uh, was eye-opening um, for me because we, we often find ourselves in the Global CO2 Initiative trying to sort of explain conflicting scenarios, right? using CO2 for making fuels, and at the same time we want to stop using fuels and burning them. Uh, now we know we can make much better concrete that incorporates CO2, helps clean the atmosphere, but we have learned that CO2 actually attacks it. Um, my understanding was not as detailed as it now is, and that certainly shapes my thinking and how we, we need to sort of tell that overall story. I have two, two things. I actually really like the second talk. Um, it really brought for me the, it just struck me the idea of really honoring the workers that were doing these projects and things, and um, I hadn't given it that much thought. Like I, my father used to study those thin shell concrete structures and I just knew that they were thin shell concrete structures but I'd never really thought about that and I really appreciated that and it also sort of reinforced my interest in the work that I presented of not just being for the fancy shiny offices but for the people that are cleaning them at night or the workers or, or others and um, even at Stanford we have employees that are at the poverty level or below and, um, and so what can we do for um, their well-being as well. So that that was one thing. And the other was I just, I love the projects in the afternoon, the innovative and the pedals and that, this is the biophilic, so that'll stick with me too. <laughs> I'm an engineer, so I can't control myself. I really like all the robotic stuff I saw. I thought that was really <laughs> cool. So. <laughs> I found myself thinking a lot about the, how effective the, you know, the, the, the universities represented among the presenters are places that are world renowned for engaging graduate students and especially doctoral students in leading edge research. And one of the conversations here at Michigan that I was thinking about today is how could we bring undergraduates into that from the get go and get rid of this idea that you do some kind of fairly generic foundational learning from a textbook and then you get the advanced seminar and then you get your undergraduate degree, and then in a master's degree, you're a little bit more in the research domain, but only at doctoral level are you fully in it. And, and how could we create what, what some of our colleagues call global problem-solving communities that would bring together learners at all scales, from, from someone like Volker, who's at the top of his game, to a high school student who's thinking that, the, that chemically re-engineering uh, our built environment might be a a passion project for them. How can we bring them together around complex problems so that we dissolve some of the barriers between undergraduate learning and advanced research? And Mark, I saw you taking copious photos and snaps of the presentations. Was there something that was uh, capturing your imagination? Uh, well, it, all it was all catching my imagination. <laughs> if I wasn't taking a, s a snapshot, it meant that I, it wasn't resonating. That uh, for me, um, a completely remarkable day because of the sheer scope. Um, I thought I knew everything, um, <laughs> technically at least, and that was uh, proved wrong very early in the piece. But to have the, um, the kind of cultural overlay of looking at the materiality of concrete and the vulnerability of it as the opening gambit, followed up by the, you know, the extraordinary insight into the it's something I think a lot about because I've, I, I, half my professional life has been wearing a hard hat with people doing dangerous things on site. But um, looking at what was happening with the thin shells and um, lack of the, the safety environment that, and the, the fact that it's just not actually part of our thinking, I think that's probably um, that also affected me uh, profoundly. So um, no, I thought it was uh, as all 
I just don't, don't think I've been to an event of this kind as comprehensive, so congratulations. Yeah. Great. Um, at this time, are there any questions from the audience? We have about 15 minutes or so. Probably a, it's surely an unfair question because it's been such a comprehensive conference in many ways disciplinarily, but I, I keep missing a little bit more um, going back to the global learning environments that you were talking about. And um, so I, I, I love to hear you talk about concrete as a global material and these technologies are global in a ways that perhaps we haven't represented so well in the conference, like all of the technologies that we've seen are sort of high-tech technologies of the North American, European context at the highest level of economic, intellectual, and cultural resources. Um, so I wonder if you've encountered sort of that tension in your work. It's, of course, happening in, in the world in, in other um, realms of technology and economy. So do you deal with that sort of elite um, condition within which you operate, or is that not visible yet in the same way that the worker wasn't, perhaps? I, I have a little th thought that came to mind is just um, I teach a class called Materials for Sustainable Built Environments and I have the students do a literature review on any material they want and a lot of international stuff comes up then and they, they look at like bamboo as reinforcement for concrete and so the class and then they give a presentation to the whole class on, on these things. So th they, they are definitely seeing much more low tech right. um, versions of concrete which I think is valuable. I mean it, that's about as far as it gets is that they just learn about it. Um, yeah, and th the other thing that just com comes to mind is, you know, we talk so much about like earthquake resistance at, at Stanford and stuff, and um, and then you go to some countries where there's a lot of corruption in the construction industry, and like the three buildings that were identical, two two of them fell down in the earthquake, and one stayed up, and that happened to be the contractor's apartment building <laughs> or something, you know. And so it's almost like I think that's a that's just a a huge issue that has nothing to do with the material um, that, that has a huge impact, I think, on, on the material, the image of it, and, yeah, safety. But I, I think that that's also the opportunity to introduce new materials, right? I mean, you, you, if I understand your question correctly, you talk about some inequity issues between, say, North and South. Not, not inequity, okay. necessarily, just self-awareness, that yeah. this is a very local conversation. As broad as it is disciplinarily, it is a very local, in some ways, the technology aspect of it. Um, yeah, very it's very true. locally and specific. And I, I think it falls upon us to, to really go out and, and, and educate and, and disseminate that information. And um, I, I think in parts uh, you see that happening here quite, quite substantially through the various international education efforts where not only a very substantial fraction of our students, and for that matter faculty, as you can hear, um, are, are foreign born, um, but many of our students actually go out and, and do some very meaningful work, uh, not just coursework in, in, uh, in foreign universities, but out in the field, learning experiences that helps them better understand these questions. I know, I know less about concrete than anyone who presented today, so, but I do know about people like Kurt Gambetta who are, are doing or have done research precisely into what is the expertise around concrete in India, in his case, that could, could be generalized uh, and, and shared. And I, I, one of the things that I really enjoyed at the Acadia conference a year ago was the demonstrations about phologram, you know, the use of augmented reality uh, you know, eyewear to en enable relatively untrained workers mm -hmm. to make complex non-standard wire bending assemblies such as you know such as might go into some of the work that Sasha was showing um, and it, it suggested that sort of like the thesis of that book Bright Continent about Africa that mm -hmm. talks about how um, how many countries in Africa made the leap to mobile phones and, and, and mobile payment systems well before North America. Mm -hmm. They just leapt over landlines and credit cards. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a possibility that advanced technology will be deployed also to activate low-tech capacities mm -hmm. in some surprising ways that don't require a $2 million robot. Mm -hmm. 
Wait. Um, hi. So I have a question about, uh, I think maybe going back to step zero, like what are the mechanisms and the apparatus to like foster uh, collaborative efforts between industry and researchers and academia? Uh, like what are those mechanisms in the first place? Like oftentimes, you know, sort of the bigger the problem, the harder it is to start. Um, and so I'm, I'm like wondering, uh, like is there some sort of like uh, research practice speed dating game that we can all play or like how do you how do you find ways to come together in the first place and are any of those kind of formalized so it makes it easier? I, I, I've thought about this a lot and um, over the years developed something called the embedded practice PhD and so I'm going back to the plateau and it's a PhD specifically for people who've been in practice long enough to realize that they need to make a difference and they're not going to make a difference through um, uh, just continuing doing what they're doing. So we work with practices that uh, would like to see what if sort of scenarios tested where they're not actually reliant on the result being yes. Um, so for instance, we had one um, PhD scholar working with Arup. So they spend most of the time actually doing the work that they're doing anyway, but it's actually PhD level research, recognized as such. And uh, so one of them sat in Arup's office as an architect using CATIA um, as a parametric model, model at a time when Arup weren't working parametrically. So he was just literally doing the same thing as the team. And they were able to see exactly what was working and what wasn't working. And it didn't end up being a PhD in parametric design. It was a PhD on workflow and how to improve workflows between architects and engineers. So I think that's a great model because um, the, the person, Dominic Holzer, is um, a um, BIM expert, a consultant, as well as a full-time academic at the University of Melbourne, has a PhD and is super fulfilled. But I think he benefited from having been, he worked at um, Will Allsop's office and I think he was also at um, Rem Coolhouse. So he'd had a, a really good uh, go at understanding how the world worked at the level of practice so that he could then uh, find a way to, to um, be, do his PhD. But of course, you turn it around, it meant that the practice, i.e. in this case Arup, benefited too because they had somebody doing something at a level that they wouldn't otherwise have been able to afford. And I think this is a model which we've, I've had quite a few students go through this. I'm convinced it's a one, not the only, but it's one very good way to get practice and um, universities to, to find a, a path of mutual benefit. But I think, I don't know if you're affiliated with University of Michigan, but you know, here I think. He's at, he's at SOM. SOM, okay. Um, but the university has a number of different units that are designed to sit at that interface between academia and industry. So here at Michigan, we have our Business Engagement Center, our BEC, we have a tech transfer office. And I think those are great resources that are there for faculty to take full advantage of. But I think it really starts to get back to the, the starting point of your question, where's that spark? Where's T equals zero? And I think that really starts with the faculty member and what do they view as sort of opportunity for impact in their work? But if a faculty member has that interest, has that desire to work with industry, then here in Michigan, those organizations, our BEC, Tech Transfer, will help to curate those relationships and cultivate those relationships between the researcher, industry, working through IP terms and things like that, but really trying to position the university and its researchers to have impact in partnership with industry. But my personal feeling is that when you look at very successful academia industry collaborations, it usually starts with individuals that are committed to having that succeed because they see that as opportunity for impact. And they're willing to make compromises uh, sometimes when we see faculty that don't work well with industries because they maybe are not willing to compromise. They want to hold their IP or things like that. So I think it really begins with that individual and that individual taking advantage of those resources that are there to help facilitate. Oh, yeah, I was going to add that in addition to like university-wide resources, like departments sometimes have things. So we have like a Center for Integrated Facility Engineering and it's Companies can contribute, I think it's like twenty or $30,000 a year, and then all of that money is pooled. It's for like virtual design and construction and um, 4D modeling, and they pool all that money, and then they represent their affiliates kind of, they come and they, um, they give out seed grants 
to the researchers and then they benefit from that research and they get to have a say in which research gets funded. So there are a lot of those affiliate programs, I think, that different universities yeah. have as well. Um, but then sometimes it's also just that, that one-off collaboration like we've actually had with SOM, um, someone from San Francisco that works with one of my colleagues and they tried out a new connection um, that didn't have to go through a, too much of those yeah. bigger channels, <laughs> but it was just that they had a good collaboration. Sure, but, but at the end of the day, no matter how it starts, certainly yeah. Cherry spoke about uh, how this is best done, um, it, it's all about building and maintaining personal relationships, right? To have that trust so you can give and take. Um, I, I think most universities are less good and set up for sort of one-offs, a small contract here, like almost like work for hire, rather than long-term stability that you know um, to, to take inspiration from practical needs um, to translate that into fundamental research questions um, on which we are good at. Um, at the same time, we are then educating students on a very practical path, uh, pretty much giving the, the, the companies multiple years to interview those students. I mean, we've seen that successfully happening in so many different examples um, that, that, for me, uh, really emphasize that it's, it's, it's really a human-human interaction that, that has to be the key to this. We have time for one more brief question, if anyone. Oh, you, great, perfect. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of that, uh, it, the dis start discussion topic was from lab to site, but then in this discussion here, you guys also kind of touched on the kind of like slowness of innovation in our industries and kind of like the policy that influences that or hinders that, take it as you will. Um, I'm interested to learn what you guys have found out in relation to either more design professionals moving towards policy because we are more aware of the social and economic and all these other factors going into the built environment or the um, kind of what we spoke about in an earlier discussion as well, the kind of like national organizations playing a role to educate, educate policy makers. I think that's a huge, uh, uh, hugely important topic. And, and one of the most relevant aspects in that is how we communicate. Right? We're so good in talking amongst ourselves, and if somebody hears us speak who's not in our profession, they hear words that they might understand individually, but they put no meaning to the sentence. Right? So, so, so having the ability to translate our technical knowledge into information that actually helps policymakers is something that doesn't always work so well. Um, and, and, and I think uh, we work, of course, with our students to, uh, to help change that. Uh, but um, uh, we see that all the time. Okay. We, we've just um, won some Australian Research Council funding to set up a, a digital pin-up space. And uh, so we're taking the challenge on the, the urban futures, which is how do we get experts to talk to each other in a way that they understand? And we think that a visual environment where you can all have your work up at once is, is one, one thing. The next challenge is how do you get expertise recognized as being of value and of consequence by those uh, end users and, and key stakeholders? Uh, so how do you get them to appreciate that expertise is actually of value? Because in Australia, there's a little bit of the opposite going on. There's a lot of suspicion because we don't talk a language that's understood. And then crucially, how do we get uh, those people at the end of, the, of, the, uh, of the, you know, the end user, how do we get them to be able to speak and, and be listened to? And so I think if we can get this, that is the major challenge at the moment, I think probably everywhere, and we'll, you have to watch the space, but we, we've set this environment up, it'll be ready in the middle of next year to actually specifically uh, do just that with policy makers in the space, which in our case is local government officials, being able to pick up the nuances from both the experts and the people most affected by the decisions. I think yeah, also, I was going to say just in like structural engineering, at least at the local um, professional organizations, like where I am at Structural Engineers Association of Northern California, they have committees and you get involved there and they um, actually interact quite well with like the city government and they pass policies or uh, ordinances, I'm not sure what they are, but you know, like for the, there's a big issue in San Francisco with soft stories. 
um, so they needed to be retrofit. So there's a, it was a lot of advocacy on the part of the engineers, and again, like having to communicate well, but there are a lot of opportunities, I think, through those local professional organizations. Yeah, and I was just going to maybe expand scope on the question, because you were talking more specifically about policy. Uh, but we talked before about innovation maybe not being fast enough. And my personal opinion, part of that maybe is because our existing business models may not be working. They may be broken. And in the civil engineering profession, we're already seeing a profession that's dramatically going through a transformation, not always good, and part of it ties to our current business model. So I think there's a lot more growing interest in changing that business model and changing the opportunity landscape based on the business model. So it's not just policy, but if the economy is not reacting and allowing for innovation to see the light of day, then maybe we need to change the way that economy works. So one place we're seeing that certainly is in the smart city space, right? Talked before about smart cities, what does it mean? But one of the biggest segments of that smart city arena is new financing vehicles that are gonna tie to infrastructure. Um, for example, in civil engineering, you often hear about deteriorating infrastructure, partly because of the way we pay for it. That business model doesn't work. Um, so thinking about new ways to bring investment in, invoke the private sector to contribute to this common cause of advancing robust, resilient infrastructure. I think we really, there's an opportunity for us professionally really to see a future world that's going to be better, more innovative, accelerate the adoption, but it'll come through new business models that we'll adopt. So. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. So please join me in, in thanking these great guests for, and for the wonderful answers and responses. Thank you, thank you Wanda. Thank you, Wanda, for um, the, moderating this last panel and everyone that participated. Um, at this point, I think um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, we're going to go down to the Liberty um, Research Annex right now for the exhibition opening and performance. Um, so please join me down there as we uh, have a glass of wine and some food. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>